ASMR stream today. Uh, today we're gonna be uh, hacking into a, a, a printer, and uh, when we hack into this uh, printer, we're gonna find uh, we're gonna find a lot of bugs. But uh, bef before we actually find those bugs, we're gonna have to do um, some other stuff, you know. So uh, yeah, welcome to the stream. Um, I hope everyone is having a wonderful. Uh, Valentine's Day. So happy, happy Valentine's Day. Oh my god, I got a sub out of this. Thank you so much, uh, Nick Chill Club. I hope that you have uh, chills running down your spine and you your hairs are standing up on the back of your neck due to this. Uh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> Woo! It is sad day already? Oh yeah, it's a very sad day. Today is the day where you get to sit and wallow in your loneliness and sorrow, and I get to reap all of the benefits by taking your money, and that makes me feel better. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I left halfway through the last printer stream when he was an annotating Ghidra. Nah, that wasn't the last printer stream. Wow, not very loyal. <laughs> Nick Ito 97, more like 97 out of 100 loyalty. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll catch you up on that. Um, good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning. Good, good night to y'all Americans. Hell yeah. Gamozo is live. Hell yeah. The printer will have printed its last prints on paper. <laughs> Implying I'm gonna put paper in this damn printer. Um, turn the lights down, a nice glass of wine, and some C-Matrix. I was supposed to have wine today, but unfortunately, so my mom actually bought me some wine. She's been like, basically, if you go to Total Wine, you can just like literally park your car, and then you press a button on your phone, and they just put it in your trunk. It's like super straightforward. Uh, and my mom's done that like twice for me now, and I went to go get it today, because they're open until like 10, and they closed early due to the snow, and I got there like five minutes after they closed, and it took me two hours to get there. It is it is a 10 minute drive, but it took me two hours to get there. It, it just, we don't have any salt on the road here, and even though we didn't get that much snow, we only got like four inches of snow, the The roads are just fucking ice. So it was uh, probably not worth the risk, but I wanted wine. So unfortunately, I don't have my wine yet. Are you buried in snow? We didn't get that much. Got like 10 inches on the east side. Yeah, we got, I don't know, I got like four to six inches, something like that. It wasn't really that man, that that much snow. But the uh, the plowing kind of sucks here. Like the half of the roads I needed to drive on weren't plowed at all. Yeah, it was kind of a pain in the ass. Sad day. Uh, right. Watching this in bed as my wife is sleeping. Oh God, dude! Don't let her hear this shit. This is a. T this is this is not. This is not how you impress your significant other, regardless of your of your gender. It doesn't matter. This is this is not watching a stream like this is not necessarily portraying the the you know I'm not saying you're weird, chat, but So how's chat doing? <laughs> can almost guarantee that Richmond and Atlanta do a worse job. Oh yeah, uh, I mean I lived in Virginia for a while, and we definitely had some uh, issues with snow. I think the the main issue I have is I am a defensive driver, so dealing with other drivers on the road. Did I not have bypass on? Was I like auto-tuned or like pitch sifted or like reverbed? <laughs> that must have been fucking weird. I have no idea how that bypass came off. Um. All right, no audio effects. Wow. Huh. Well. 
All right, we, uh, there you go, that's better. There, yeah. So how, how's chat doing today? Um, <laughs> no! You have a big room. Oh, it's massive. Basically, the halls of hall thing. You know, place of big halls. Ca it's a castle. <laughs> oh, man. No, I lived in Virginia for a while, and they were pretty bad with snow. But the, the, the drivers here seem a little bit worse than in Virginia for snow driving. I think Virginia gets a little bit more snow, so they're a little bit more used to it. Whereas here, it's like someone goes to a ski resort like once in their life, and they just assume they can drive on snow because they didn't die that day. Um, but yeah, I had people tailgating me from like five feet away, and it's like, you realize that if I were to hit my brakes right now, you would literally rear-end me. Like, not, you, like, there is, I'm not even saying your reaction time would be slow or you're a bad human. I, like, literally, there is nothing you could do, nothing you could do to stop yourself from rear-ending me. Like, it, it is guaranteed. Because I don't know, like, coming from a snowy state, I'm used to driving in the snow. And one of the things that you often do when you drive in the snow is if there's no one behind you, you test. You test your assumptions. If you are driving 30 miles an hour on the highway and there's no one behind, behind you, try and apply your brakes. And if your brakes don't do shit, then maybe 30 is a little too fast. So every once in a while I'll do that and I kind of use that to kind of gauge the road that I'm on, the surface that I'm on, my car, my tire condition, my tire warmth and all of those things. And like, I did that. I am in a car that is designed for driving in shitty all-terrain conditions. And when I hit the brakes, I get no fucking traction today on the highway. Like, yeah, the fucking BMW missing a headlight who was tailgating me? Probably not going to fucking stop in their run-flat, rock-hard tires that are probably as old as the car. Like, <laughs> it's ridiculous to me how oblivious people are to physics. Like, and there's no one on the road. There's no, like, there's no reason to tailgate someone. There's literally, it's a four-lane road. There are maybe five cars visible. There's no reason. It's just stupid. So fucking stupid. I don't call it defensive driving. I call it being crash sensitive. Yeah, I mean, I, I like... I would say I am a defensive driver, like, I typically am watching an intersection at a red light because if someone's gonna rear-end me and no one's in the intersection, I'll go through the light, right? And I'll check my mirrors all the time. I'm just a, a paranoid person when it comes to driving. BMW missing a headlight. <laughs> yeah, I never got to confirm whether their turn signals worked or not, but I, I wouldn't get to know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I do I do judge cars by that because if a car has a headlight out, I'm going to judge it for probably being less maintained. And I don't mean that any less of the driver. Like everyone can have a shitty financial situation, but that doesn't mean the car. Like if you're missing a headlight, which is one of the cheapest and easiest things to replace in a car, I don't trust your tires. I don't trust you know how much attention you're you know. I don't even. I'm assuming that you probably don't even know your headlight is out, like, you're oblivious to that, because it seems like most drivers are. Like, um, not a negative to people who have cars in shambles and, and situations where it's hard for them to re repair things, but, uh, it doesn't mean you're less of a risk because you, you know, you can't keep your car maintained, so... Waiting for a few more people to show up before we do the content. It's an assessment of the safety situation, not the general worth of a person. Yeah, absolutely. I suggest anyone ride a motorbike on the road. It'll change your driving style for sure. Yeah. I I feel like I'm pretty good with, with motorcycles on the road. Not driving them. I mean, I've driven motorcycles a few times, but never on a road, I don't think. Um, just like in parking lots, because I've never actually, you know, gotten gotten permissions or licenses to do that um but yeah i wonder what their oil looks like yeah that's crazy to me because oil changes are so cheap especially if you do them yourself um 
It's basically the cost of oil, and you don't need to get the most premium fucking oil for your, like, car that you're already abusing the shit out of. Miss what you're saying, what's on tap today? Today, I can go grab the bottle, and we can talk about it. Because I, I, I want to wait until there's, like, maybe 150 people here. I know it's not the best time to start streaming. I'll, I'll probably peek out in, like, three hours, so we'll see. This is a Cal Isla, uh, aged 12 years. It's very peaty. It's very smoky. Um, honestly, not the hugest fan, to be honest. But I have it, and it, it, it has liquid in it. So uh, we're going to try and re reduce the liquid in it. Um, also, I'm terrified to buy a new car. Oh, a used car? Yeah, I mean, used cars are really risky because people just typically neglect their cars, and that's fine. Um, but yeah. Too peaty? Yeah, way too peaty. It's, it's pretty potent. Whew. Very smoky, very peaty. It's not terrible. Personal road story fun. When I was driving a bike, I got pinched between two minivans and got my steering bar bent. Didn't have any scratch, uh, but since then I'm paranoid about driving a bike near cars. Oh, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I'm pretty sure that people never check their mirrors in their cars. Like, I remember that from my, driving's te my driving test. The instructor was like, wow, you check your mirrors a lot. I'm like, w opposed to what? Just... Dry, just looking ahead? Like, uh, it, it's fucking weird to me. <laughs> it's fucking weird to me. It's the same sort of thing as on, like, the ski slope where it's like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't ever, you know, have awareness of what's behind you. It's their fault to, like, figure that out. It's like, once you get fucking completely run down by people multiple times, I kind of like to know roughly what's going on behind me. <laughs> It's like playing Dota without looking at the minimap. Yeah, for sure. Like, I would say I typically know all of the cars around me. If, if there's a car that goes by me on, on either side, and I am not anticipating that they are driving by me, I jump. I, like, I'm like, whoa, shit, I'm surprised. Because uh, I typically know who is around me, what types of cars they're in, their speeds they're going and thus when they're going to pass me, if they're going to pass me, basically whether they're gaining on me or losing distance on me. Um, and I like to know those things. So when someone goes by me and I didn't expect them to be there, it's usually I wasn't paying attention to a mirror. Um, and that, that, feels, uh, that feels bad. So, yeah, it's fucking weird, dude. <laughs> oh, man. I wonder if there's any alcohol left in here, to be honest. The cork was kind of shot. It definitely had a seal, but I'm curious how strong the seal was. I mean, it smells and tastes like alcohol, but I don't know how much alcohol has maybe been lost. I mean, it was, it was corked and sealed, but the cork was in shitty condition and just crumbled, basically. Does it burn? I don't know if this would anyways. It's pretty low. It's 43%. I guess that's standard. It's not cask, cask strength, but that's pretty normal. Honestly, I could maybe try to cut it down and go to like... Hmm. I could maybe try and cut it down to like a 34, 35. Um... When I was much younger, I got hit by a car and went over the roof. Uh, full disclosure, I was being an idiot. Uh, luckily, I only had minor cuts, but yeah, bicycles or motorbikes are afterthoughts for most naive drivers, for sure. G GNU Unicorn. G GNU Nicorn. <laughs> GNU Nicorn. Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Be cloudy as hell if the alcohol is evaporated. 
Yeah, it's pretty clear, I'd say. <sighs> All right. We'll, we'll see how many people end up showing up here today. Can be hard to say. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. It is like kind of the worst time to start streaming, possibly. The lights look good with bokeh. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me let me try and bokeh it up. Oh, it's gonna try and track my face. Oh bokeh. Oh the bokeh. Oh my god. Oh the bokeh. Oh jeez. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how well it's gonna track my face, but. I do have autofocus on. That's the first time you've seen autofocus on the stream. Isn't that, isn't that cool? And it's not, uh, it's not breathing. So I don't know how good the quality is for y'all. It looks fine. I mean, it's encoded. For me, it's really good. Uh, like the actual native quality that I see is basically indistinguishable from reality, in my opinion. Uh, but on stream, you're going to get compressed a little bit. Yeah, we can, like, got the the bokeh on the candle. I mean, I, ha I have it on f1.4 right now. So we could, we could go to, uh... There you go. Here's, uh, I don't know what f that is, but it's, it's high. That's an, that's an f16. Obviously, it's a little bit darker, right? Um, but there's almost no bokeh, and it's breathing. <laughs> There we go. F1.4. Let's fucking go. Get the good bokeh. It, it kind of quiets out the background, too. I think it's fantastic for streaming. I'm so happy I went with the F1.4. Uh, I had to go with the fixed lens for that, uh, but it, it was worth it. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as more people show up, unless people aren't going to fucking show up. It's sharp as fuck here. Yeah. I mean, you're basically going to be limited to my bit rate, which is about 6K. Uh, 6K bit or 6 meg bit. Sorry. 6,000 kilobits. <laughs> I can see the monitor's anastropy with this ca I don't even know what that means. I mean, in games, I just always set it to the highest setting. But I actually don't... I, I never actually knew what that meant. What camera is this? Oh, yeah. Um, let me add that to the thing here. Hmm, camera. There you go. All right. Yeah, more people are showing up, so we'll, we'll wait. Maybe we'll, uh... Monitors have different brightnesses depending on the viewing angles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, some of these monitors uh, seem to just have different brightnesses in general. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about those two. Um, but some of them just seems to have, have worn slightly differently. So, it's kind of, kind of weird. We'll hop into some Xenotic for now. Just hop around. We'll wait for a couple more people to show up. Um, I know I know people don't like uh, necessarily waiting for content, but I also don't like that probably in 25 minutes we'll have 200 people here, and I'm going to feel bad if they kind of miss out on the explanations of kind of what's what's going on here. So we'll just, we'll just chill, hang out with chat, try and get chat talking a little bit more, see if we can get into the mood here. Came across your channel the other week. Seriously, underrated. Hope it gains more tra traction. Me too, kind of, sort of. Um, I, uh, I would love to get uh, more traction, but I'd also like... Let's see, do I know this map? I don't think I do. I don't have a personal best on this. Um, always like to get more traction, but I also like keeping it a little bit niche and keeping it uh, a little bit more relevant and, and lower level. But to be honest... I feel like at this point, I've gotten confident enough that if 5,000 people want to talk, want to watch me talk about low-level shit and they don't understand what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm just going to keep talking about low-level shit. Um, I, I guess I'm, I think, I think the ship has sailed from when I would change and try to go into higher-level stuff or like CTF-style stuff to try to maybe get a little bit more of a mass appeal. Um, and I'm kind of happy because that's something I've been 
potentially worried about uh, doing. So we'll see here. I just lurk here. Thank you for the good content. Thank you so much, Brain Bread. Brain Bread. Or as you would say in Russian, Brain Hleb. I mean, you'd probably say brain in uh, a different way. But I think one of my friends who, who understands uh, the importance of Hleb, <laughs> which is probably not the way you say it. I think it's a, a bastardized way of saying it. Um... What was your question about? Probably too broad. Oh, did I miss? Did I miss a question? Hleb? Hleb? Is that is that spot on? That it, honestly, through through my headphones, I think I nailed it. All right. Hleb. 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 The L is softer. Are you saying bread in Russian? Yes. Well now, well now, okay. Well now that you put, now that you put the little, little uh, mark in there. Now I just want to say, Holeb. <laughs> Holeb. <laughs> Milady, Mahleb, woo, woo! I'm getting fucking collimated here. Is that col collimated? I think that's. I think that is the correct term for what I'm looking for. No, no, no. I'm looking. No. Maybe? L is in the French le. Hleb? 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 <laughs> Watch this chat tries to get me to pronounce things. <laughs> Very close? Woo! I did live with Russians for two years, and they threw wicked parties. I'm I'm pretty sure I, at some point or another the entire DC Russian scene was in that fucking house that I lived in. <laughs> it, it it seemed to be like a, a big thing, but goddamn, dude. So the company I worked for uh, was based in America, had a large amount of people in Russia, and the owners and and managers were Russian. Um, so Russian was spoken in the office pretty much at all times. So whenever you walk around, you hear, you hear Russian. Um, and then the house that I lived in was the, the same way, uh, and that Russian was spoken in the house, not at all times. Um, but then with uh, when they'd have parties, oh, my God. Russian's fucking everywhere, dude. But I got relatively good at vodka. <laughs> is this deep fried? Yes, this is. This is defrag, which I'm kind of struggling with today. I guess I already played WoW today, so I guess I'm a little bit uh, fatigued, I think, gamer-wise. So, yeah. Yeah, we had, uh, we had Naxxramas yesterday with, the, uh, with Darkmoon Fair, um, which is a weekly event once a month, kind of. Um... That basically means you do like 10% more raid damage. So th this week was a really big week for uh, raiding. And we did our first Naxxramas clear in one night. We typically do two nights or we go back. Um, but we did uh, one full clear in one night, which is great because it means that I can get uh, processed for rankings um, as a complete raid, like the healing, the healing I did as a complete raid versus trying to compare per boss because you know per boss it's it's kind of more of an indicator of you know luck the conditions of the fight you know how things went if it was a fast fight a slow fight if people are on top of their shit as a healer whether or not people took a lot of damage but not too much damage that they died that led to the you know people slowing down damage because people are dead so there's like Healing is pretty RNG for a specific boss. Um, but for all bosses, it's a little bit more about your consistency. 
and that is what I strive for. I don't really go for the nuttiest single boss parses. I mean, I, I push as hard as I can, um, but ultimately, I I strive for consistency. That That is what I consider a harder skill to have um, because it's less luck-based and it's more about being attentive for a three-hour time span uh, with really no downtime. Um, and yeah, so we got our first ranking, which is fantastic. Super excited about that. So yeah, and then today, instead of doing another night of Naxxramas, we did Blackwing Lair, which is a throwback to uh, older classic WoW, uh, kind of last year. Do you prefer F FPS or MMOs? Uh, definitely MMOs. Um, I mean, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking competitively, uh, MOBAs. If you're talking about, um, like, fun, I would say MMOs. You play Shadowlands at all? I have not yet. Doop, doop, doop. You know, I can maybe cut these corners a little bit tighter. And I also can be strafing through them. But yeah, I haven't played Shadowlands yet. I don't know if I would like it or not. I, I like the complexity of classic WoW rotations. Um, and I don't know if I would like it in Shadowlands as much. I know mechanically the game is uh, should be harder, or definitely is harder for like the bosses, the mechanics, and those sorts of things. Um, but I think for healers, it's actually gotten a little bit easier. Um, threat matters a lot less. Mana matters a lot less. Um, and you can kind of just blast fucking heals. Obviously, you need to do the mechanics and the dances of the fight, uh, which is, I would say, much more difficult. But from a perspective of, like, basically deciding with a, in a 100 millisecond window which of your 30 spells you want to cast... Um, is really difficult, and, and that's what I really enjoy about uh, healing in Classic WoW. And I would kind of not enjoy casting kind of the max rank heal, and at that point your decision is more based on the type of heal rather than the potency of your heal and how you manage your mana. Obviously at a super competitive level, everything becomes super competitive. Um, but... I don't know if I want to commit to that level of competitiveness in uh, retail. Although maybe I would like it. Maybe I'd like to join a like more professional organization. But I'm I'm pretty sure I could be a pretty key contributor in a. Um, I'm pretty sure I could be a pretty key contributor in. Uh, Basically, in uh, classic WoW, in a you know top guild for sure, I think I am good enough to do that at this point. Woo! Trying to write uh, exploit for the recent pseudo CVE. Have you looked at the details? No, I haven't. I don't really care about CVEs and something like that. Not really bug site find too interesting to be honest was that a PB to be honest I'm playing like shit right now and I hope chat knows that I'm just doing this to wait for more people to join I know some people have left because they want that they want the meaty content but sorry you get a little bit of this Damn, I don't think I can clip the uh, finish line from off the platform. I think I have to be actually on the platform. I think I lost speed there. It should be a PB. Yeah. Guess I can't get a run going. Definitely see that. I prefer Classic myself as well. Uh, I'm yet to try Shadowlands. Hated BFA, though. 
Yeah, I think Shadowlands honestly would be pretty good. Like, from what I've seen so far, it looks pretty good. Um, how about playing chess? I'm not a huge fan of chess. I think chess is pretty dry. I like Go a lot more than chess. If I were to seriously invest in a game, it would be it would be Go over chess for sure. Chess just seems a little bit too standardized. Holy shit, the friend can already run this. Oh god, this map looks fucking ass. Minus 19 points. It's never good when you see something. Minus 18 points. Yeah, so this is one of those maps where you have no speed at the start. This map looks like absolute shit. Okay. These solid, these are not solid. And then there's water there. So I guess there's orbs or like that has water. If you're on the inside, you can probably make that jump. Okay, this map looks like absolute shit. This map actually looks like fucking garbage. It just looks so like maps where you can't get a good opener, I think are really stupid. Why have you deleted your last printer stream? I have not. Okay, and then I need to get on that like edge here. Yep. Yeah, this map fucking sucks, dude. Am I the only person here? Woo! Map just looks like shit. There's the reason it was voted so poorly. 11 votes minus 18 points. Just a shit map. I think this map's actually uh, pretty interesting. I think you got speed on, on this map here. Oh, is there someone else here? Um... Oh, there's someone here, fuck. I thought I was alone. Maybe not. Someone's spectating. You can't see because it's off the screen. I gotta set the like number of records maybe to a smaller number then. Okay, they're map one, but that's fine. This map looks pretty good. Okay. So that's probably skippable if you have enough speed. This map looks pretty good. Bunch of ramps, no weapons so far. Weapons, in my opinion, are... Weapons and slicks are where I draw the line. And that's just the end of the map there. Okay, that's a really straightforward map. Okay. Hmm... I feel like this map is more my more my vibe. Lost a lot of speed there. Shit, I hit that wall for sure. Huh, that was okay. Honestly, people have some pretty good times on this. EOF, hell yeah, coming in with a good time. So he's going to have really good splits. He's just a much better defragger than I am. Yeah, I'm already a third of a second behind his splits here. That was a good line, but then I hit a fucking say button. Yikes. What is this game? This is Zonotic. But it is the Quake Engine. 
Yeah, I think that was really bad. Yes, it was. Yikes. That was actually a really good circle jump there. If I could skip that second ramp, that would be huge. Because I'm going to lose speed on those ramps. Same with that one. That was actually really good going over that. Okay. He's just got more speed on me. Only a second behind. Sick printer graphics. Hell yeah. Dupe. Ooh, I skipped that, but I missed a boost. Yeah. Damn. I'm trying to cut that corner as tight as I possibly can. I guess I should do that on that corner as well. I lost so much speed there. Yeah, it was a better one. Woo! That was good. That was good. That was good. Oh, baby. We got an urn going. Oh, we beat his time. Fuck yeah. Nice, 16th. Wow. That was, <laughs> that was pretty good. Fucking he beat it. Son of a bitch, he beat it by a second. Damn. <laughs> I, I thought it was good. And he fucking sneaks in there. That was really good. 2176. He's taking this line. I agree with that. That's a much better line. So I actually was behind him by about half a second, and then I gained about half a second at the end there. Um... And I think that is a sign that I am executing the last part of this map better than he is. But obviously, the first part of the map, I'm quite a bit behind. And that was really bad there. Yeah, and I basically, I want to be at a cycle where I can get a boost from that and jump over the gap rather than have to take a longer route. Whew. Were there guns in this game? Just for fun. This is an FPS, so it does make sense for guns to be in the game. Yeah, dude, he's so far ahead of me. He's a second ahead by that point, and then that was really bad because I hit that ramp at a bad spot. Yikes. Yeah. yeah. God, that dude's fucking good, man. Yikes. Yikes. I don't know how you... A second... Like, half a second ahead there. This doesn't even beat my last run. My last run was... That was actually a really good run, the 2264. Woo! What is this? This is Zonotic. Yikes. Yikes. Yikes, dude. So the timer starts there. I don't know how to get more speed. I guess he just has a better... Circle jump than I have? Unless he's skipping that second ramp, which I think is possible with a better circle jump.
I think I missed a checkpoint there, too. Damn. Whoa. Whoa, that was actually really good. That was a 27 and a, and I let off of the strafe because I thought it was a fucking scuffed run. Nice. Damn, missed it. That was that was going to be an improvement on my last run for sure. There's like a really good spot where I hit that jump, which is interesting. Hmm. Damn. Damn. All right, we'll uh we'll call it quits after like a couple more minutes here. And we'll get into the printer. Catch everyone up to date. God, he's he's definitely somehow getting past that second jump. That's just putting me at such a massive disadvantage there. He must be hitting it right on that crease, which I think I did one time. I've definitely had 1,100 Quake units at the bottom of this ramp, and I have no idea. So that one, basically, I didn't actually get penalized for hitting the ramp, which is really weird. That was a really bad swap, but a pretty good ramp. Yeah, and those are really bad strafes. That's gonna ruin this. And that hit a ramp, so it's pretty much, this run's pretty much done now. Yep. Hmm. I don't know. He hasn't improved his time either. He just starts right off the bat. Hmm. He's definitely hitting at a, at a different spot than what I am. Curious. Oh, maybe I see what he's doing. That was better. Damn. There's a 40. Okay, okay. I've cut 20 off. I've consistently cut 20 off. And then there, that run is gone now because I hit that ramp. Shit, dude. And I missed a checkpoint. <laughs> well, all right. Last try. Last try. Is this the one? Is it blessed? I actually clipped that in a weird way. I think I lost speed. Yeah, it's dead. Dead. All right, chat. Whew. Fucking trash run. Um... Do, do, do. Oh, have you ever heard of Val Valorin? It's an open source RPG voxel game written in Rust. No, I haven't. I haven't really played many like voxel games to be honest. Um, what else? GG sec with the oh my dogs. Oh, my dogs. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. All right. 
Anything else chat has to say or do I have to start creating content? Because if I want to create content, then I have to pick, pick what I want to listen to. Which I'm trying to prolong that because I don't know what I want to listen to. No, that's too tired. That's too tired. Hmm. Hmm. Would this be good? No. Do I want this? We'll try this, we'll try this. System of a down, ooh. Trying to find a vulnerability in the firmware? Yeah, that's gonna be the plan. What are the specs on the machine you use? C-Matrix? That. Um. Is there some fisheye going on? Or some of the matrix screens a different size? No, they're all the same size. No fisheye. Um. God, System of a Down. It's been a while since I've listened to System of a Down. I mean, it's probably in my playlist, but like actually listen to System of a Down explicitly. It's, it's been a hot minute. Toxicity. Yeah, toxicity is pretty, pretty solid. Honestly, I don't like... It's a good album, but it's not perfect. It's not... Not every song on it is a banger. Like it is for, um... It, it's not... I don't know. I, I feel like there are definitely better, better albums. Drinking the wine out of the bottle? No, I don't have any wine here. That's, uh, scotch. I do have a glass here. Thank you so much for the follow. Cursed DS. Cursed dual screen over there. It's got two monitors. Got memed into listening to their, uh, one of their best albums, and it's actually great. Which one? Which one? What is System of a Down's best album? I think most people would say Toxicity. Right? Unless you're talking Mesmerize, but beyond Mesmerize and Toxicity, they're not popular at all. Yeah, Toxicity. Toxicity is, is pretty good throughout. I think some songs are mm, mediocre on it. Mesmerize. I think, uh, honestly, I think Mesmerize is better. It's newer and it's not as popular. Yeah, Toxicity is 2001. Mesmerize was 2005. But God, I remember when uh, BYOB came out. Oh man, dude. Went fucking ham. <laughs> I remember playing tibia to this in middle school. I think this played in uh, at my middle school dances too. God, this is like this was before I got into metal, so this probably was like the hardest shit I'd ever hit at this or ever heard at this point, which is crazy. You defend on our protection. Tool Anima album, 100% great album. I actually agree with you there. I would say like, what? All right, all right. Let's go through, let's go through really good albums here. Um, Century Child by Nightwish. Entire album, everything. Fucking phenomenal. Fantastic fucking album. Fan-fucking-tastic album. Um, Bullet for My Valentine, The Poison. Really fucking good. Universally really good. Avenge Sevenfold, their eponymous album. Fan fucking tastic. Um The Used. This is this is a, a little bit edgier. Um but the used, their eponymous album, really fucking good. Like 
they don't have they have a couple you know one hit wonders, but I think that whole album, the 2002 eponymous one, is fan fucking tastic. Uh, Flyleaf's eponymous album, yep, that's eponymous and that's fucking fantastic. Um, what else? I would say those are some of the some of the albums that are really up there for me. For where, like, every single song is fantastic. Um, I mean, of course, T-Swift, fucking Fearless, is phenomenal. Let's be honest. Even if you, even if you don't like T-Swift, you have to agree that T-Swift, Fearless, is a fantastic album. Um... Counting Crows Across a Wire, live in New York. Were you at that concert? I found that live albums don't really work unless you're there, personally. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, but I'm also just a Kanye guy. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, Kanye, Kanye is fantastic. Like, Graduation, right? I would say Graduation is one of the best albums of all time. Fucking fantastic. Um... Cross the Wire's acoustic. Oh, interesting. What else? Um, hmm. I'm trying to just scroll through my music, looking through, like, which of these albums really seem really good. Um, honestly, Breaking Benjamin, Dear Agony is pretty, pretty good. Uh, all, all the songs on there. Like, albums I really like are pretty rare. I, I would say, like, maybe one in 20 artists that I listen to, do I actually think they have an, el an album where all the songs are fantastic? Um, hmm... Uh, God, what's the what's the one album that I? Who's that fucking artist? It's like, um, there's one album that I that I fucking find fantastic. Uh, rock band used to be metal. Now they're like they went lighter. That described pretty much every band. Trying to find a reference to this somewhere. Dude, I feel like Spotify is so hard to browse. They, like, really hide your own music, I feel like. Um, Sempaternal, Bring Me the Horizon. Fan-fucking-tastic. The whole album. Wow, Despised Icon. Wouldn't say they're phenomenal. <laughs> but that's a throwback. I might actually have to put on Despised Icon. Graduation... Linkin Park, honestly, I think Hybrid Theory is a really good album, but I wouldn't say it's universally good. And I don't like Meteora as much as, as a lot of people do. Most people would say Meteora is the better album, but I disagree. Speak Now, Taylor Swift, yeah, fucking, fucking fire, let's be honest. Every song on that is really good. Shit, I might I might put on uh, Despised Icon. I haven't listened to them since high school. It's weird to see that up. The ills of modern man. Let's go. In the arms of perdition. <laughs> Spotify was originally great. Somehow they've destroyed the UX. Yeah, because they've promoted the UX to be uh, more about finding new music, a.k.a. promoting the music that gives them the highest kickback. So, Aphex Twin has some great albums, yeah. Kanye's top tier production value, basically unparalleled in the industry. I would say, I would say that's true. I would say up there with really, really good production value. Um, trying to think. I've been listening to them a lot recently, and I can't think of their name. Everyone's going to know them. 
Um, but I think they have, uh, Rage Against the Machi Machine. I think their production and mixing is fucking fantastic. So fucking good. So fucking good. Like, oh my god. Rage Against the Machine's mixing? Like, I've never had a meteor bass line that doesn't feel like it muddies the song. It's so good. Green Day Dookie was back, in, uh, good back in the day. I agree. I don't think Green Day has aged as well. To be honest. Um Sony Monitors do nothing. No, they're doing they're doing the Matrix, dude. They're doing the Matrix. That's doing something. Yeah. I never got too into Green Day. I got big into American Idiot, which is really good. How are you liking the bear dynamics? I think they're unparalleled. Um they're probably the highest quality, comfortable headphone that you can possibly get. I don't think you can really beat them. Thank you so much for the 100 biddies, anonymous cheer. Oh, that's actually, you know what? That's actually some sketchy biddies. Yikes, dude. Fucking yikes. Get that shit. Oh, I can't, you can't time that out. That's fucking stupid, dude. That is fucking stupid. Hmm. I wonder if you can turn off anonymous cheers. That's fucking dumb. Um. All right, so I think we can get into the Hackens. Um, let's see. And yeah, my last stream is still up for the person who is saying that the last stream was not up. It is still up. It's just a person. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what happens when they're anonymous. Cheers. But whatever. I'm not going to really pay attention to it too much. Um... All right. Let me see if I have everything set up here for programming stuff. need to make sure my fonts are good, too. Um, how's chat doing? Chat, chat doing chat things? Okay. Oops. Lazy Pro coming in with the gifted subs. Five gifted subs. Hell yeah. Last stream was up, but it was split due to a router dying to end map. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Hope you've been well. Been a long time since I've seen you out and about. Oh, yeah, it's been a hot minute. Um, could you upload the printer series to YouTube? I will when I can. Cocky's given some gifted subs. Hell, yeah. Thank you so much. Fuck, yeah. Ten gifted subarinos. We're getting this shit started. Fucking fire, dude. Pog. Aw, oh, you inspired me. Oh, man. Do you play an instrument or make music in general? Um, I play a couple instruments. I play guitar. I play saxophone. I play... I can technically kind of play any woodwind, kind of, but not really too well. Um, but those are the main ones, mainly saxophone. <laughs> the, the flute. Yes, the, the focusing flute. <laughs> 
The real Tilted Tree, thank you so much for the four months of support. Hell yeah, dude. Getting that shit lit, dude. I need to play the sax on stream. I don't have any reeds. I ran out of reeds like a year ago, and I haven't bothered to buy more because I, I... I don't know. Playing the saxophone is just such a chore, in my opinion. Like... Mostly just the keyboard. The blue switches sound so good. <laughs> Maybe to you. I don't know. I got used to them pretty fast. I've been using blues for uh, a decade now. <laughs> now, like blues have been uh, blues have been my my signature move for a while. I think browns are okay, but they feel a little bit like mashed potatoes. You just you can't you can't beat the blues. Browns forever. Yeah. Browns are, you know, browns are kind of the entry level blue. It, it's it's the it's the blue for people who are too scared to go blue. You know, dub a d, dub a die. You should try lubed switches. That just feels. I don't know if I want that. I don't. I don't want a, a sliding feeling. I, I want a little bit of a plasticky grinding sensation when I press a key. I don't know if I want lube switches. It's a blue for people who have someone else sleeping in another room. Yup, yup. You can lube uh, tactile switches. God damn. Swear by the Cali low profile chocolates. The thick clicks. Ooh, is that new to me? I just picked up the drop control keyboard uh, with speed silver switches. God damn, there's there's so many new keyboards. I'll dead drop you a keyboard. I'm good. I I have no use for more keyboards. I use all of my keyboards already. Did you see they're doing laser uh, act actuation levels to simulate a controller's triggers for use in racing games? Oh, actuation levels. Um. For racing games? For, like... Like, for, like, pedals? Or, like, a wheel? I'm so, I'm so confused. Are you an H-top hacker? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm hacking H-top so hard right now. Like, the car speeds depends on how hard you hit W? Ah, yeah. Just get a racing wheel. It's so much better. I, like, I mean, honestly, I could see, I could see having progressive keyboards would be nice, but just get a racing wheel. It's so much better. Like, even for Grand Theft Auto, it's so much better. What's the fragment, frag rinse on the candle? It's a coconut saffron. Really want a racing wheel uh, with a giant ultra wide? Yeah, I, I play a decent amount of racing games, so I used to. My wheel's actually out right now. Um, we could, uh, we could maybe, we could maybe do something with that racing wheel at some point, like control the printer head with the racing wheel where we can drive the printer. <laughs> that sounds like some dumb shit that we would do, uh, here on stream. <laughs> One of these with black caps? One of my candles? The racing wheels? The keyboards? The H-tops? Is your racing wheel in Dvorak? I wish. <laughs> Dvorak is... It, it's the only way. Here, we'll, uh, we can set up the, the H-top. Oh, actually, Polar's sleeping right now. Let's see. I guess I have Grizzly here. All right, now we wait five minutes for Grizzly to boot. 
I once found an overflow in a racing wheel when you turn it too far to the left. I'm not, I'm not too surprised. Video games are not known for their uh, high quality code or uh, exploit <laughs> resistance. That's for damn sure. <laughs> This helm's not too bad. It's not It's not that great, to be honest. I think only in, uh, in the arms of perdition is really good. Let's try it. Let's, let's throw on this. All right. We can get chat brought up to speed with what's going on here. Got a couple new gizmos and gadgets. Random things hanging around. What about maple stories? All those Xord fields? Oh, man. I can't. I can't. Can't compete at Maple Story. It's just, it's too locked down. It's too locked down. That game, they've got Game Guard. And you can't, you can't get past Game Guard. That's the, that's the end of the line right there. <sighs> oh my god, dude. <laughs> Fucking Game Guard. Is, do they still exist? Oh man, I wonder if I can find a screenshot of like the Game Guard pop up. Ah, uh, it was so bad, dude. You could just like rename like the cheat engine window, and you'd be good. Oh, it's so good, dude. Oh, Maple Story cheating was just there's just something just so captivating about Maple Story cheats. It's just. It was always a shit show. I'm trying to find the like game guard screen. Ah uh, man, can't find it. I guess no one's probably uploaded a photo because it's kind of useless. <laughs> and protect game guard. Ah, uh, you remember Maple Story Vac? I mean, Vac hacks, you know, are pretty basic, you know. That's that's really not that's really not pushing the the what you can do with Maple Story cheats. <laughs> we used to modify game card with Ollie Debug. Oh, Ollie Debug. Mmm, game card, good memories, yeah. There's the loading window. Yeah, that's what I remember. The like little pop-up loading window. The splash screen. Back when things, I guess things kind of still do sc splash screens, but not as much. I hate splash screens. Can we talk a little bit about how much I hate splash screens? Cause splash screens literally just delay you from accessing the window. And it's just stupid. <laughs> it's just so stupid, I hate it. I hate splash screens. Like, especially since they're always on, like, a five-second time or something ridiculous. So you basically can't use your computer for five seconds because you can't just open and minimize the application while you wait for it to load. You just have to, like, you get a splash screen, and then in five seconds, it's going to parent that window on top of everything else and fuck up your window manager. It's ridiculous. I hate splash screens. Stupid concept. No one uses splash screen. Ah, God, that scotch is rank, dude. That is sharp as fuck. <laughs> it's so fucking smoky. So peaty. All right. Uh... All right, there we go. Now we just have H-Top in the background. <laughs> there you go, chat. There's the real hacker screen. All right. So... Um, I think I have all of my new things here, so we can go on a little adventure. Um, getting everything ready. Is that really all I bought? 
Oh, there's that. Okay. <laughs> Need to just emerge world now? It doesn't it doesn't take very long. It does not take very long. That's for sure. Alright, let's see if we can uh, dismount the camera and go for a little adventure. Okay. So we bought a few new things here. Uh, we bought some solder. Um, so this solder is just a replacement of what I already had. So that's, that's nothing new. Sorry, I'm peeking. Um, that's nothing new there. So this is just basically replacement solder for what I had before. And this is, um, a 6236-2, which is good. Good solder. I like it. We got some new solder wick because we had some issues with solder wick the last time we used solder wick. And the reason for that is my solder wick has no flux. It has no flux. So this is, uh, this is rosin uh, in the flux or in the, in the wick. So that will hopefully be an improvement. I bought four different pairs of tweezers. So I bought a pair of tweezers here that has a like T-shaped tip there, uh, which is hopefully going to be really good for rem removing ICs. So that looks really good. I'm excited for those. Uh, a pair of these, which is just a standard sharp uh, bent at an angle tweezers. Nothing special there. Then I think this is... Uh, looks like a rounded pair of tweezers, just a standard rounded pair of tweezers. And then finally, this is just a, a bog standard sharp pointy tweezers. So we got those. So now we have ways to tweeze things. So hopefully that's, uh, that's an improvement. All right. And then uh, I bought two of these uh, like stands, mainly meant for uh, holding PCBs. So all these do is uh, you just unscrew them. And then this one I don't think I've opened yet, so it's a little bit, there you go, a little bit vacuumed. Um, but basically you have like two insulated pads here between kind of metal washers and that's it. So you can just, uh, you can put something in there and clamp it down. And then these things weigh, these things weigh about like probably maybe four or five pounds each. They are very, very heavy. It's hard to describe how fucking heavy these are. Um, and then you can adjust uh, this to a couple predefined heights. So you have five different predefined heights that you can adjust that to. Um, so I'm super excited about these because they're just, they're just so simple. Um, and these are, these are Heiko Omnivices. They're pretty expensive. Um, these are like 80 bucks a piece. Uh, and they're probably five dollars in material, um, but they're simple and they're better than most of the helping hands that I, I saw in terms of they're just you can't really go wrong if you can clamp something y you're good um, and they advertise that you use it to clamp something um, just like one would be enough to clamp most boards I don't actually have a PCB out here, but we can maybe try and clamp this while I hold the camera uh-huh uh-huh. Gonna need to tighten that down a bit more. There we go. But like in theory, this could be a PCB. Um, and this is heavy enough that I can go and poke around on this thing, even though it's only clamped in one area, right? There's a little bit of movement, but that's because I'm hitting it pretty hard. But like, right, that's pretty damn good. So I can definitely like solder and put pressure on this, even though I only have one. But I bought another one just in case I want to clamp something from multiple angles. So... Uh, I'm super excited uh, for these. So now we want to have shit running around. And since they have a little bit of elevation off the table and that's adjustable, we can maybe have a board that's flipped upside down. Because um, we had issues with boards not setting down flush. So that should be an improvement there. So two vices there, which will hopefully help. Then I got um, a pound of really nice solder. And this is uh, 6337. Uh, this is basically the lowest melting point uh, solder that you can get. So uh, we're going to go with that. Um, and then I uh, hand wrote in the notes. Basically, uh, melting point is 183 Celsius. 
I don't know why it's trying to focus on the top there. Um, but 183 is the melting point, and then 315 to 343 is the recommended iron temperature there. So that's kind of nice. Then I got uh, a set of tips for my iron. Uh, just a pointy tip there. Um, I think this is just basically a pointy tip and then different uh, widths of tips. So it's kind of pointy to flat to all the way up to like a, a super flat tip, which is like this one, which is ridiculous, right? So I got four new tips there, which I'm excited about. Um, I got uh, some flux remover. I guess the... I guess I literally need to turn up the f-stop because it's it won't it won't be able to focus the whole thing. I think f 1.4 is just too much. But anyways, um, got a thing of flux remover. This is basically just going to be um, largely isopropyl alcohol, but it's probably like 25% other additives. It's designed for removing flux, uh, both liquid and rosin based. So I'm happy about that. And then I got one of these like uh, prying and opening uh, kits which is just a bunch of like plastic uh, things so we can open things without using, you know, metal things and gouging up plastic because I really like keeping things uh, clean when I do that. So yeah, I guess that f-stop was just too, too aggressive. What else? And then I got the camera that we're on right now. So the camera is the biggest thing there. What else? Oh yeah, and then I got, um, I got a, um, I got a fume extractor. So now we can uh, extract some fumes. So, and this fume extractor, uh, really good reviews, and it actually works fucking great. I've already tried it out a couple times. So, um, that aside, I think uh, what I would like to do, so we're gonna put you back up here. Um, and then we'll put the f-stop back up. I like having the f-stop uh, super low or high, whatever you want to call it. Um, I like I like that bokeh effect, and I like that it uh, blurs out kind of the background and makes my face a little bit more of the focus. It also has great low light performance, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I've got a couple things that I bought um, that were supposed to come today, but we got a snowstorm and we didn't get mail delivered today. Um, so I didn't get a, a couple things that I wanted to. Um, I have a big thing. What do I have coming? I have, um, I have a lot of flux coming, uh, liquid flux. So I'm going to be able to just fucking dump flux on things. Um, what else? I can't, I can't remember what else I have, but that's kind of the, the main parts, the main things that I have going for me here today. Um, but a couple new things, and I think that will be fun. A little bit of an improvement, I think. Um, all right, just capping off my tweezers. But yeah, I did not own tweezers until now. These are my first tweezers I've ever purchased. <laughs> so that'll be an improvement. So, um, I am thinking we, we are in a good spot to just start hacking away. But I kind of want to try out some of my new toys. Um, so we could maybe... Kind of think. I, I really want to solder something. <laughs> but I can't justify it. I want the vices. Yeah, these things are great. Honestly, these are just great fidget toys. But they are, they are so heavy. Like, they are a lot heavier than I expected. And I expected them to be very heavy. Um, but yeah, I... Like, the four little notches where you can kind of put it in, into four different places. And then also just front and center all the way to the bottom. So, technically five different levels of adjustment in height. Um, and then this opens pretty wide. Like, you could... If you couldn't find a perfect corner of a PCB, you definitely could fit, you know, even some, uh, like, chips or even a fucking capacitor that's small enough you could fit under there. And just use it to just get a little bit of clamping force. Not necessarily to actually pinch it or do anything like that, but just something to weigh it down so you don't have a board running away from you like we had. Um, so that's hopefully an improvement. Got so uh, copper braid. Yeah, we went through that. But I got, uh, I got some really nice braid that actually includes um, 
That includes uh, flux in it. Whereas my other braid doesn't have flux. I've always wondered, that's actually the first braid I've ever purchased. I just never ran out of that reel. Um, and I always wondered, like, people swear by this stuff. People say this stuff works so great. Personally, it's always been a pain in the ass. But it, it's basically the cheapest shit I could get. And it has no flux in it. So, yeah, of course it doesn't work for shit. Because unless you dump flux on your board, um, it's basically going to do nothing. So, that is a big improvement. I should probably just throw out the old copper braid, but I'm, I kind of want to try it out with a new uh, liquid solder. So, yeah. Getting brain dead from lead fumes is like half the experience. You don't get the lead fumes. You don't vaporize the lead. It's the flux fumes. Always third-party flux, then it doesn't matter about the core. Kind of. The core is still nice because it just... It, it still, like, means that you're adding more flux when sometimes you wouldn't add more. It, like, it's still good to have uh, cord stuff. And, like, the, the new uh, solder I got is also a uh, flux cord. And this is really good. Um, and then this is also the same thickness that I have in my other uh, solder, which is... Um, I think they say, um, 15 thou. So this is 15 thou or 0.4 millimeter, uh, which is actually very thin. But I love super, super thin because it allows me to have a lot more control on the volume that I add, in my opinion. It also, in my opinion, makes it easier to hit smaller pins. So I, I really like that. And they offer it in pretty much every size, which is great. Not saying no core, just matters less. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah. Core is always good for mobile soldering. Yeah, my plan is to, um, once I get my liquid flux, just go fucking ham and just dump it on stuff. So, what else? Um, I love solder suckers. Oh, yeah, I got a catapult. Um, or a sodapult, sorry. So I got a, so a soldapult. Um, that's coming in, like, a couple days. That wasn't on Prime, so it's going to be probably a couple more days till I get that. Um... Yeah, it sounds like the trick for that is add more solder. Make sure that you have a shit ton of solder. Not a shit ton, but make sure you have like a through hole level of solder before you try and pull it off. It's not really going to work too well if you have just a surface mount level. Um, that being said, my, my plan will be probably solder pulse for like adds. My plan for removing chips from this point on is going to um, basically add this solder, the 63... 6337, which is basically the lowest melting point solder you can possibly get. So this is made of tin and lead, and the melting point is actually lower than both tin and lead. Uh, and the reason is it's just some weird chemistry with that combination that allows the melting point to be even lower. Um, obviously, you can you can get uh, like chip quick and stuff like that, but I want to avoid that just because it's so expensive. Not that I care about cost too much here, uh, but it's nice to have a more consistent setup. And this is the solder that I'll be using anyways. So I'll be able to basically, the, the plan will be douse things in liquid flux, put a shit ton of this on to lower the melting point of whatever shitty solder is on there, solder pulp to get most of the solder off, and then clean the pads um, with the uh, new wick I got. So... Like to solder, yeah. I I I I'm not I'm not convinced on solder. I think it's solder. <laughs> uh, sidebar. This camera is awesome. Yeah, of course this camera is awesome. It's pretty much one of the best cameras you can get on the market right now. <laughs> like, it's about as good as you can get. And then the lens is basically the best possible lens you can get for um. I would say like webcam style stuff uh and the darks are really good so basically um uh, let's see So if I turn off those monitors, 
Um, once those monitors turn off. But like, this is just the glow of my monitors, right? It is very dark in this room. Obviously, I have those lights, but they don't really provide any fucking lighting, to be honest. Um, but this image quality is fantastic for the level of light that's in here. It looks bright, but it's not actually bright. It's very dark. Um, like, I can barely see. Like, I cannot read the text on the stuff uh, that I was just showing you before. Um, it's too dark. So it's pretty fucking crazy. And... Um, yeah, currently it is at ISO 4000, shutter speed 1 100th of a second. So, like, those are pretty aggressive settings. It's just mainly this lens is so fucking good uh, for low light. So, yeah, isn't that fucking cool? Like, honestly, I actually like this atmosphere quite a bit. Um, I think this atmosphere is really cool. That camera for astrophotography must be amazing. Yeah, for sure. Maybe not with this lens, because this is a fixed lens. I mean, I guess I could do... I would have to do photography, but it would be at this zoom level. So it would largely be like, you know, full sky. You couldn't really zoom in on anything. You would just be kind of... You'd be getting landscape in the image. So... Um... Uh, may I ask noob question? What do you benefit when you hack a printer? Um... Like, we're doing it for fun, but in reality, a printer is a great place uh, to basically, you know, run your exploits from, right? Uh, get code execution and persistence on a printer. No one's going to install an antivirus on a printer. No one's going to monitor a printer. So for a cheap-ass, easy exploit, you can get persistence on a printer that has 16 megs of flash. That's plenty to basically include uh, command and control, persist inside of a corporate network, use that as a, a landing point for basically comms into and out of that network, use that to throw other exploits at land-based things, so you can use land-based exploits rather than full remotes on people. Uh, printers are actually very valuable attack surfaces, and I would hazard that most most corporations that have sensitive data probably have compromised printers because they are such a great place to actually land and run your exploits from. It's a, a network LAN connected thing that is never going to be audited, that is very rarely going to receive firmware updates, that is typically running no signed code, which means you can just arbitrarily control everything on it, and like in our case, typically has like a meg extra free of storage to hold whatever you want. And a meg in the world of exploitation is an infinite amount of storage. You can do so much shit with a meg. Um... Yeah, never updated, yeah. There's some companies working on security for printers and other embedded devices, yeah, but no one, no one's going to buy that shit, right? Like, people will, may, maybe the printer companies will hire those, but like, a company is not going to be like, oh, you know what we should do? You know those printers that we already spend way too much money on? We're going to go and spend $100,000 to get this license for this software that allows us to monitor the security of our print. No one's going to fucking do that because they're not even going to do that for their computers. <laughs> like, no fucking way, dude. The manufacturers are clients. Yeah, that makes sense. But once again, the barrier to entry is still so low that it doesn't matter. Um, I highly doubt, I'm not doubting those, the people at those companies, but I highly doubt a company securing printers is really doing anything effective because printer firmware pretty much relies on read of writable, executable memory, uh, no MMUs, no ability to do ASLR, DEP. The best thing you can maybe add is some code signing or maybe integrity checking of firmware. And even then, barely. Like, if you have good networking, it should be detectable? No. That shit's complete bullshit. <laughs> that's, all, all, that's all bullshit. Like, I hate to say it, like, in terms of dealing with nation-state actors, all of those network monitoring tools are completely fucking useless. They're, they're basically the AVs of networks. Right? It, like... 
it's just, uh, yeah, it's just not really going to stop you from doing much. It's just, it's too easy to steg your data. Like, it's just too easy. Um, did you already, add, did you add memory or was there already a meg? There's a, uh, can't remember if it's 16 megabytes or 16 megabits. I think it's 16 megabytes or something. It's a fuck ton of flash in there. They're good, but who the fuck knows how to use them on a government paycheck? I mean, no one knows how to use them, right? No one knows how to use them. As someone who has bypassed every single fucking network scanner out there, or ne like network monitor, they are all an absolute fucking joke when you're talking about actually making tailored exploits. For catching malware, for catching known in the wild things, things that have signatures, things that match closely to how things are done in the public, like, malware world, sure. But for an attacker who actually knows that your network employs one of these things, they're fucking useless. In fact, they're typically attack surface because they are riddled with fucking bugs because they typically run lib Wireshark verbatim or like TCP, like the lib TCP dump, whatever the fuck library that is, and they basically parse every protocol in the world. You know how hard it is to find an O'Day remote bug in something that parses one RFC? Fucking trivial. Easy as shit. You know how easy it is to do it when they parse literally thousands of protocols? An absolute fucking joke. Congratulations, I pop that. I get full control of your network because I probably have some admin creds or I'm at a higher uh, hierarchy on your network. Those things are a fucking joke. I hate to say it. I hate to say it, dude. Like, <laughs> like, they'll happily do this in kernel space. I'm not saying that they do not provide security in most situations because most people are defending against malware. And malware, AVs, signatures, those sorts of things work. And basic looking for things getting shipped over a network, those things work. But other than that, a network scanner is really not going to outperform having a sysadmin look through logs because you would have so many false positives with a network scanner that actually would be verbose enough to catch a real attacker that it doesn't fucking differ from a net admin that is like literally looking through packets. And at that point, they're just not going to do it. And that's going to be the weak link. Um, most people don't defend against uh, attacks on AVs, yeah. So how do you defend your printer? You don't. No one does. <laughs> Nobody does. Nobody defends anything, really. Except for like some of the major companies, the big fucking companies, who have like... 50 plus million dollar a year budgets for their security teams effectively what can you do nothing nothing you can you can pay some contractors 10 grand for an audit and you can throw some network scanners on your network so that you feel better but are those actually doing fuck all against like a real actor no <laughs> no sorry <laughs> like, sorry. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, no one takes security very seriously yet. And uh, basically, I won't consider really any security being taken seriously until we're willing to take a 5 to 10 year step back in performance and features to add security. For example, we can probably get ASAN working to some level... Uh, for like a 50% slowdown. And you basically can delete memory corruption bugs, not with ASAN itself, that's fucking dumb, but with um, something like ASAN that gives you basically out-of-bounds heap protections, use after free protections, double free protections. We have the technology. We can do that now. I could add that to software. Literally in this stream, I could create that allocator, write it, build software that uses that allocator, and make that software immune to, to 
some of the biggest classes of bugs. Is anyone gonna do it? Nope, because there's gonna be a 20 to 30% performance slowdown. And now your website that takes 100 milliseconds to load due to latency is now gonna take 101.0 milliseconds to load because the actual performance of the browser doesn't fucking matter. It's the latency and the network performance, but we're gonna ignore that because they're not gonna include anything unless it passes their bullshit hot loop benchmark of their program. It's fucking stupid. Oh yeah, and also all of this costs a shit ton of money, right? A good security engineer is gonna run you easily 200 plus thousand dollars a year. In the US, right? Other countries have different, you know, uh, levels of cost. Uh, but in the US, if you want a security researcher who's really any good, you're looking at a 200K bill. Uh, and I'm not talking about their salary, I'm talking like all in, right? Um, yeah, not their salary, because keep in mind, basically, if you want to figure out how much you cost your employer, just double it. If you're in the U.S., just double how much your salary is, and that's probably how much your employer actually pays to hire you. So it's important to understand that, and that is the decision that is made on the business side. Your salary doesn't fucking matter to the business, it's the cost of employing you that matters, right? You have taxes, you have facilities, you have hiring of, of staff to maintain those facilities, clean the bathrooms, the floors, buying the desks, having a space, heating and cooling for more people, conference rooms to accommodate for more people. Like all of this shit adds up so fast. Adds up so fast. <laughs> COVID-19 offices, I mean, they still have them. They still have them. But yeah, that's, that's kind of how it goes, right? <clears throat> I would say doubling your salary is probably roughly what you actually cost your employer. Um, like, and 2x is like a low, low bar. If you have a, if you have a relatively low salary where the overheads are higher, like the facilities, it doesn't matter if you make 20K a year or you make 500K a year, your office is likely roughly the same cost. Even if you have a fancy corner office, it's still probably not much more than two or three times bigger than a normal employee, right? Um, basically, like, yeah, you're looking at probably 200K, right, to, to employ a good security engineer in the US. And that's probably the budget for a lot of these like random companies. Like a company that makes a random device like a refrigerator, right? I guess refrigerator's bad cuz they're mass produced. But like a smaller scale device that has a software component but maybe has a 3 or 5 person team, it's likely that that 3 or 5 person team of probably not the best devs in the world costs about the same price as one security engineer. You just can't fucking do it. <laughs> like, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. Um, yeah, jokes on them, I'm even more expensive since they have all, they have to handle all my fuck ups. <laughs> I mean, it is one thing that's important to, to recognize that you kind of get paid before you earn the money, at least like in, you know, computer science, right? Like when someone leaves university to go get a job at Google and it's their first year ever working uh, at a career job and they did university at some random fucking university... Are they really worth the 200K they're getting paid? No fucking way. But in three or four years, they might be worth 300 or 400K a year in terms of what revenue they're producing for the company, but you can get away with a 50K raise in that time period, and now you're making money. But in the first like year or two, like people don't even expect you to do anything in the first couple of months you're at a job, and like you're still getting paid, right? So, at that point, they moved to a different company as well. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a weird cycle. But, um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. I mean, like, 
Do you really think someone with zero days of experience is really worth like half as much as like a top 1% performer at that company who's been there for 20 years? No fucking way. Like, not even close. Um, that doesn't mean they're not valuable because they will be valuable. You're basically being paid to be educated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and these impact a business. Uh, I don't know how any of this huge level of corporate budget actually works out in the end. Well, you basically, you, 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 you don't give people raises. That's how you do it. You hire people at a price that they're like, holy fuck, that's a lot of money. Like out of school, 200K is a shit ton of money. And then they get all excited about that. And then they're happy when they get their 50K raise over the next four years. Uh, when now the company's making 500K off of them, right? <laughs> So it's, it's how it goes, right? The, the, the companies do it for basically competitive reasons. They do it because these employees will eventually be profitable employees. And that doesn't mean that some people aren't profitable on day one. Some people are, but a lot of people aren't profitable at all. A lot of people cost the company money because they take time for more senior people, but it's a long-term investment, not or a mid-term investment, right? You're on, you're investing in someone on the terms of two to five years in that ballpark. Um, these numbers are so wild for someone working in Europe. I mean, these these numbers are wild for someone working in the U.S., right? We're talking about Fang top five percent engineers, right? Like if you have a class of a hundred kids, you know, at your like top fifty university in America probably only five to 10 people are actually going to be able to get a job like this anyways, right? Um, these are already the top engineers coming out of school. Um, but it doesn't mean they're, they have the corporate, you know, environment skills they need. In EU, you don't even get that much with Fang. I mean, that's just because the EU fucking sucks to be an employee in. <laughs> EU is a better place to be a citizen, not a, not a great place to be a, a top performing, uh, like, you know, person, right? And that's, that's why the U.S. is so powerful. That's why the U.S. has so many of the best businesses and so many of the best academics and so many of the best professors, right? Because how much fucking money there is here on the top end and due to that wage inequality, it means that there's a higher upside for higher performers, right? So... Like, I, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, or one is more moral or more or less more or less moral. I'm just kind of saying how it is, right? Uh, basically, like the H-1B visa is the biggest reason why the U.S. is the strongest place in the fucking world because it's basically foreigners running our universities because they are getting the most money they can get out of running a university or running a class or being a professor or being an academic by being in the U.S. Uh, so we get kind of all the world's top talent, and it's fantastic. <laughs> the H-1B visa. It's like the worker. Uh, I think H-1B... Is that worker or is that high-skilled labor? I can't remember which one it is. You're clipping from time to time? Yeah, I'll turn that down a bit. But yeah, it's not great that that is the way, but the the U.S. is kind of a a... a financial meritocracy to some extent um it's our strength and achilles heel doesn't mean it works perfectly it definitely has many flaws but if you play the fucking game and you're pretty smart you're probably you're probably gonna make a shit ton more money in the u.s than you could make anywhere else in the world um h1b is a pain in the ass basically lottery system yeah Self-taught, just got offered my first job here in the industry as a front-end dev uh, at J.P. Morgan uh, Chase. 130k a year to start. Uh, for the type of work, uh, I feel it's way overpaid, but who's going to complain? Yeah. that. I mean, first of all, fucking congratulations. That is amazing. Um, that's fucking awesome, especially self-taught. Uh, that's fantastic. But don't feel down on yourself. That is not outrageous. Um whether or not you want to think that the industry is overpaid or tech is overpaid is a different story. 
Uh, but if you're concerned of like relatively, you are paid, you know, way too much for the skills you have. I doubt that's the case. I really do doubt that's the case because pretty much every employee is underpaid, right? So universally, it's pretty safe. Like if I had a coin that just flipped one side all the time and it just said, you're probably underpaid, it's probably correct. Um, <laughs> so don't, don't, don't feel bad about that. <laughs> or don't feel like you're over, overpaid. Um, who's going to complain? Yeah, don't complain. Fuck yeah. Um, Kamosa was woke as fuck. I, I wouldn't say I'm very woke. I just have no filter. Here in the EU, most companies instantly reject non-EUs without even checking their applications. It sucks. Huh. I didn't know that. Is that for um, high-skilled labor or all labor? Because I've noticed that, like, high-skilled labor, typically no country really cares, right? Like, I'm pretty sure China or Russia would welcome me with open arms, even though I have no idea how their culture works or how to fit in. Uh, but I think they would still be excited. <laughs> um, not 100% true. In Germany, most of the devs are foreigners. Oh, interesting. It's hard to say, you know, some people have companies that are more or less open. Uh, typically, the bigger companies are a little bit more open. Main problem with most EU countries is just your tax to death. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we kind of have that in some states in the U.S., uh, with, like, California being pretty high tax rates. Um, but I think California is pretty comparable to a lot of EU. Uh, and I know, like, the gut feeling is probably going to be say to say no. Um, but I actually think it's, it's relatively close. But then you have other states that have no income taxes. Um, basically, in the, in the U.S., so in the U.S., owning your own property is pretty common. Um, owning your own land, owning your own property, your own house, that, that sort of thing is, is pretty common. I don't know what the actual rates are, but I would imagine it's like 30 plus percent of Americans. I wouldn't even be surprised if it's a majority of Americans live in a home that they own. Um, it's, it's very common. So taxes typically in the U.S., you have your, your federal income tax, which is kind of a joke. It's like 50% of Americans basically pay no tax or get money back for federal taxes. Um, then you'll have your uh, like sales tax, which is a tax applied to goods that you purchase like at a store. Um, typically, things like groceries will be exempt, and vices like cigarettes and alcohol will be uh, an elevated tax rate, but typically that sales tax is going to be in the realm of like five to 10%. Um, and then you'll have a property tax, which is basically a yearly tax that you pay on the value of your property. This is the tax that fucks a lot of people. Um, the reason this fucks a lot of people is you moved to Seattle in 1985, you bought a house for 100k, you make 40k a year, you have a good job, you're happy with that, you're settled in, your house is now worth $2 million uh, because it was in a good area and you have to pay 1% of your house's fair market value or government a uh, ascertained market value yearly, um, which is fucking ridiculous, right? So that is how people get really forced out of areas uh, and it's a really fucked up system. 65% um, is the uh, owner. In the US, 65% of citizens own a home or land. Yeah. That sounds ac accurate. I'm not surprised. Um, ownership of land is really popular here, and thus, um, basically, income tax, or, or not income tax, um, uh, the tax, property tax, uh, which is going to be probably your car and your house, is a big deal. Property tax is a large amount of taxes. Um, it's also often a flat tax, not necessarily... It's not a flat tax in the fact that your house probably scales in value as you grow in, in worth, uh, but there's nothing stopping me from buying a $50,000 house and paying the you know, 1% or 0.8% uh, um, property tax on that, even if I make a shit ton of money. So, but yeah. Um, can't speak here for the EU, but at least in Norway, uh, we generally are okay with paying a high amount of taxes. Free healthcare, free education, um, including top universities. Uh, you get paid if you're sick. If you lose your job, the list goes on. Um, 
So here's the thing in the US. If you are well off, you have all of those things for free anyways. They're paid for by your company. Um, so basically, you can either make, you know, 200K a year after taxes if you're making, I don't know, 250, 270K probably in that ballpark. And you basically have all of the benefits. In fact, you have kind of access to better healthcare than most of the world, even if they have socialized healthcare, because you don't have lines. And I know lines are bullshit, but it means that a uh, rich dude who has a flu and a high fever is gonna kind of get to jump the line when there are people who have more valuable illnesses that need to be tended to. That has a non-zero value to people, right? Um, if you're well off in the US, yeah, your company already pays for all of those things. You already have a fuck ton of sick leave. Uh, you already probably have maternal and paternal leave at, at like most companies nowadays. There's very little incentive for these people to advocate for it. Now, I'm a big fan of these things because it leads to a more educated society that then increases the pool of people who can do the jobs that you need to hire for, which also means that the, if the supply is higher and the demand stays the same, then you can pay employees less to get the same amount or same quality of work, or you can pay them the same and get a higher echelon of work, or you can just be happy that there's a higher fucking supply of employees uh, out there, right? Um, I'm all for those things. Uh, I, I think long-term, those are the correct investments. Uh, they'll bring people out of poverty. I've, I know plenty of people who are, you know, addicted into drugs or they're um, heavily in poverty and they're stuck in a poverty cycle who are brilliant people. And I don't mean that in like, oh, it's a really smart person relative to most homeless people, like legitimately comparable to the people that I work with at, at kind of the top of society, right? Um, it's fucked up. Um, you know, I, I had a phase in my life where I, I wouldn't say I was poor. I mean, I was living on a very small amount of money and I was living in my boss's basement and I can't, couldn't afford to like have appliances. So I had to just like cook mac and cheese on a hot plate because that's the only thing I could really afford to do. Um, but I don't want to say I really was suffering because I had my computer and I was happy with that, right? Uh, but I didn't have anyone to provide for and I wasn't looking to provide for anyone at that point in my life. Um, but yeah, it, things like that are, are fucking sucky, dude. Um, wouldn't mind getting taxed as long as there's transparency. I do think that's a major issue to some extent. Um, basically, uh, taxes, like the amount of taxes per GDP have been relatively consistent throughout the US's history. They've had a small decline recently. And when I say small decline, I mean a few percentage points. Not much, to be honest. Um, and the quality of our infrastructure has decreased. And a lot of that comes down to the allocation of those funds. A lot of it is corruption uh, and other sorts of things. And I think there is uh, a little bit more of the libertarian or like fiscal conservative perspective that is um, probably more on the side of agreeing with the fact that maybe we can do more with the money that we already collect. And I wouldn't be surprised if we can't do two or three times more with what we already have by cutting things like defense spending. Uh, defense spending is largely a jobs program. It is a large source of uh, basically uh, research jobs and grants and medical jobs, as well as, of course, like, you know, soldiers, military, that sort of thing. Uh, but most medical research, most... Um, like military research, DARPA style stuff is largely just going to professors and universities and these sorts of, sorts of things. And yeah, often they have a defensive or offensive twist to them, 
but typically these are the ways that professors can afford to fucking live. It's how they can justify being a professor rather than making 500k a year at Google, right? Um, and it's it's tough because I do see that value in the defense spending, uh, but also it's kind of proven through well. I don't want to say proven. There are studies that indicate that defense spending is not as as efficient of a mechanism for creating jobs as it would be to have that money just circulating into the economy through social programs. Um, it's it's tough, right? All of these things are are very difficult, and people have their opinions, and ultimately, American culture is relatively selfish, which is typically. Uh, if I can save 2%, I don't give a fuck. Um, I am in the, you know, realm of, I don't really care about taxes, mainly because I kind of like, it's ridiculous, hum humble brag, but I can basically get raises and promotions faster than any tax rate could potentially be hiked, right? There is like, the amount of effort it would take for a 5% tax hike would be so astronomically high. It would be like, it would be a bipartisan shot down bill, a 5% hike. That would be considered outrageous. Five percentage points, not 5% increase, but a five percentage point increase in taxes would be considered outrageous in the US. Um, and to me, 5% of my income is below the noise floor of a good year versus a bad year, right? Um, so, like, but I also recognize that's unique to me. There are many people in the U.S. who have had major wage stagnation. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, their opinions aren't valid with respect to um, tax increases. That being said, most people have no idea how much they pay in federal income taxes because they have no idea how the tax system works. They think that, like, their highest tax bracket is the taxes they pay, or even if they're maybe a little bit more big brain, they, they understand the progressive system and think they pay like, you know, they make 50K in the tax bracket there. I don't know what it is, like 20, 20, 25%, something like that. Um, they probably think they pay like 16 or 17%. When ultimately, due to deductions and having kids and being married, and after you apply all of these deductions, even if you make 50K a year, you likely have like maybe 15K taxable income. And then that like falls into the zero tax uh, bucket. Um, it's like 40 or 50% of Americans don't pay any federal income taxes at all. Uh, but 40%, 40 or 50% of Americans are definitely terrified that they're going to lose all of their money when there's a 3% tax hike, right? When they already don't pay any taxes and probably never will. Um, it's ridiculous. It's fucking stupid, dude. What's my opinion on free healthcare? Uh, I think it's just correct, and I think it's going to become mandatory in society. Um, that's it. it. It's just it's just going to become a standard part of Western society. It just will be, because people will require it. Because people will, once most people have it, then the minority of people who do not have that system yet will not tolerate not having it. That is how progression works. Basically, historically, throughout history, governments provide the bare minimum to keep their citizens from being pissed off and upset and prevent a revolution by just giving them the little goldfish, the crumbs that they need to just shut up and work and be a peon. Um, and we are getting to a point in society where healthcare is going to be one of those crumbs. We're becoming a wealthy enough society that it is a small enough expenditure that it will just be something that will be expected out of Western society. Um, I'm not saying how it should be executed or how it should be done, but there's no way that that is not inevitable within 15 years. It's just inevitable. I'm sorry. 
Uh, whether or not you want it to be the case, or, or you're for it, or against it, or want it to happen sooner, or later, or whatever, it is inevitable. In the same way that, like, imagine society in 1800s before cars, you know, being like, oh, the government should provide us with asphalted roads, paved, groomed, well-maintained, all of the- it'd be like, what the fuck are you on about? But eventually, it just becomes standard and expected from governments. And at this point, if you were to go, you know, take over Canada, because that would be really easy, and make your own new country, if you weren't to provide roads, no one would fucking move there. Uh, healthcare is just going to be the same thing. So, it's just kind of how it is. Um... Whether or not you want it to be the case or not doesn't matter. It is, it is becoming cheap enough for society to do. Uh, also, the U.S., as we all know, the U.S. spends more per capita on healthcare than pretty much every other country that has socialized healthcare. So the U.S. government already is paying the amount of money that would really need to be put in place for healthcare. So with reform which I recognize is basically impossible, but theoretically, with reform, we could basically add no money to the bottom line of our existing healthcare system in the U.S., and we would just get it. Um, a lot of that just comes from the bargaining of, of being, you know, a, a bigger group of people, uh, you know, having Medicare, whatever system takes over as the sole buyer of, of these goods, um, and they can demand lower prices. Um, that being said, to the other people in the U.S., in the other people, you know, outside the U.S. in socialized systems, our government is the reason why your health care can be so fucking affordable. So, that is important. Our government and our people are basically paying for the R&D and certification of the drugs that your country buys at fucking, like, production cost. We pay the R&D, you pay the pill price. So you're welcome for that. Um, that being said, if we all move to socialized healthcare, we'll probably all have a slight increase in costs. But it won't be that big of a deal for anyone involved. Um, but yeah, we do pay for your R&D, and a lot of countries will piggyback off of the FDA's certification of med medicines, which means that U.S. companies go through FDA certification process, tax dollars go into those, the grants that the, the professors, the, the whole fucking education system in the U.S. runs off of government grants. Um, and the education system is largely responsible for the doctors, and the doctors are largely responsible for the pharmaceutical companies, and the pharma companies are largely, you know, responsible for the R&D, which takes in government grants to do the R&D, which is often defense spending, uh, which we like to shit on here in the U.S. Um, yeah, and a lot of countries are like, oh, cool, the FDA says it's fine, then we say it's fine, we don't need to go through that process here, we'll just piggyback on all of that, you know, bureaucracy that happened and was paid for overseas. Um, so, yeah, you pay for the R&D, but you pay uh, to your big pharma, yeah. So, thanks, broskies. We got you, fam. We got you. Um, thanks and take care. I'm off. Have a good one. Yeah, see you around. Yeah, we'll get to hacking soon, but we, we got a good chat going. People like these rants more than hacking. I, I know that there is a minority of people in here that are like, fucking get to hacking already. This is when people show up and hang out. And the more people that I can hook here, the more people I can hook on hacking. So, in China, don't forget China. Yeah. Should start a podcast. I mean, ultimately, like... I'm not the most informed person. I think I am very unlikely to accept bullshit, whether it's from a government, foreign, or, or U.S. governments. Uh, I'm very unlikely to take that bullshit to heart. And I also think a lot of academia and papers and studies and this is the next new thing, I think a lot of those are bullshit too. So it means I kind of have a, uh, like... The things I typically see as good are things that have kind of been tested or are obvious. Um, 
I'm pretty skeptical of most of the bullshit, you know, voodoo stuff. Um, one of the few, the only streams I know where the chatting is as valuable as the main content. Yeah, it's crazy to me. But enjoying the snow, I am. Although I did some driving in it today, and that was a little scary. Impact of crypto on taxes? Just tax it like any other asset, and you're fine. Um, although we should have uh, asset reform here. I think we should have higher taxes on wealth, mainly because I don't believe in wealth. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of income, but I'm also a big fan of spending income. Um, I'm not a huge fan of wealth. I'm not a huge fan of saving. I'm not a huge fan of any of those things, right? I am basically saving enough. So, well, I mean, saving is relatively easy when you're at big tech, but ultimately, I am planning to retire at the same standard of living that I have now. Um, but I'm not really saving to have, you know, a shit ton of money in the bank when I retire. Because I don't give a fuck. Um, wealth is really weird to me. I don't understand it. I don't understand the desire to just have money grow. Um... It feels really weird to me to think that at any point in the future, I will have a better way to spend money than I have a way to spend it now. Um, I don't know. Like, I, 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 I'm I, not trying to be ageist here. I'm going based on other people being ageist. But from what I hear from most people in their 40s and 50s, they look back with regret on a lot of the ways that they went through life and the things that they did and they wish they traveled more and wish they had more friends and wish they didn't work as much. Um, so ultimately, I just don't really see how in 20 years from now, I would benefit from having an extra couple million in the bank. <laughs> like... Um, let's see, Lotus is discontinuing a lease exige and Avora sports cars. How's your project going on? I haven't touched it in a long time, um, but I do love that car and I'll probably have that for the rest of my life. Gamosa being happiest with a room and a computer brings a few benefits. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm really happy with my life, but... I also don't see how having more money in the bank would make me happier. Um, I don't know. How's your portfolio looking? I mean, I live in the U.S. and I've been investing since 2009. Uh, so fucking fantastic. <laughs> the Fed gives me free money every day. It's wonderful. Um, too many people can't take responsibility for themselves and their poor decisions. Uh, so somehow they think the, the rest are uh, best off living under strict government rule. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of wealth is so that people stop working, right? The goal is that people stop working. Um, but ultimately there's a very viable path in life, uh, which is basically, transition into a field that you enjoy, right? Um, or go into a trade and, and start your own, basically go into management by starting your own business, right? You're a plumber for 20 years. Well, you probably know how to, you know, hire a good plumber. You probably know the good qualities to look for. You probably know how to interview one or have one shadow you well. Uh, do your, you know, get your own plumbing practice going. Um, I'm all for finding ways to increase your income, um, but not necessarily just wealth. Uh, a lot of times those do, those do go hand in hand, um, but I think there are a lot of ways to make more money or make the same amount of money or make an adequate amount of money to survive um, by doing something you enjoy that is applicable, I think, to most people. Um, and sometimes that has to, you know, like... I don't really consider your house wealth. Now, it, it is often part of your wealth and part of your retirement. Um, but that's like the thing. You should, you know, buy a house that you want to live in, it, you know, that you can afford, of course. Um, and I think that is 
kind of the best saving slash investment for most people, especially with remote work. If you can fucking get a mortgage right now at two or 3%, like you can get in the U S um, fucking do it. Let the tech workers, uh, drive up your house value by two X, wherever the fuck you live. Like it's huge, dude. Um, not necessarily for happiness, but having money in case of emergencies. I'm not really talking about that, right? I'm not talking about having like 10 or 20 K. I'm talking about the difference between having $5 million, which is enough to retire on, uh, versus having $50 million or a hundred million dollars, which is kind of just pointless, right? If you have, if you are in a position where you can save 50 or a hundred million dollars in your life, which is really, it sounds ridiculous, but it's really not that ridiculous. Um, that, that will likely be the top, like, I would say probably top four or 5% in the U S uh, for people who are like currently in their twenties or early thirties, right? I would say 50 or hundred million will probably become the top 5% when they are at retirement age. Um, just due to the high levels of inflation right now, but so yeah, I'm not talking about like having a rainy day fund, like f that fucking makes sense, of course. Um, but for people who already have the means to buy basically anything, whatever the fuck they want, I don't really understand the point in wealth. And that is why th this whole conversation, right, comes from wealth taxing. And the, the thing to me, I think people should be able to have enough wealth that they can live off of the returns of investments that are comparable to kind of the peak of their life, right? So if they peak out at making 120K a year, they should be able to have the wealth that is required to generate a, a relatively passive income that is equivalent to that lifestyle that they had at the peak of their life. Um, once you get to like $20 million in wealth, you're already talking about about a million dollars a year in ROI at 5%, which is a pretty low return of investment. Um, and that's why I'm kind of a fan of like wealth taxes because I just don't see much reason to have much beyond five, ten million million for most people. And another thing, when you have... When you... <laughs> When you're in a position that you can save 10 to $50 million over the course of your life, you can just borrow money. I, 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 like, I know that might sound crazy, and I don't even mean like loans, like the standard loans you're talking about. But when you become a very wealthy individual, and I would say when you can save up to that amount of money, and when I say you can save, I mean like, if you live frugally and you can save these assets, you are already probably in a position of power that means you can just get whatever you want. You already have the title, the resume, the, the smarts, the social manipulation aspects that you can go in and get pretty much whatever fucking loan, investments, crowdfunding, whatever the fuck you want. And that's why it's kind of weird to me because like, like I could save up probably, like I am mainly projecting. I could probably reasonably save up to those amounts of money if I live very frugally. And I basically ask, am I better off buying things that I like now to make myself learn and grow at a younger age when I'm likely more, you know, receptive of learning and change or should I hoard all of my money so that in my 40s, I have, you know, a shit ton of money laying around? Well, if I just spend the next 15 years spending my money, not fucking blowing it all, but, you know, saving a reasonable amount for retirement, saving a reasonable amount for rainy day, not doing stupid shit, owning a house, owning my cars, like stuff like that, um which I know is a high bar, and I'm not talking down to people who can't trivially do that. I know I'm very lucky to be able to do that. But 
if I just spend my money and do research now, in my 40s, I could just ask someone for more money than I could have saved. Like, if I do research now, like, I've, I've talked about doing physics. If I spend, you know, maybe $50,000 building up a really good double E lab, maybe a physics lab, get some vacuum chambers, maybe a little bit of a chem lab, and, like, build that up, where I maybe spend 20 or 30 grand a year accumulating, like, a very good lab in my house or, or buying a warehouse and building one there. If in my 40s, I have some brilliant idea that I need $10 million to execute this idea, it's easier to get if I just fucking learned and built up that credibility and that knowledge rather than prolonged learning, just thought of ideas and saved up the money so I could just do them with my own money, right? And that's what's so ridiculous to me. Like... Right now, seriously, right now, I could probably pretty easily find two or three people to get together and go get $10 million in venture capital for, like, a security-based company fucking trivially. Like, it would be so easy. I'd get some of my friends who are more startup-oriented, interested in doing startups, brilliant people with creative ideas. I understand the weaknesses, the hard parts of management and running a company. I'm not going to be like a fucking idiot tech bro who thinks they're, since they're smart in tech, they can do everything. I would recognize the right balances that we do need to have a CTO or, a, or, or like a CFO, someone to manage finances, someone to manage direction, someone who can communicate well with VC. It would be so easy for me to get 10 million in VC right now. And that's why I just find it ridiculous. Like, the reason I can do that is because I have spent my life learning. And so if I want to do that, if I want to do something awesome with my life, I should just keep learning and build up a credibility so that people trust that I know what I'm talking about when I want to do something and just give me money to do it rather than being too fucking scared to take a risk and only do it on my own money but sacrifice my learning to do it. Like, I don't know. Keep in mind, this is, this is not standard advice, right? This is like, this is a, a serious inner monologue that, that I kind of have and trying to figure out how I want to go about things. But that's kind of my viewpoint, right? Like... Getting money is so much easier than making money. And you see this, if you ever watch uh, like American Greed, it's a CNBC series about scams. And there are people who like put on their fucking used car salesman, you know, uh, suit, have zero education. And I don't mean that as like they didn't go to university. I mean, they have like no fucking skills at all in life. They have like no skills. And they'll go and raise 10, 15 million dollars by just saying, oh yeah, we'll give you 20% returns, 50% returns per year, whatever. And people just give them money. So if it's that easy to get money when you're literally a con artist, and I'm not saying it's easy to be a con artist, you, you need to have some level of charm. But if it's easy to get that level of money when you don't have assets, you don't have skills, you don't have a resume, you have no reason to actually warrant getting this money, I just find it so hard to believe that I will ever be in a situation where I will have more money to do an awesome project than people would be willing to just lend to me, right? It's strange. Um, just having X Fang in your CV is enough to get crazy money from any VC. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's weird. And, and that's, in my perspective, why I don't care about wealth taxes. Because I just don't think you need wealth to accomplish amazing things. I think, personally, I think a million dollars a year is a, a reasonable amount of money for someone to make as an upside, as a reward for whatever they do. Um, I think it's reasonable that, that people can make up to that. I think maybe even 10 million is reasonable. Beyond that, I don't see a huge reason. 
Um, and I, I and wealth even more so. Um, I, I don't know. That that's that's kind of my view. And and I know I, I hope that didn't come off as like some weird, fucking disgusting, you know, privileged speech because I, I recognize I'm very privileged in my position, but I also am very lucky in the, in the things that I've had in life, uh, and I don't expect people to do these things. Um, but this is kind of my projection as someone who is basically the target of a lot of tax policy, right? I am the target of most tax policies, um, and I'm the enemy of a lot of people who want these more progressive tax policies, and this is basically why I don't mind those policies. Um, maybe I'm just not as selfish. I find that hard to believe because I consider myself to be a very selfish person. Um, maybe, like, I don't know. Like, it, it's, it's strange to me that people can be in a position where they would be affected by these wealth things and they don't recognize the power that they already have uh, and that they don't really need personal wealth to really accomplish what they need to do. Uh, it's, it's weird. It's, I, I don't know. You're super intelligent and hardworking. Don't worry about it coming off as privilege. Yeah, I mean, I agree, but I, like, I am lucky with the, like, opportunities and kind of the way that my life unraveled, right? And I didn't know it at the time, but in hindsight, it's very obvious. And it's not like I became woke to it. It's just you don't really know what's happening when it's happening, right? I didn't know that having a mentor as a kid was going to completely change my life. I didn't know that skipping college was going to result in me being at a company that respected my individuality so much that they let me have the freedom to learn and grow and teach me and, and just shower me with like care and affection. And they didn't necessarily pay me the most and that's ultimately why I had to leave. But the, the, the coworkers, the environment, the, the like amount of interest people had in me learning and, and growing and trying new things out and the respect that I got from my peers in terms of like when I'm fucking 19 years old with no knowledge and 40, 50 year old senior principal engineers are coming to you for advice on how to like design certain things. Even if they were lying, even if they didn't actually want my advice, but just wanted me to like feel like I was being included in the conversation, I don't care. That is fucking amazing. Like, and that is kind of what I consider to be lucky in my life, is, is having that environment. Um, now, that being said, I really understand how to communicate with adults. I understand when to push boundaries and when not to. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an adult now, so that's not an impressive skill anymore. But when I was 18 to 22, 23, I was trolly, but I knew how to gain respect of adults. Um... And that goes back to even being a child. Like, I remember going into, like, Best Buy and, like, buying a graphics card. And my mom would always, like, comment on, like, how the fuck did you engage, like, the service rep that well, right? And it's not that they were trying to sell me a product. It's that we had a conversation about, like, what cards are which and what has the best cost, you know, the best value and, and what's the new technology coming out. And I remember my mom, like, just being fucking shocked at that of, like, I, I rem like, I think it was my mom, but someone at some point in my life, some, you know, leader, teacher, parents, family member, I don't know who it was. I think it was my mom at some point was just like, I don't understand, like, how you communicate so well with adults um, and, and that is, like, I think I know how to 
inspire people. And I think I knew how to do that when I was a kid. And I think that's why a lot of people showered that level of interest into me when I was a young member of, of a job. Uh, because I think I make work exciting. I, I, I pull in a different perspective. I have a lot of energy. I, you know, I'll pull all-nighters in the office. Like, people fucking come in and I'll still be there from the night before. And it's not like a managerial, oh yay, we're happy that you're working your ass off. It's it's that they saw the passion and that passion ignites a passion in themselves. Um, so while I'm lucky that I had an environment where I could like bring that passion out in people, that they had kind of maybe a, a passion deep down, uh, there are definitely situations where that doesn't exist, where you can't bring that passion out. Uh, but I can't fault uh, myself and say it's all luck because I definitely drive a lot of that interest myself, right? Um, so I also think that's why we're here. Yeah, like, it's weird, and I think I'm having... That's why a lot of this is coming to light when there's so many people that come to these streams. It's, it's kind of eye-opening, and, you know, how many people have you know, wanted to kind of work with me before in the past. Um, it's a lot of it's the passion and, and whatever. And I, I think to some extent it's because I actually care about what I do. Um, I am pretty aggressive when it comes to finances and, you know, not staying at jobs that I think aren't paying me enough. But I also, even when I'm in a position where I don't think I'm paid well enough, I still work my ass off. We've had this conversation before on stream. I'm not hurting my employer by kicking back in my chair. I mean, I am, right? I am hurting my employer if I kick back in my chair and do fucking no work because eh, they don't pay me enough. But I'm also hurting myself. I'm not growing when I do that. If I'm sitting back and doing zero work because I'm pissed at my boss... That doesn't make me more valuable. It makes me more jaded. It makes me burn out faster. It makes me less interested. It makes me learn less. Um, and I think ultimately I have this underlying interest in actually learning more and becoming a better person uh, that I think transcends the company that I work for. Uh, and I've had this at jobs before. I've had it where I have basically... Um, like formally, like in a contracting position, when I have been in a position where my company that I'm working for as a contractor has fucked up to an end user or client or whatever, whatever you want to consider them, um, I have fucking been honest when my company is in the wrong. <laughs> like when I've gone into meetings and they're like, yeah, I feel like we're getting fucked by your company right now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> Let me see if I can make it right. And then turns out I got rewarded for that by my company. I actually got a bonus because the customer was so fucking happy. And I literally basically shit talked my own company. Right? I basically sided with the customer and stayed with the customer and, and hung out with them a little bit longer and got to know them basically once all the other people left the room and I built friendships and connections there. Then I kind of shit-talked the company I was at, but I also helped them because I work at that company and now the customer is happy to work with me. Right? And it, like, I guess I just am not maybe the most loyal with companies and that, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I will be for uh, whatever company is willing to pay me the most. Definitely super loyal. Um, but I think that shows as, as honesty uh, to a lot of people. But yeah. All right, I got to change up my music. My music is, uh, <laughs> I hadn't on an album and the album ran out. Uh, you didn't see this earlier, but you would uh, be seriously proud of what I've been doing lately. I've been learning and coding in x86-64 assembly, and I've been writing custom shell code. Um, I have also been writing my own emulator in C. I'm following a tutorial, but it's super awesome. I also plan on learning Rust soon. Yeah, all of those things sound fantastic. I think assembly is a great thing for... 
for most people who probably enjoy this stream to learn. Not for most programmers to learn, but I do think it is a, a good skill to have. Assembly, I know you're learning this right now, and you'll think this in hindsight. You might not think this right now, um, but you will think this in hi hindsight. Assembly is really fucking simple. It's so straightforward. It's so simple. It's super logical, and it just makes sense. Um, thus... I think it's good for people to understand what their computers actually fundamentally do at a low level. I have an off-topic question. What is the story behind the Nmap license change? I have no idea. I never really use Nmap. I use Nmap when I'm too lazy to log into PFSense to see what the current lease is for a device, so I just scan for it. Other than that, I don't use Nmap. <laughs> Any good resource to learn it? I would actually say, unfortunately, it's not x86-64 or x86. But I think Azaria's uh, teachings on ARM assembly are some of the best assembly teachings you can find. Um, just her teachings in general are fucking fantastic. So highly, highly recommend it. Assembly is actually uh, pretty simple. It's more intimidating uh, than hard, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the meme of a lot of like CS students, like, I don't understand pointers. Pointers are hard. Um, if pointers are hard, then assembly is going to be diff difficult conceptually. But if you want to ever be a valuable C or C++ programmer, you need to understand how pointers work thoroughly. It is basically... Pointers are the fundamental operating, like, it's pretty much the fundamental way that computers fucking function um, in assembly in C and in C++ uh, and in Rust, although they're called references and they're a little bit more complex. Um, I cringe when I hear C or C++, like embedded devs, like, pointers are so hard. God fucking damn it. Understand pointers. If you don't understand pointers, you need to understand them. I don't understand what's hard behind pointers. I don't either. But that is probably one of the most common things that I hear people complain about of why C and C++ is so hard. The implications of pointers are more difficult than the pointers themselves. That's true. Um, and I would agree with that being... The hard part, if people actually cared about the implications, but in C and C++, people don't even care about the implications of it. So that's, that's what's kind of weird to me. Like, I understand, like, at a Rust level, the pointer implications are complex, and the Rust references are basically the same logic you need to use in C reference, or C pointers. Um, but in C and C++, people just don't care, and they're oblivious to the actual complexities of pointers. And that's why I find it so strange that people have problems with pointers in C and C++ because they're not actually learning how pointers work. <laughs> pointers are made hard by curriculum. Yeah, I have no idea what the curriculums are, but they've got to be fucking bad given all the C and C++ code I've seen in the world. Um, all right. Uh, why are you using Gentoo? Because you compile all the source from scratch, which means it's easier to modify the code and get debug information in it. Um, do you really use all the monitors behind you? Yeah, of course I do. Uh, I use that for security research. The same sort of shit we do on stream. Um, that's it. It's just a, it's just another computer that I do work on. That, that's li literally all it is. It's just another computer that I do work on. Um, all right. Let's see. Um... All right, I think I think we had some good rants there. I think we had some hot takes. I don't think we scared anyone. No one got really mad at any of the hot takes. I'm pretty I'm pretty impressed with that. Uh, none of our hot takes were too hot that we pissed anyone off. Kind of I'm kind of impressed. Um, pretty pretty based. Yeah, I mean. I'm pretty comfortable in seeing that both sides of the aisle in the U.S. have the same complaints and they just don't communicate well enough to know it. And it's kind of funny because I feel like I can say shit 
that both sides agree with. Because, because it's, it's fundamentally what they both agree in. And uh, they just uh, refuse to communicate. And uh, so they think they want different things, but they don't. It's great. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, all right. New M1X processor is expected to give more than double the performance for i9 or Ryzen counterparts. Yeah, bullshit. Uh, what will be the long-term benefits of these performance gains? I mean, that's just bullshit. It's not going to have 2x the performance. <laughs> it's just... It's just not... Maybe, maybe performance per watt? Maybe performance per dollar? Maybe performance per watt for a single chip desktop computer when you caveat it? Not for performance. I'm sorry, for all of the fanboys of all processors, we are basically limited on the performance based on the fundamentals of how we design processors and basically the lithographies and the manufacturing processes. And all of the manufacturers making the highest end chips basically use the exact same technologies and the exact same methodologies. No one is going to get a 2x performance gain in terms of raw performance. Someone might get performance per watt because that is a specialty. No one's gonna fucking get that. It's impossible. You just, you can't just double the performance somehow because that technology has to be invented and if that technology is invented then it would have happened in a lab a decade ago because that's kind of the manufacturing like the shit we could have made about a decade ago in a lab is kind of what we can mass produce now maybe not a decade but some order of years right some number of years if someone has a way of making things raw 2x faster then that tech has been known about for a long enough time that all of the manufacturers would be using that tech by now. So, that's, that's kind of the skepticism that goes along with that process. Um, that, that's kind of why I say that when I don't actually know the numbers. Maybe performance in a specific scenario, same thing. Don't really give a fuck. I can make a processor that beats everything else at a very specific use case as well. And that comes down to a benchmark as well. You can pick a, uh, you can pick a benchmark. Basically, here's how, you, here's how you p-hack it. You make a processor that has a 20 deep branch predictor, and then you have a competitor that has a 16 deep branch predictor. So you, as that company, make a benchmark that has a 20 deep branch problem that causes the other processor to basically get stuck infinitely in a fucked prediction state, and you just chug right on through it. Congratulations, you have a five times faster processor. It's fucking easy, dude. Like, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. All of that performance shit, all of the Ryzen versus Intel versus ARM64 versus Apple, at the end of the day, when you account for the scalability of those processors, the cores, the number that you can fit in a node, the memory bandwidth, the cost per dollar, the performance per watt, when you factor in all of those things, they're kind of all in the same fucking clump. <laughs> um... Was not my point. If your CPU encodes or decodes video and hardware, you can have higher performance for those tasks. Oh, of course. That's, that's like, I wasn't even thinking about that because I assumed that that has already been logicked out. But yeah, of course, if you have hardware acceleration, you just win. Um, but yeah. That's ultimately the... The current bottlenecks in performance, if, if, if you're seriously curious, the current bottlenecks in performance is basically uh, literally like the speed that electrons can float through circuitry and thermals. Thermals are basically the biggest issue. And that is why processors nowadays, compared to like even 10 years ago, processors nowadays throttle based on specific tasks. 
So like 10 years ago, you would throttle your processor's performance, maybe if your case doesn't have good ventilation and it's actually getting too hot, and maybe you would throttle your performance um, if you want more battery life or you want to run at a lower clock rate or your system is idle. Those sorts of throttlings have been around for probably 15, 20 years in a widespread variety. I'm sure they've existed theoretically forever. Modern processors will literally downclock your processor per core based on the operations that are occurring on that core for like millisecond level, even microsecond level time durations. And that is because the operations, while you can have the biggest heat sink, liquid nitrogen on your CPU, all of these things, when you think at a, at a microscopic level, there is a tiny piece of circuitry and it takes a non-zero amount of time for it to dissipate its heat. And when you get to the densities that we have nowadays, pretty much everything comes down to power and thermal densities. So basically, to increase the quality of a signal, basically to increase the discrepancy between a high and a low signal, right? If it's five volts and zero volts, if you flip that, the, the higher frequency you flip it, the more and more those will close into each other because you're not actually really, there, there's a rise and a fall time. And, and the faster you switch between these, the closer those boundaries get. So the only way that you can really compensate is with literally the manufacturing process and physics, like actually changing the way we physically design these circuits such that you have like bigger tolerances um, or some ways that you can kind of fit these like lower signals in there or you turn up the voltage. If you have a signal that at five and zero is decaying and decaying at this frequency, if you make it between 0 and 10 volts, you now have increased that window again, and you can increase the frequency more and increase the voltage and more and whatever. Now, you're not increasing it by 5 volts, you're increasing it by millivolts at a time. But when you do that, you now have more heat being generated. So when you have that heat being generated, you have to get rid of that heat. And when you have smaller and smaller processors, smaller and smaller features, just due to manufacturing getting better, that heat gets denser and denser and denser and denser, which makes it harder to get rid of that heat from a very compact area that's critical to your processor's functioning. So ultimately, to make things go faster, you need a higher voltage. And to make things have a higher voltage, you need to wick away heat better. And to wick away heat better, you literally need materials that can wick heat better than the current materials that we're using that also have the conductivity properties. And a lot of that comes down to basically the, the design and adding layers and the way that you route wires that you can kind of use those to dissipate thermal loads away from the, the areas that are generating the heat. Um, it's, it's seriously a physics problem. It is a physics problem. The material science is a real thing for manufacturing, and that is a huge point in making things viable. But in terms of not caring about actually scaling to, to manufacture and widespread uh, mass-produce things, it is literally just a physics problem. And that physics problem is the same for Intel and AMD and ARM and whatever. The only leg up that you can really get over those competitors is a specialization or basically maybe you can get rid of some backwards compatibility and change something up that allows you to avoid an old legacy component that was maybe maybe hard to optimize around and replace it with a new uh, variant. Those are kind of your only options for making processors better than competitors. And that's why at the end of the day, they're kind of all the same at a physics level. It really comes down to your workload and your specialty. That's, that's my little rant on that. Um, um, as a noob, why, uh, why is that comparison unfair? M1 does everything a normal CPU does better and faster? I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's 
just not the right thing to call it, right? Like, if you were to make a truck that handles as well as a car and can hold more cargo than a car and can do all of these things, or sorry, if you can make a car that can do all of these things a truck can do, handle more cargo, handle better, better off-road, you're not gonna just call that thing a fucking truck if it's still a car, right? It's just not, it's just bad terminology. People on Twitter suggested AMD and Intel current-gen processors are narrower than the M1 because the front end is the bottleneck. Is this true? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the front end is definitely more of a bottleneck uh, for Intel and AMD, uh, and that definitely means they need to have a wider back end. That being said, with good speculation, a good-sized register bank, you can likely make use of the width of those things. Um, yeah, yeah, it varies, right? It varies. Um, but yeah, the, fr the front end on Intel and AMD processors is largely the bottleneck because effectively you need to convert one architecture to another architecture, whereas ARM, I don't think, I can't speak to it for sure, I don't think they're using a microarchitecture. Just increase cache sizes, it's the memory. Well, if you increase the sizes of caches, you increase the latencies of caches. The bottlenecks in computing are largely actually the latencies, not the actual throughputs. Um, so late caches are the biggest issue, but once again, physics. If you make caches larger, electrons have to travel further, which then means they're slower. So, you're kind of fucked. Isn't the 128 bytes per load uh, on the memory port a serious bottleneck? Oh, not at all. Not at all, dude. Not at all. Right? Like, like think, think about the throughput of that. Multiply, multiply 128 by the clock speed of your processor. Multiply 128 by 3 billion, right? So whatever that is, uh, 500 gigabytes per second of throughput? What fucking application is really bottlenecking on that? None, none of them are. Nothing, nothing fucking matters, right? Now things like store forwarding matter and having two store ports over one I think is really good because um, it gets rid of more dependencies but, like, yeah, it's, uh, you're not really bottlenecking on that. Twitter servers might? Well, keep in mind, that is, no, they're not. I can guarantee you they're not, uh, because a Twitter server doesn't have one core. So take 500 and then multiply 500 by 190 cores. Congratulations, you can read 30 terabytes per second out of cache on a fucking single server. I'm pretty sure that's more than the entirety Twitter bandwidth on a single server. I don't think that's the bottleneck. Now, there are scientific applications where those are the bottleneck, but scientific things... We are getting to a point where we need to have server computers and server computers serving latency response type messages need to be treated from high performance computers that are doing math, which need to be treated differently from desktop computers that are browsing the web. Because we can make specialized processors that work best uh, for each of those fields a lot fucking better than the general purpose processors we have now. And that's largely changing cache sizes, changing memory latencies, changing scalability properties, changing thermals. Because in a data center where you have basically infinite redundant power and cooling, you can do a lot different things thermally than you can do on a desktop computer that's going to basically be in the standard fucking configuration. Um... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a long answer, but uh, mm, not really. Ultimately, your software is probably 
10 to 50x slower than what the hardware can actually do. So you're not even bottlenecking on hardware anyways. The amount of applications that truly are bottlenecking our hardware, basically fucking zero. Like nothing is really close to the efficiencies that it could be at. So it doesn't really matter. We could literally make like your browsing experience probably 10 times faster by changing software and going back 10 years in hardware. It's just completely fucking made up, dude. Like relying on hardware to get faster to make your computer more responsive is just laziness. Um, but that makes sense because you offload your laziness to someone else. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, answered this, but what do you think about the whole North Korean APT Twitter thing? I mean, I don't really give a shit. Like, is anyone surprised? Like, do you not think security researchers are being attacked by every country at all times? Like, are you that naive? You are. You're being attacked. You're being spearfished by other nation states at all times. <laughs> like, Gabe got it? Yeah, I got I got one of the DMs. I didn't respond to it, but that's because I just don't respond to most DMs. But, like, it's just how it goes. Like, if you are a security researcher, you are basically an arms... Not arms dealer, but an arms specialist, right? And you could be an arms dealer if someone stole your bugs and stole your access. Uh, they want to steal your ODA? I mean, it's not even that. It's one, they want your access to things. They want your access to bug lists, right? Like, as a nation state, you want to know when your bug is getting burned so that you can stop using your exploits. Because if your bug gets burned and you end up having like a silent patch go out or some shit and you end up throwing your exploit, you might fuck your whole operation. And if you fuck your whole operation, you might be starting a war. Or you might be getting people killed. Um, that's kind of the nature of Ode, right? Like, Ode are weapons. Ode are being used in things that will likely be considered acts of war when law gets caught up to date. They're actively being used to find people and kill people and people get killed over the results of these bugs, over the results of over the bugs getting found, over the rootkits getting detected. Like lives are lost due to these things. Um so yeah, people like to have a heads up on like when they need to stop doing an operation. So a uh, fucking course. That's why you shouldn't rely on one O-Day. It doesn't matter if you have 50 O-Day. If you have 50 O-Day and one of your O-Day gets patched and you throw that O-Day because it got patched silently and you didn't know it got patched and you get detected, yikes. Yikes. Like, y you got problems. Um... Um, doesn't Metro think it's more, uh, in line with espionage than warfare? Oh yeah, it's more espionage than warfare right now. And that's because there's not really any war going on. But I think when war happens, we're just gonna see it. We're, we're just gonna see Ode being fucking used like hotcakes. Um, that, that's kind of, that's kind of the, my view. Like... My, my, my view is, is basically um, attack the citizens. Don't. I'm not morally saying this. Um, but basically, if you permanently take down, like, internet and healthcare portals and uh, power facilities and water cleaning facilities with a cyber attack when a war starts going to be really hard for those citizens to, uh, you know, produce for the war effort. Like, it's already uh, using a bunch now, just not, yeah, yeah, I agree. But that's kind of, kind of how that shit, in my opinion, is going to go. Like, 
I think the inner, like, basically, if there's a major, like, US, China, Russia level superpower war, I think the internet is fucking gone, dude. Like, first fucking thing, internet is gone. And there is a lot in the world that requires the internet to be operating with low latencies, high uptimes, good reliability. And that's just like denial of service and like bricking devices and, and fucking up infrastructure, let alone actually modifying, persisting, logging, tracing, tracking, right? Yeah, it's... I don't think people realize how big of a house of cards we have built. Um, I don't really care for individuals because individually... There isn't much in your house that will stop working without internet, but definitely industrial plants, facilities that require like online updates, remote management, especially when we do more working remote. Holy fuck, those things need internet, and they need internet so bad, and the software that they have can't just be turned into offline because it's probably a defunct company, and they're running their chemical manufacturing plants off of software from a company that doesn't exist anymore. So they're not getting fucking updates. Like, your water and heating and electricity might stop. Yeah, but like, generators aren't too hard to get. And like, it's pretty easy to keep a community fridge running, right? Like, it's it wouldn't be too hard to just have fridges running nearby or get local power production, but it's going to be spottier, third world, you know, brownout, blackout style uh, energy production. Um, I can't put a generator in my apartment. It's freezing out. Yeah. One could say it's quite easy to give people free face masks. But what happened a year ago? I think I think that is a kind of a great analogy of like basically when your uh, demand skyrockets and your supply declines because you have reliance on convenience, which in the face mask case was basically reliance on on China's production, which they just stopped sending masks. Um, which is fine. I'm not criticizing China for doing that. You're acting out of self-interest, which makes sense because your citizens are going to be pissed. Like, Im imagine if America, like, typically made most of the masks in the world and they shipped off most of the masks to China or some shit due to exporting. And then all of the sudden, this pandemic hits, and we still export 90% of our masks? People would be fucking mad. Don't act like China shutting off mass shipments to the US is not the same thing every fucking country in the world would do and should do to maintain their citizens being fucking happy. <laughs> it's crazy to me that people are like mad at China for that. What the fuck? Wait, why would you get your citizens mad? How is that going to help? You, <laughs> your own citizens have to come first. It's required. It's mandatory. It's not necessarily the most moral universally thing, but it's required. If you want to keep your society functioning and your people in power and your military operating, you got to do it. Though China downplayed the virus uh, and at the same time shipped all the medical stuff back uh, to China from EU. I mean, yeah, I like. <laughs> would the U.S. not do the same thing? Like, <laughs> we we probably wouldn't downplay it as much because our scientific community can just speak past the government. And if there are scientists that have things that don't match the government narrative for how it's going, they'll just speak out, and they have the avenues to do that. Still going to be efforts to keep it down, dude. <laughs> like, it's still going to fucking downplay it. Let's be honest. Um, we're all douchebags when push comes to shove. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, I don't know. 
Anyways, um, we can, uh, let's get on to some hackins. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab some frozen, uh, some, not frozen pizza, some cold pizza. And I'll be right back. All right. Um, hell yeah. Um, Western media serves the Western government agenda? Not necessarily. They do serve the Western government agenda in terms of Western ideals. But Western media definitely does not fucking serve the government agenda. They are very critical of the government. Both sides will shit on the government at all times. That's literally what news channels do, is make fun of the government. <laughs> like, it's, it's literally what news is in the U.S., is shitting on whoever is in power. That doesn't mean we don't have Western ideals that are kind of universally shared, and those are parroted, and those things are big in that media, but goddamn can we be fucking critical of our goddamn government. <laughs> we fucking hate our government in the U.S. We hate our government. They have freedom of speech in a box with many red lines? Are you talking about in the U.S. or in China? Because in the U.S. you can say pretty much whatever the fuck you want. Um, Germany has a quasi-state-owned news channel, and it shits on the government. Yeah. You can say anything you want in the U.S. except socialism? Is that why Bernie is uh, one of the most popular candidates with all the kids? And he gets some of the most airtime out of any politician? <laughs> no, it's the mittens. Um, we do, we do, we do hate, uh, socialism. I mean, we hate communism, and Americans aren't educated enough to know the difference between socialism and communism. And goddamn, do we hate communism in the U.S. <laughs> that has not passed, which is crazy to me. Like, The hatred of communism is more of a hatred of, uh, you know, Russia, China, other countries. It's not necessarily a political ideology thing. It's more of a war, country, superpower, enemy thing. <laughs> that being said, objectively, communism has not worked out too hot. <laughs> For, mo for most nations who have tried it. It has not worked out too hot. Um... There's even a difference in communism and Stalinist communism. Nope, it has to be Stalin, otherwise it's not communism. <laughs> you say it's so hypocritical, they bleach everything out on t TV? Free speech, I bet. 
trying to censor things such that they are viewed as more polite in society and more agreeable with the societal norms and how we want children to be brought up and, and learn is not fucking censorship of free speech. Are you crazy? <laughs> like, that's not how that works. <laughs> God, the, the rest of the world just has no freedom. They have, like, they put, like, airbags and, and seatbelts in their cars. They're restricting people. No, they're just doing the thing that fucking society wants. <laughs> Communism in the U.S. is original sin. Oh, yeah. Hate it. It's fucking hated in the U.S. And that's literally just cold work propaganda. Oh, fuck. Um, that shit's crazy to me. Absolutely fucking crazy. Interesting how it's illegal to drive without a seatbelt, and at the same time it's completely legal to drive a motorcycle. Um... That's because people like motorcycles. Once again, society likes motorcycles, and thus we decide we allow motorcycles to exist. Like, <laughs> kind of how it goes. Like, we like cars, so we make them safer, right? And that's why some, some states try to make people on motorcycles wear gear and protective stuff and helmets. But... Is it true that a significant part of people do not wear their seatbelts in the U.S.? Um, yeah, I would say that's a pretty big, a uh, pretty common thing. Um, doesn't the car ring when you're not, while you're driving? Yeah, so here's what you do. So I'm, I'm sitting, sitting in my car, right? You have a seatbelt right here. It's over here for you commies. So you grab your seatbelt over your right shoulder because you're sitting on the right side because you're communist. And you take that, you put it behind your back, and then you put it in the clicker. Congrats, you did it. A lot of people do that. Um, definitely more popular in uh, rural areas. They sell accessories. Oh yeah, you just you can also just buy the like the, the seat belt and just like click it in. You can find them on Amazon for like five bucks. Like, goddamn commies, yeah. Capitalism would work wonderfully if we cared to get proper laws companies can't get around, implemented wealth taxes, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think the U.S. has a decent government system, to be honest. Um, I think it's a complete piece of shit, but it's worked out fantastic. Um, we've created amazing things. We've created amazing opportunity. We've allowed a lot of people to escape shitty situations. Um... And now, we need to get better about those things, because there are many people that are still in shitty situations, and they're shitty situations that we are putting people in as a country. But, the U.S. has always been kind of a, a beacon of hope for a lot of people trying to, you know, find freedom, find a new life, a new, a new place to start. Um, and that, uh, that's... Definitely, uh, some of our policies are outdated at this point in time. Um, it doesn't change how many people want to live here and how big immigration is here and, and how open we are to immigration here, right? Yeah, we might have people who, who can't stand certain people immigrating here, but we're pretty fucking open to immigration. This country is basically built on immigration. There are people who want to pull up the ladder behind them, and that's always been the case. But, like, we are typically a lot more accepting of immigrants than a lot of the Western world, which is kind of crazy to me. Uh, but looking at, like, 
A lot of refugee, like the refugee crisis in the EU, the amount of fucking rhetoric in a lot of those countries of keeping those people out. Yikes, dude. Like, yeah, we have a little bit of that here, but not nearly as much, right? We've always been a little bit better about immigration. But it doesn't mean we don't have room to improve. It does not mean we don't have room to improve. I want to make that very clear. Um, but yeah, you you can be you can be talking to the to the most fucking right leaning conservative in the in America, and as long as you have the American culture, it they will kind of accept you. You have to play the game, and that's fucking stupid, and I know that's not inclusive of cultures, and that's not good. But, like, people love success stories, right? If you're in some bumfuck town in West Virginia in the middle of a super conservative area, and you're at some bar, and you're like, yeah, I fucking fled Syria, and I came here, and I built up my business, I learned English, I did these things. People would be like, hoorah! You're the fucking best! Like, hell yeah! Right? We still love immigration here, but you do have to change to the U.S. ideologies, which is where it cannot be accepting. Um... But goddamn do we love success stories and goddamn do we love when someone is fresh off the boat and is working their ass off. That, that is America. That's fucking America right there, right? And there's definitely people trying to pull up the ladder. I'm not saying they don't exist, right? You can't universally get all people to think the same way. But even the people who are protesting and want the walls in a situation where you can explain your life story and you're working your ass off, they're gonna, they're gonna probably take you in. Um, difference between integration and assimilation. Yes. Yes, that's a big fucking difference. And I agree. That's a great way to put that. Uh, I'm gonna move this pizza so it's not in frame. It looks fucking gross. I'm gonna move this too because it tastes like shit. <sighs> All right. Um. Italian pizza or American pizza? Fucking American pizza, damn it! <laughs> um, now on topic, uh, but aren't you afraid of the heat of the candle might damage the screen? No, there's no heat there, right? There, there's, just, there's just no heat to the side of a candle. It's only gonna be above it. Um... What do you think of keeping your O'Day's secret from the government? What do you mean by that? Like, I'm confused. There's no reason you should share your O'Day with the government unless you're trying to sell them to the government. Unless you mean the government keeping O'Day's secret. Because that, that is actually an issue that people discuss. But, like, people keeping their O'Day's secret from the government, that, that just sounds like personal decision. Um, and probably a common one. New camera looks fantastic. Fuck yeah, it does. If you don't sell them to ZDI, you'll be fine. I mean... <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but every person buying O'Days and exploits is selling them to governments. <laughs> Or maybe organized crime. <laughs> Congrats. Except for like bug bounties by the vendors themselves. <laughs> if you are selling your bugs 
to anyone who offers even remotely competitive prices, they're going to governments. And when I say governments, it's plural, because they're going to every fucking government they can sell it to. When you see $10 million for like an iPhone full chain or whatever the fuck ridiculous price you see, that's not because you're selling a bug for $10 million to US or China or whatever. You're selling it to every country in the Middle East, every country that you can get your hands on, every country in the five eyes. And like, that's where it's going. That's where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're selling a bug for like more than whatever the company can offer you, which is typically like chump change, like 10 or 20 grand, there are some big companies that do have some large bounties, like Microsoft, I think, has like 250K for Hyper V, maybe 500K. It's a pretty big bounty. But, like, companies, the bounties that companies can offer are, like, pennies on the fucking dollar compared to the actual bug price. And if you're getting the actual bug price, it's going to someone who's going to use the bug. <laughs> sorry, sorry if you had, like, your happy safe place where, like, your bug was going to better the world. No. 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 250k noise? Holy shit, 250k for a Hyper-V bug? Yeah, that's a fucking joke. A Hyper-V bug is actually worth like millions of dollars. So 250k is a good price from a vendor, still a fucking joke. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, but on the topic of basically having Ode being shelved by governments? I'm pretty torn on it. Ultimately, governments don't get ODE by existing, right? So a government doesn't just get an ODE because they're just there, right? It's not like they just show up and you just, oh, whoops, I accidentally have a full chain ODE with, or full chain iOS bug with, 10 ode in it. No, you buy those bugs or you hire people to find those bugs. Somehow, money is spent and a process is done to get those bugs. So, what is a government gonna do? Why would a government spend money to secure your fucking product? Like, sure, in some altruistic government, yeah, great, they'll fucking spend the taxpayer money to make the taxpayers safer. Uh-huh, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, in that fucking crazy world, when we start a whole new government style, sure. So, what's the alternative? They're either gonna have Ode and use Ode, or they're not gonna have Ode. Like, what are you gonna, what, like, you're not gonna, just like, hey, could you go, like, we're trying to, we're trying to infiltrate into someone's phone. We want to, we want to pop all the phones in some, I don't know, some big government meeting coming up so we can spy on their meeting notes so we can fucking stick it to the man and know what they're planning to do. Yeah, so could you just, like, we're gonna hire, like, 50 experts, spin up an organization, Make like a hundred million dollar budget. Oh, you found a bug? Cool, let's tell Microsoft and delete it. No! <laughs> like, the government might secure and like offensively attack some of the things that they deploy and there's a non-zero amount of bugs that they might find to defensively report. But when you're talking about O-Day stockpiling, who the fuck's gonna do that? <laughs> like, it's either they have Ode because they're using them offensively, or they don't have Ode because they don't even bother looking. Like, uh, when looking for exploits in software, you're being paid to exploit. Do you get bonuses or something per exploit found? As in, Microsoft pays you to find an exploit in Windows, you find one bonus, yeah or nay. I don't get a bonus for finding bugs. No one that I know at Microsoft gets bonuses for finding bugs, but it does affect 
your bonus because it affects your quality as an employee. Um, it's not like you get three bugs so you get the max bonus. You can find zero bugs and get a max bonus as a security researcher by being a relevant cog in the wheel. Um, but no, there is not direct compensation for, for uh, bugs. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, it's something that's frustrating because in... I guess I actually haven't found too many bugs at Microsoft. I found a CPU bug, which is illegible for 250k from Microsoft uh, as a vulnerability and was illegible for 250k from Intel. Uh, but since I work at Microsoft, I'm not illegible for either. And I certainly didn't get a 250k bonus for finding that bug, right? And so you get predicaments like that where it's kind of fucking annoying. Um... And I certainly have people working on the team that I'm working on right now. Uh, if, if you've seen the IP bugs recently in Windows, those are easily 5 to $20 million bugs when exploited. Um, I can guarantee you they're not getting 5 to $20 million bonuses for finding those bugs. So that's just, yeah. Uh, I'm not really aware of any company that does that that is not involved in exploit sales. But companies that do exploit sales will often pay you a salary and then you get commission off of your exploit sales. But that's because the company is directly making money off of those. Were the IP bugs found via fuzzing? Some were and some weren't. It's probably 50-50, maybe a little bit less. Uh, maybe a little, or sorry, maybe a little bit fewer were found with fuzzing. But I think fuzzing at least got a lot of the progress going, and I know a couple of the bugs were found with fuzzing. They are found with my tool. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything, uh, because my tool is a harness, and my tool doesn't do shit unless someone picks a target, writes a fuzzer, designs it, optimizes it, reads its code, tweaks it, and all those things. But I'm still proud of that. Um, working for a company selling ODAs feels like working for the mafia? Depends, depends on your fucking alliances and depends on your morals. Um, we've had this conversation before. I don't really give a shit. <laughs> Fucking pick your battles, right? Pretty much every way of making money is immoral. Sorry. Like, you're probably working for a company that employs people in other countries. You're probably working for a company that's benefiting off of slave labor. You're probably eating food from slave labor. You're probably, like, literally fucking poisoning the world by whatever you're doing. You're producing chemicals in an unsafe way that's going to end up killing people. Like... I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I really need to high road someone. <laughs> yeah, we all fucking suck. <laughs> like I would say this is, this is here here's my here's my last hot take. Here here's my last hot take of the night. <laughs> Environmental tip, not actually a tip. The most environmentally friendly thing you can do is not fucking hate yourself. If that means you buy a, a, a big-ass Hummer and that makes you feel happier and that makes you happier with your life, then that's more valuable because you still exist. You existing is the biggest burden you can have on the environment. So the biggest fucking waste you can possibly have is by throwing your life away and hating it. Uh, that's kind of my view. Um, obviously you can cause a lot more damage than one person worth of damage. I'm not arguing with that, but on average, on average, on average, you're a fucking waste if you're not enjoying getting something out of your life. That doesn't mean you're a waste if you aren't enjoying your life. That means you need to find a way to enjoy your life. I know that sounds awful. Um, and I hope that doesn't get taken out of context, but if you haven't found a way to enjoy your life, you haven't found a support group, friends, something, please seek that shit out. It's really important. Really important. And if you think people don't care about you, they probably do. Like, it's really important. 
One of the biggest things in feeling bad is convincing yourself that no one cares about you even when they do. So please, don't take that as a shitty thing. Don't take that as some fucked up perspective. It's more of a get out there and enjoy your life and don't feel so weighed down because you drove your car to work today and you didn't bike. Don't let that shit weigh you down and make you feel like an invaluable person and lesser of a person. Um, do the things that make you happy. If riding a bike makes you feel like you are being better to the environment and that makes you happier because it makes you feel like a better person, then that's what you should do. But please don't fucking let people tell you how to live your life and how to be happy, even though I'm telling you how to be happy right now. Um, so listen to me. Um, but don't fucking put a weight on your shoulders when you can't afford financially, socially, mentally to do those things. When people are doing amazing things, helping out homeless people, donating money, caring for others, don't feel bad if you're not doing those things if you haven't fucking figured yourself out first. Please. All right. Um... <laughs> All right. <laughs> Guilt is a bad thing for a human psyche. Yeah, it really is. Because I think a lot of people end up convincing themselves that they could be this amazing person and then end up hating themselves when they're not that amazing person, when ultimately no one is that amazing person. So, and that's why I can't really get super upset when someone wants to fucking work for a company that sells out aid to the government, because ultimately, as long as you like are getting fulfillment out of it, and hopefully you're being cautious about what's actually happening with those things, and you're informing yourself of those things, um, like it's probably better than you being a hateful person who hates everything and can't get along with yourself. So, <laughs> damn, that was a nice speech. Needed that somehow. Yeah, I mean, the way I phrased it at the start was like, holy shit, that sounded really bad uh, out of context. I had to make sure you understand the perspective there is more that personal happiness is unobtainable if you try to live your life in the way that everyone basically projects the way that they live theirs because they don't live their lives that way. Um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the big takeaway here. Like, people will often project their insecurities and make you feel like you're not a good person because they're doing all these things. They're donating, they're helping people, they're feeding people, they're taking people in, they have kids, they have friends, they have a girlfriend who's happy with them, all of these fucking things that they're doing. And every time you don't do one of those things, they can be critical and like, oh, why aren't you doing this thing? I'm doing this thing, I'm doing all these things. They're probably fucking not. They're probably fucking not. Um, and if they are doing some of those things, there's probably massive flaws. Yeah, maybe they have kids, but maybe they go home and beat them. Like, don't let people fucking project onto you. Don't fall into the bullshit narrative of how people actually are living through life because most people out there have a physical ailment or a mental ailment, are depressed, are having a bad time at work, are financially under pressure. Pretty much everyone has a fuck circumstance. So don't buy the bullshit. Uh, be, happy with, uh, be happy with your flaws and be confident with your flaws and understand that flaws are something that you should work with. And you should try and fix them if you can. Um, but you should understand your flaws. And that's important. <laughs> Tutorial on how to be happy. I mean, I don't take any of this advice. I'm just projecting it onto you. You guys figure this shit out. I'm not going to do any of this. I'm going to sit at this fucking computer 16 hours a day and wonder why the fuck I feel so socially unfulfilled. Um... So yeah, you guys can do this shit. Once again, I'm doing the same shit I'm preaching against. So fuck you, me. Yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, I, I am basically projecting my own faults and the things that I'm critical of myself of that I wish I wasn't. Um, because sometimes hearing it from someone else makes you change your ways. Um... <laughs> Till you are, you, you can't give what you don't have. Be happy before you uh, think about others' happiness. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I think, I think there's, a, there's a reason why so many of the, like, I, they're normally celebrities, and the reason they're celebrities is because celebrities is who we know as people, right? Like, it is the shared people that we know. Um, there's a reason why often the most depressed celebrities are the ones that are known for being so happy and outgoing and friendly and nice. Um, yeah, I think they're trying to, uh, they're trying to find happiness in making other people happy. And sometimes that's not a solution. So yeah, just be careful there. We know the public image, but not the people themselves. Of course, of course. Once again, everyone's shit at the end of the day, to some extent. Um, but speaking not of celebrities, but of personal friends, same fucking shit applies. Seriously. It's always kind of the most depressed ones that often are the most outgoing and friendly and nice. Um, yeah. So just, you know, be careful with that. I can't take advice from a tiling window manager user on how to be happy. Everyone looks great on social media. Oh, fucking absolutely, dude. New stream title, getting life rant injection on my viewers. Yeah. They want others to feel good because they know how a bad mental and financial state can make someone. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty true. There's, there's, that, one, there's that one thing that's basically like... Um, Basically, you, you keep yourself permanently depressed because it's easier to guarantee being depressed. And if you can maintain one flat line, then you don't have like a downturn. Um, I forget the, the fucking condition or, or thing or philosophy or whatever this fucking thing is. Um, but yeah, it, there's like, that shit's fucking crazy, dude. Um... I, I think that, like, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a hedge because you, you know, happiness is fleeting, so you never try to, uh, keep it. Happy Valentine's Day, hell yeah, dude. I actually can't wait to get the actual content, uh, content and stop distracting him. Too bad the viewers keep coming in as we talk about serious, serious issues in the world. But yeah, mental mental health is a is a big deal. So take care of yourselves, guys. Um, self destructive behavior. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I don't know. I think um, I actually think work from home is really bad for for mental illness. I mean, don't we know that? Don't we have like very very conclusive studies in multiple countries with multiple end values of multiple demographics where like depression is like fucking skyrocketed uh with uh coronavirus and while i i i don't think everyone should have problems working from home keep in mind that there's a lot of people like probably 30 to 50 percent of people that get their social interactions and self-worth from work. So like, yeah, if you have a, a wife and kids or a girlfriend or roommates or whatever, and you get your social interactions and happiness from home or extracurriculars, that's fucking great. But a lot of people have nothing without work. And I think that's why like, there's such a push for people to work rather than people, you know, like, I think there is a serious mental health argument against, um, uh, what is the, everyone gets an income, universal basic income, right? Um, personally, I have left my house probably 10 times since last March. Like, 
I've gotten groceries maybe like six or seven times. I've ordered a lot of food. I've ordered some groceries. I've ordered frozen foods. I have had like a couple friends over. That's about it. It sucks, dude. <laughs> it sucks. It is definitely wearing on me. Um, like, a lot of people like working from home because they do their social things outside of work. But for me, socializing has always been coworkers and then basically branching out to coworkers' friends. So, like, you hang out. At work, you get to know the people you like, the coworkers you like, you hang out with them, they become friends, you grab drinks with them after work, you do that a couple times, eventually they're like, hey, I I'm going to bring my girlfriend out, or my friend, you know, wants to come by, or whatever, and they bring them out, and you slowly snowball this, and that is the source of, like, most of my friendships, um, and that's, I don't think that is uncommon, especially for people who work from home, because I think a lot of people, I was thinking about this a lot last night, of like, I will basically never do anything unless I have to. Um, so like, looking back at like cross country in high school, I didn't want to fucking do cross country. I hated going every day. Pretty much all the best memories I have from high school were doing cross country, right? It's the initial momentum to get into something that is so hard. And when you work from home and you basically can do whatever the fuck you want 24-7, it's really hard to force yourself into uncomfortable situations. And uncomfortable situations, pretty much the only way you grow. You don't really grow if you're never uncomfortable. You just do. Um... What's cross country? Yeah, long distance running. Typically, uh, typically refers to like uh, three mile runs, uh, five kilometer runs in the US. Actually, five, 3.125 miles. Five kilometers uh, in high school and 10 kilometers in uh, college for the like competition. Um, but you'll often do, you know, 15, 20 miles, even in high school as practice. Um, but yeah. That's crazy. I haven't stopped working uh, or going out. Yeah, I mean, most of my friends take it pretty seriously. So a lot of my friends, I don't even want to ask if they want to hang out, even if it's a small thing. Even though a lot of them would probably be okay with it. I know that a lot of people are being very careful. And thus, I don't want to burden someone with having to say no. Uh, especially like, no, I'm uncomfortable with that. Because that feels bad. It feels like... You're, there's a little bit of peer pressure to say yes there. And I, I don't like putting people in that position. Kilometers, what is this? A socialist EU unit? Oh, yeah. You should try rock climbing? You think I don't fucking rock climb? Are you high, dude? Jesus. Come on. I'm, I'm a white dude in tech with a good strength to weight ratio. Of course I fucking rock climb. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've actually been rock climbing for a long time. I've been rock climbing for longer than I think most people have gotten into it. I've been rock climbing since I was 16. So I've been rock climbing for about 12 years now. Um, I was rock climbing every day for two years in high school. And I drove like 15 minutes to get to the to rock climbing gym. Um, it's always something I've, I've loved. But... It's also not the most social uh, endeavor. <laughs> I think that's why a lot of nerds do it. That rocks, dude. Ah, oh, sick pun, dude. Sick. Sick pun. Um, I hate working from home. I get almost nothing done. Yeah, I get, to be honest, I get most of my work done at home, but I get most of my theory crafting and socialization done at work. So for the past like couple jobs I've had, and the companies know this, I go into work to socialize, and I go home to work. The socializing aspect is important for making connections, having ideas, inspiring people, being inspired, getting motivation, having fun. That is an important part of work. Uh, for people who go into work and just put their head down and like, work is for work. Um... I doubt they're working at maximum efficiency because I, I find it hard to believe that you can just put your head down and only work and actually be productive. Uh, you might be working more hours, 
but you're, I would say you're probably not as productive or not as satisfied or as happy, which leads to you probably being less productive. Um, if you don't rock climb, you're not an engineer. Yeah. Um, reminds me of doing 200 meters Sunday uh, morning, one hour trip, one hour uh, warm up for to run 50 seconds. Wake up was killing, but social interaction and competition was amazing. Yeah. Um, I would just like, I would go on runs with some of my friends and we would just forget we're running. You would, we would like literally come back to practice and we would be late or practice would be over. And like, we were supposed to run six, seven, eight miles and we ran like 16 fucking miles. We just had a good conversation going and we just talked and talked and talked, um, especially in high school with people having breakups and relationships and friendships and like, God damn, that was fantastic. Um, work for me was a great socializer, yeah. Um, I actually think working from home is going to be really bad for young, new people uh, because it will be harder for them to find inspiration. And I think it's a lot easier. Like, all right. All right, chat. I'm going to try and prove a point here. What is the shortest meeting that you have scheduled this year? If you have, like, basically set up a meeting, hey, we should talk about this. Hey, can I ask you about this? What is the shortest online meeting that you have scheduled? 30 minutes, yeah, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, that's about what I would say. I would say 15, 30 minutes, something in, in that range. 10 minutes, okay, maybe like an hour, five minutes, 45, 15, 45. So a lot of, I would say probably 20 minutes is probably the, the median here and probably the mean, right? So... Imagine you're a young first year, just got into the industry, and you want to ask someone a dumb question. You want to be like, wait, how do I, how do I uh, set up a Git branch, right? You're not going to set up a meeting to do that. If you're in a physical office, you can ask someone that question. You can literally just go and ask someone that question. You'll use 20 seconds of your time, their time. Like, they won't even context switch out of their work. Good fucking luck doing that online. Seriously. Like, just Google it. So, here's an important thing to understand. Um, for, for the crowd... I, I do recognize, for that specific circumstance, Google is applicable kind of in all situations. Um, but it could be like, how does our build system work? How do I do, maybe it's not how do I do a Git branch, it's how do I do an internal customized version of our repo branch. L right, the equivalent level of basically necessary internal knowledge. Whatever. But, even on the topic of a Googleable question, this is where, when, when you are the kind of person who just says, just Google it, whatever, that sort of thing. People often ask those questions because they're looking for the socialization or they're looking for a tailored answer. Because when you Google something, you often get the most generic answer, and sometimes it's not the most applicable. Sometimes it's going to be an answer for a credential system that you're not using, and it doesn't work, and then you're going to spend 20 minutes figuring that out. So, two things. One, sometimes it's literally just to socially ask it. Like, you know that you could figure out this thing on your own by Googling it, but you ask anyways just because you want a fucking conversation. And I recognize that that can be annoying to people. But it's also something to understand on the other side of the fence. Because they might find it annoying that they have to Google something for 20 minutes and deal with fucked shitty results on Stack Overflow. When you could have given them an answer in much less time. Um, and on the second note, a lot of times there's just a more specialized or better answer. 
And sometimes it's easier to take advice from someone you respect compared to just a random thing on Google. So maybe you don't know what to Google, for sure. Google skills is a thing. Um, but yeah, like, those things are just difficult for, um, I think, in a work, work from home environment. Um, look, I'm not going to project because I work my ass off working from home. But I think seniors tend to, like seniors and above, tend to go a little bit more technical and a little bit more isolated when they work from home. They tend to work a little bit more on their own projects. They tend to lead a little worse. They tend to delegate a little bit less. They tend to rely a little bit more on like, oh, just go check the fucking, go check the board. Don't ask me, just go check the board. Go check the work items, you know, that sort of shit. Um, because it's great. <laughs> Being a senior engineer who can work whenever the fuck they want and have a lot more flexibility, like working from home, I definitely have more flexibility of what I can work on and the hours I can work. I work basically graveyard shift. That doesn't fucking help people who want to learn from me or ask me questions. Um, I just, I'm concerned for junior people. That being said, I learned most of my stuff on my own time. I always have. That's kind of a weakness in the way that I learn. Maybe not a weakness, maybe it is a strength because that might be why I have the skills I have now. But... I also recognize that most people don't learn that way. Most people need a leader figure who they look up to to give them concrete answers that aren't super wishy-washy. Um, and a lot of times that requires uh, tailoring stuff. Can't be smart and social at the same time. Being social takes time. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Obviously, they need to tune into your stream. I... I feel like I do decently at teaching people. I have a tendency, I wouldn't be surprised if people who have worked with me in the past are listening to this, I have a tendency to write people off pretty quickly if I don't find them interested. And often if I don't find them interested, that's like I don't see them getting momentum or I see them asking the same question over and over um, or I see them projecting more excitement than they have. Um, and I know there's like a couple people in my, maybe like three people or four people that I can think of who I've worked with in the past who have cold shouldered and I feel so fucking bad about that. Um, but I also don't think I won't do it again, but I recognize that I will probably do it again, if that makes sense. Like I recognize it as a personality flaw, so I know to hand basically handle that handoff, but I, I basically feed off of other people's excitement, um, and when people talk about being excited, but don't seem to actually be excited through not working on it, or not really taking things to heart, um, I often give up. It's kind of shitty. I do the same. It's not a flaw. I mean, it is a flaw if you want to be a leader. It is a flaw if you want to be like a manager because you need to be able to handle a wide variety of ways that people express their excitement and their energy and passions of work. Uh, ultimately, my standards are outrageously high for what I consider someone who's interested, uh, and it's not reasonable to expect that out of someone who has a realistic work-life balance. So... Do you want to push PowerPoints and KPIs? I don't know. I think it's a flaw because it means I let people down who would otherwise benefit from me. That's the flaw, right? It means that there are people who are not getting as ahead in life as they could if I interacted with them in a better way. Um, we use mostly DuckDuckGo. It's still the same. Oh, yeah. I use DuckDuckGo. It's fucking fantastic. Um, I do throw up in my mouth every time I hear uh, KPIs mentioned at work. 
I don't, I don't think I've ever done a KPI or even can tell you what it stands for. <clears throat> if you lose 2x time, uh, if you lose 2x more time, but at the same time you can help someone more, is that a lose then? No, I would say, like, I don't know exactly if that came through clearly, but I'm going to answer a couple questions. Basically, um, I don't think this is what you asked, but it is one of the ways I interpreted it. Um, basically, is it worth spending your time helping someone who's going to like do less than what you could have done with that time? And the answer is yes, if they're learning. And I think, while I like to be critical of myself for people I maybe have like not really been super helpful to, I think I have a really good gut feeling for how much people are engaged in learning. And I think... Once I recognize that they're maybe not learning or making progress, I seem to get, start to think more along the lines of I might just be better off doing the work, right? Like, I'm a very effective engineer when it comes to software and security, and that leads to a lot of situations where I can likely do a month or two of a junior person's work in a day or two. So it comes down to this really tough situation when do I want to spend a week teaching someone how to do something that'll take them two months when I could have just done it in two days? Um, and if they're learning, the answer is often yes. But sometimes that can get really muddy if you are blocking on the very thing that you're asking them to do, right? So if you can't do any, if you can't do your work or finish up your thing, or maybe your work is not as complete or thorough until their work is done, personally, once again, probably a flaw, personally, that becomes very difficult for me to want to go through that route. Really hard. All right. Um, if I start uh, getting feel that it, feeling that it's easier for me to do than teach him, then it's usually not the job for them. Yeah, but it could eventually become the job for them, or the specialty, or the, or it could become the job that they fucking fail at and they hate it, and they don't do that again. Because a lot of becoming who you are as an engineer, a researcher, a developer, whatever is figuring out what you don't like so you can accurately portray your skills and interests on future projects. Hi, it was a long time since I uh, get to see your stream live since I started a new job. Love all your content. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. But sometimes fail is good. I fail a fuck ton more than I succeed. That it, like, I, I fail so frequently but I'm also very critical. I also am critical of if my successes are actually successes in hindsight, or if they were luck, or if it was coincidentally the good thing to do, or if I randomly did something, but it was really specialized to the task at hand, but maybe isn't generally applicable to that sort of problem in the future. Um, Wolfgang Blitz and Fire! Thank you so much for the Subarinos, hell yeah. Yeah, but why should a calculus professor teach basic math? That's not, that's just not efficient. So, here's where that gets tough. You can just be a better teacher than the teacher who's teaching basic math, right? Sometimes the expert might just inspire the person more and be a more effective teacher. Um, yeah, it's tough, <laughs> right? It's fucking tough. Um, it's ironic that you say that uh, because the best calc teacher I ever had uh, through in basic pre-calc and algebra 
Oh, threw in basic pre-calc and algebra knowledge into his lectures. Yeah. It helped everyone know the basics and fundamentals to build upon the calc knowledge. So one of the things that, that I do a lot when I am working with others and like in a video game, in work, whatever, um, I assume that people have forgotten things. I assume that people have gaps in their knowledge and thus I explain the things that I often find people have gaps in their knowledge but are too uncomfortable to raise because they think they're expected to know them. Um, and that gets more and more an issue when you get into more senior engineers when people are like they expect of themselves to understand what all seniors know when there are gaps in everyone's knowledge. Um, and I try to do a decent job of reading the room because the difference between mansplaining and being a fucking great mentor is often reading the room. And that's picking up on hints of whether or not they need the filler, right? Like, if, if you end up going and explaining how pointers work, and the person clearly has enumerated that they understand how pointers work, then you're being an asshole. Um, but if you're brushing up on them, and they, like, ask a question, or they feed into it, or it's obvious that it's engaging them, then it, you should maybe go into more detail. Um, and it's really important... Uh, to understand th there's a, a fine line there and it's largely social skills and reading the room. Um, like, I, I get that in like wow rates. It's, I, I like using wow rates as an analogy because it's such a simple thing that a lot of people have had experience with. But like a lot of times when someone ha isn't doing something, it's not because they don't know or they've never done it or they don't like know what they're doing, it's because they forgot, or they're preoccupied, or there's some other explanation. And sometimes people just need a reminder that isn't an insult, right? Sometimes people need like, hey, um, like a good way to do this is often to speak to the room and not a person. And that is like, maybe before you do a poll, you can be like, hey, uh, just a reminder to everyone, we're going to be doing uh, this rotation. And what we're going to do is we're going to move from this side of the room to this side of the room and back and forth. And these people are going to move to these positions. Even though you know that 9 out of 10 people know what to do, you know that there's one person who doesn't. And they are so fucking happy that you said it. Like, they wouldn't have asked and they would have fucked it up if they didn't know because they wouldn't have asked because they're too embarrassed to ask and they would have been traumatized if they fucked it up and they would have probably become worse off because of it. Um, I've done that. I have called meetings where I've gotten whole groups of people together to explain something that I know only one person needs to hear. <clears throat> you gotta be careful. It's hard online to read the room Honestly, a lot of reading the room online or even in real life is using hedge words. And hedge words are effectively escape keywords that people can use. Phrasing things in a way that you give people an opportunity to recognize the politeness in your tone, but also politely decline the explanation and move the conversation forwards. And that can be done through pauses, through the way you word things, through the, like, it's complex. It's really complex. Um, yeah. Audio is slightly clipping. Yeah, okay. Um... Can you give an example of it? I mean, <laughs> like, arguably, the stream is that. The way that I communicate with chat is that. Like, I am giving multiple opportunities for where I want or am interested in the conversation heading 
by bringing up different points and emphasizing certain things and allowing other things to get brought up in chat that drive the conversation in other ways. I mean, a lot of it is listening. I recognize I don't <laughs> read chat a lot. Uh, I, I realize I'm not great at that, except for when we do things like this where I'm talking at the camera. Um, but I would say I'm a very good listener. Uh, a lot of that comes more from a more feminine personality. I've always been a more feminine person. Um, I think a lot of that is kind of being raised on Lifetime by a single mom, right? Lifetime is a basically like female-oriented soap channel effectively in the U.S., right? Um, and I have found myself to be a pretty good listener. Uh, obviously, it's hard to demonstrate that when I'm literally running fucking stream because uh, you ch chat doesn't get a chance. Um, but... I don't know. I've always enjoyed listening and hearing other people's perspectives, and I don't mean that in, like, a woke way. Um, I mean it more in, like, a selfish, morbid curiosity way. Um, I don't like to think of it as woke as, like, oh, I'm great. I'm listening to everyone's, you know, words and how they do things. I am just genuinely fascinated with how people approach problems and the way they think and tick and their flaws, and their strengths, um, like, there's a gossip level curiosity, and figuring out, like, the things that they're absolutely fucking dumb at, so I can, like, mock them in my head, I'm not saying that's a great thing, and I'm not saying I do that, but we all do it, we all do it, right, so there is some level of morbid curiosity into figuring out how the fuck someone ticks. And you don't get that unless they explain things to you. And you get to hear when someone, you know, in the room is loud mouthing and t telling dumb shit and you're listening. Well, you get to figure out that this dude's a complete piece of shit asshole and they have no idea what they're talking about. And that to me is funny, interesting, stimulating. But it also has the mechanic of meaning I listen a lot to what people do. So, I don't know. Social engineering is fun. Yeah. It's a complicated way of saying laughing at people. I mean, it's not really that. Um, I'm trying to emphasize that I'm not trying to say this to be a woke thing. It's just I am a curious person. I'm introverted. I will sit quietly and try to understand what's going on in a room. Like that, that's typically my view, which means I listen a lot, which means I typically know people's skill levels, right? The difference between helping someone with a refresher and mansplaining is often understanding their background, right? Understanding the things that they likely know and when you explain, like, I get, <laughs> I don't want to say mansplained, I don't want to diminish it, but there's shit that people say in chat that drives me fucking ape shit because it's so fucking obvious that I know the answer, right? It's either something I've explained or it's just so implied by whatever I'm doing that I clearly fucking understand what they're saying. And it comes off as insulting. So there's a, there's a balance there. It's frustrating. You talk quite much for being an introvert? That's because I'm running my own fucking stream. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, biggest soft skill question uh, for this decade, though. How to pitch Rust to your company? Do you want the, do you want the soft skill? Solution or the hard skill solution? Because I use the hard skill solution for that. Do you, do you want the Do you want the hard skill solution? Because I can I can tell you how I got the entire Microsoft security team to write uh, Rust. <clears throat> write the best fuzzing tool they've seen and write it in Rust and don't provide FFI bindings. Woo! Dunzo! <laughs> You're going to want to use this tool, <laughs> but you got to write Rust. <laughs> Woo, gotcha. No, I was pretty tasteful about it, but I did actually have intentions of doing that, and it was very successful. Um, and I think that was one of my biggest con contributions to Microsoft. Like, genuinely, not necessarily the security researchers getting Rust, like, 
using Rust, but the security researchers using Rust and understanding Rust such that they can communicate it as a security solution. Because unless you write the language and you know the flaws, you know the size constraints, you know the performance constraints, you know the build complexities, the build, the ecosystem, the library, the crates, those sorts of things, it's really hard to tell developers, hey, you should write your shit in Rust. So, soft skills? Well, another big thing that I did is I allowed people time to learn a language. It is totally fine if you came, like, I built a team and ran a team for about six months poorly. Um, and then if someone came to a meeting and they said, like, oh, today I read through a couple chapters of the Rust book and tried a couple things out, boom, valid, completely fucking valid. Even if you have a tasking out the ass, I'm fine with that. I'm not critiquing you for that. I'm not getting mad at you for that. Totally fine with that. So being, uh, being accepting of learning and uh, the, the processes and the speeds and all of those things that go along with that are really important. Um, I think you'll find that uh, most hard asses who run a fucking tight ship don't have very productive teams. Um, it's just maybe for like things that are not necessarily mental labor, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but yeah, sure, just making, forcing people to do the fucking work, I'm sure is more productive if it's just repeating a task. But when it comes to research and development and things that are mental and not keyboard entry bottlenecks and not compile bottlenecks, but actually design, implementation, review, communication, I don't give a fuck how much time you're spending learning something new because that's likely more valuable than just doing it poorly the first time. Um, it's a creative process in the end. Yeah. It's, it's tough because, like, it's just so funny when I, when I hear, like, managers complaining about how their subordinates don't do their fucking work. And I told them to do this. And I told them that they're not getting a bonus if they don't do it this way. And then they didn't do it that way. Yeah, no shit, because they don't give a fuck about you or your work. <laughs> you got to build a fucking relationship if you want to expect something out of someone that's above and beyond. Um... Good that you think about different industries. Hiring people uh, to do a very easy task, the job is generally to get them to actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but research is a mental game. It's a mental and planning game. You can easily spend one week planning something and two days executing something or one year executing something and retrying every time it fails. Um... I want Gamos as my manager. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Unless you're like a principal level researcher at a fang company, I'm going to question like what the fuck you even know because I have terrible expectations of people. It's not that I'm an asshole. It's that personally, I don't like to think of myself as special even though I am, and that leads to me thinking, like, shit I did when I was a kid is something that I would expect out of a junior engineer at a company getting paid 200 grand a year, when ultimately, I've been told, that's not reasonable to expect. <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm in a situation where I don't interview people well, and I have very high standards of people, because... Shit I was doing when I was 15 years old, I'm getting told is unreasonable to expect people to be able to do after four years in industry and four years of college, right? And that is a tough predicament. A lot of that came down to pay when, like, I've told this story on stream at, at one of my first jobs, when effectively... We, like, I was part of the interview process for someone we were hiring for, like, a senior principal role who is basically going to get paid double what I got. 
And at the end of the interview, I was like, he didn't understand, like, half of these fucking things. And everyone looked at me like, we would not fucking expect a senior level four engineer to know this. Why the fuck would we expect that? And then I'm sitting there at a level one getting paid half of what that dude's going to make. And I'm like, well, so yeah, I'm a little jaded, unfortunately. And I recognize that I am jaded, but it doesn't change the fact that I am. Unfortunately, hiring people for double your pay at a much higher seniority when you expect them to understand the basics of what you know when you're 19 years old, woof, does not put you in a good position to judge people. Um, that being said, at that time, I probably didn't understand their managerial skills or their soft skills or how well they can lead a team or run a, run a fucking issue tracker, right? Um, so it's important to understand that I probably devalued those aspects as well, right? So what was it you were expecting him to know? I have no idea. It was fucking 10 years ago. Uh, but like, basically, I'm going to expect a security researcher to basically find all CTF style problems in like a one hour interview, not solve them, but f spot the bug, right? If you play spot the bug and you have a hundred lines of code and you have like 10 bugs, some use after freeze, race conditions, buffer overflows, I'd expect them to find pretty much every bug. Um, that's how I've gone through interviews where I found every bug every time they've had something like that. And apparently that is not the norm. Um, so my standards are very high. Um, I also expect hackers to be decent programmers, and they're pretty much never programmers. Uh, let alone decent programmers, but pretty much never even passable programmers. So... Um... I don't know. Like, it's... It's... It's mainly an issue with me being incapable of internalizing that I am likely special, <laughs> right? Um, that's kind of the problem. So, I also expect hackers to be programmers. I don't expect them to be like productive programmers. I expect them to be programmers. I expect them to be able to basically implement any idea they have, right? I expect them to be fluent enough in any language, probably a couple languages, that they can express any idea they have. Maybe not efficiently, maybe not an n log n, if it's an n log n problem, maybe an n squared or n cubed, but I expect them to be able to express it. Um, I don't know. Are we special? Oh, of course Chad is special. That's why we have a candle. That's why we have this romantic... Valentine's Day stream. Crypto's half scripting, half Linux kernel. Where is the where is printer? It's hiding. I don't expect them to be productive either, but holy crap, people complain about C. Yeah, I mean, I, I do kind of get frustrated when hackers don't know C. <laughs> I kind of expect... So here, here, here's a, here's a realistic, here's a realistic thing that I would expect from someone, even at a relatively junior level, that I think would be considered extraordinarily unreasonable by peers and managers and other people and maybe people in chat, but maybe not because you're elitist fucks here. I would expect that not knowing a language doesn't really stop you from being able to read that language. And I would expect that not knowing a language isn't more than like a two-week hindrance to being able to contribute and write that language. I don't think learning a programming language is hard. I, I, like Rust is the hardest programming language I've ever learned 
and I ported my entire operating system to Rust in the first week I wrote Rust. It was pretty fucking intuitive. I didn't expect someone to be able to do that, but I expect them to be able to, like, infer and pseudocode read a language, and then by proxy, contextually look at examples and other code to write it. And I don't mean Stack Overflow copy-paste. I mean, like, look at code and see, oh, that is how for loops are constructed. Oh, this is a recursive programming language. Oh, things are not mutable by default, or they are mutable by default, or const has this meaning or not, and be able to imply that by the context of code that you're already reading. Um, but that is an outrageous expectation. So if anyone here in chat is like, I agree with you, that's awesome, I'm, I'm all for that. That is not even remotely reasonable. A security researcher getting a fucking six-figure job at a top company in the US, if you know the scraps of Python, you're set. You're fucking set. People are happy. You're doing well. You're doing fine. As long as you can kind of pseudocode read some C to find like a buffer overflow, you're good. You're good. And that's the thing that's always so weird to me when I, like, look at a resume and it talks about, like, all the languages and, like, okay. Here's where, like, resumes are, are really strange to me. There's, there's a tiering system. There's people who say that they are skilled in languages. And if you use one line, one fucking tiny one-point font that describes the languages you know, sure. There's some value to communicating that. Great. If it's more than a line, it's scary. To me, as someone who reads resumes, when you have like a paragraph describing the languages you know how to write, <laughs> that means that you value the fact that you can write that language as a major bullet of your resume, which to me is, is a red flag, obviously varies by role and seniority and those sorts of things. But even a, a junior position, a little bit of a red flag. Um, the next thing is libraries in those languages. Like when I see a resume that's like familiar with Boost. Dude, it's a documented library that's designed to be used by anyone. God, I hope that's not a skill. What do you, like, what, it, what is the skill that you've, like, used it? Like, sure, maybe you can do a couple things without referencing it. But I highly doubt you can just, like, boost manual dump. So more specifically, it means, like, you probably know, like, the three primitive boost data structures. And then other than that, you know where to find boost documentation and how to read it. God, I hope that's not a fucking differentiating skill. And then it, even further, once again, we are talking about programmers going for skilled labor jobs that expect a level of experience or education. So the next thing that I'm going to say, I hope doesn't come off as insulting, but when people put tools they're familiar with, it's a tool! <laughs> like, like when people in their, in their resume are like, I'm familiar with the Linaro toolchain. You mean you're familiar with how to use a compiler? Of course! What? What do you mean? You know where, like, you know where to find it and how to extract it to disk? And, like, maybe how to, like, set up a SIGWIN terminal to it? Or, like, how to install Linux in a VM? What? <laughs> like <laughs> familiar with git like for junior people i please please let me explain if you are a junior person and you put these things on your resume 
I am not going to think negatively of them. Because it's not necessarily that I'm going to think that you think these are your bold skills. It's that I think you went to monster.com's how to write a resume guide and you used that as a template and it's like, put down the tools and the languages you're familiar with and make sure you have at least 12 some arbitrary amount. So you start padding it out. It's like, oh, I've used GCC, I've used Visual Studio, I've used Linux, I've used Windows, I've used Mac. Fuck, I need 12? Okay, that's five. Um, I've, ah, uh, shit. Um, I've used, uh, uh, Hyper-V, uh, right? So when you're a junior engineer, I expect that these things on your resume because you don't know better, right? You, like, you don't know the socialization aspect of the interview process. Um, and also, they might be your only skills. And that's fine, because out of college, sorry, sorry, out of college, I don't expect you to really have any skills. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, but to me, I read that as zero experience. I read that as, like, you maybe spent six months learning your professor's favorite language, and then the next year, you spent six months learning that professor's favorite language to do data structures, and then the next year, you spent six months learning the language that your, like, OS developers like to use. It's probably C. Not all curriculum are the same. Not all teachers are the same. Not all experiences are the same. But for the most part, the, the, the best experience that you often have out of college is that you found you found something that you're willing to invest time in, and, and that is often the skill. Um, all right, let me, uh, let me catch up on chat. <laughs> I know, CD, LS, PWD, Makner, yeah. I know these things come off as harsh, and these are harsh because I have high standards, uh, but also recognize I'm pretty good at understanding your communication style. I'm, I'm good at understanding if you're nervous in an interview, if you're feeling uncomfortable. It, like, I factor all of these things in, and I would hope any good interviewer factors all of these things in to the performance of your interview and weights things based on those social cues. Um, uh, I work in IT. What you are describing is what they actually want to see on my CV. To be honest, to be honest, recruiters and like the, the, the companies that will just like take in your resume and like HR will make the hiring decision and not an engineer, these things are great to have on your resume. But if you're actually having a technical interview with technical people who write code, not as much. Um, yeah, but have you seen all the requirements they have on job postings? All the things that... Uh, are stupid to put on CVs and whatever. Um, so, yes. Job requirements are a joke, and they mean nothing. Job requirements, basically job requirements for most listings are going to be posted as the required and the nice-to-haves. Take the required section and move it into the nice-to-haves, and that's actually what they're doing. Um, it's bullshit. <laughs> the requirements are bullshit. Now, once again, if HR is doing the hiring, yep, yeah, they're just gonna hire you. Like, if you don't have a degree, good, you're not gonna get a job. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't fucking give a shit what your education is, what languages you know. I'm gonna ask. I will figure those out during an interview. Um, it's important to note most interviewers have not read your resume. Like, they just haven't. They, they haven't even fucking looked at it. They haven't. They're, they're going there to ask the same questions they ask everyone else because it's the same way they've been interviewing for 10 years and they're just going to ask you the questions that they normally ask and they don't give a fuck 
about who you are or what you've done or what you know or what you could provide. They're just going to ask you the same template questions because that's what corporate has said is acceptable and that's what they're doing. Um, yeah, the HR person doesn't know that. Google the keywords, yeah. Like, HR is basically going to copy and paste the requirements from other HR departments. It's just a mess. Tools can be noted down in resumes for recruiters to match up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Okay, Gamos is a scary manager. Shouldn't be HR. <laughs> yeah, I, my interviews are um, more personal, right? Um... I don't know, like, when I interview someone, um, I basically want to figure out what they've done. I don't give a fuck. Like, I just want to figure out what they've done. Um, and if you've read a lot of resumes, I'm sure a lot of people here have read a lot of resumes. Um, a lot of people talk about the things that they worked on as the things that they did. Um, I want your resume to talk about the things that you did. I worked on the build system backend for a large scale, uh, you know, corporate databasing system. I don't want to see I built a corporate databasing system and then I ask you a question about databases and you don't fucking even remotely know what a database is, right? You just look like a fucking idiot. I would say this is a majority of resumes. They talk about the things, that they talk about the net result of their team as what they did. Elaborate on what you did. I know it's lesser, but it's actually something that I can build a conversation out of and communicate. Um... I'm sure some companies are going to just be impressed and hire you and you're going to get jobs. Like, like if you follow my advice, you are going to probably get fewer job offers. But the job offers that you're going to get are going to be much more fitting and better jobs. They're going to be more applicable to your skill set. Um... I have a skills page that is full of key terms for recruiters, uh, skill level. Yeah, I mean, I am not good at resumes. Well, my resume is designed... We've talked about this before, but um, not with resumes. But I... Um, I interview companies <laughs> more than... I expect them to interview me in an interview context. And that's because I can be picky, but I design my resume and I word my things in a way to immediately disqualify myself from a company that is doing checkboxes. So if a company will reject me based on not having checkboxes, and I know what those checkboxes is are at most companies, I make sure that I don't pass those checkboxes because I have zero interest in working there. I intentionally architect my shit in that way. Um... You work at Microsoft, they definitely use checkboxes to get you hired. Um, yes, but they didn't weight them very very strongly, right? I think I think that's the important part, right? Um the the, the important part is like my Microsoft interview was one of the loosey goosiest interviews I've ever had at a major company. It was very fluid, very dynamic. I felt like I could drive a lot of the conversation and I didn't feel like I was forcibly steered onto a specific track. Um, 
What are the check boxes? It's basically HR rejecting you if you don't have like bullshit keywords on your resume. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying, I'm trying to see, um, I'm trying to redact my resume right now, and then we can actually, I can actually show you what my resume looks like. Um... You're just making sure it's, it's... Adequately redacted. Um, okay. Um, okay. Hmm. I think. I think this is adequately redacted. Um, <sighs> doop to doop. Bink, bink, bink. Um, okay, I think this should be good. I'm doing a quick skim. Quick skim. Leaked. <laughs> Let's see Gamboza OPSEC. It's, it's pretty good. It's important to note that this is not what I would recommend for anyone else to do on a resume. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible resume, intentionally. Um, it's very wordy, which you should not do on a resume. But I do it because it is meant to push away people who want cookie-cutter resumes. All right. I think this is redacted enough. This looks good. All those things are good. All right, all right. So here is my resume. Um, and I update my resume basically every like three months. Uh, and I use it kind of as a place to just remember what I did, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's kind of a dumping grounds. So this is probably updated in December, maybe last month, um, kind of roughly. Okay, so um, basically I, I, I have my name and all of my like resources and also my resume is a text document. So what you get? No Word doc, no PDF, it's a text document. Um, this is what you get. When you ask for my resume, you just get a text document. You can open it in Notepad. It looks the fucking same. It's fantastic. Um, it's 80 column formatted, except for some URLs, which I am okay with going out of bounds. And it's fantastic, and it's pretty long. But I introduce myself. 
talk about what I do, talk about what I like doing. I even, in the resume, talk about how my resume isn't formal. That is about as informal as you can get. We break the third wall in our resume. It's very meta. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I guess I can read through this. We're, we're talking enough. Hello, my name is Brandon Falk, and many call me Falk. Uh, I've got a, and that is basically how I would like to be addressed, uh, like during an interview, just call me Falk. Um, I've got a passion for security, development, and optimization. I spend most of my time working on advanced fuzzers with a strong focus on performance and scaling. Often to get full control over the system and to leverage bleeding edge processor features, um, you'll, you'll find me working on fuzzers in a custom operating system environment. Exclamation point in a resume. Yup, not very formal, but immediately gone from companies that are looking for stupid formal bullshit. And that's exactly what I want. I want to be filtered out. Get me out of that shit corporate hellhole because I don't want to work there. Um, this is not the most formal resume. I do a lot of development in my personal time and much of my advanced research happens outside of work. It's very true. Vectorized emulation was not done at work. Um, I've done parts of it at work for work things, uh, but I developed it and theorized it and I've worked on it pretty much entirely outside of work. Uh, same with Falkervisor, my first fuzzing hypervisor, uh, did it outside of work. And basically this is my way of saying, what I've done at work is about half of what I've actually fucking done in my life. So don't judge me for the fact that I have 10 years of experience because I actually have probably 20. Um, let's see. Um, I have a few sections and basically this is the key. This is how you read my resume. This is how you learn how to read my resume because I, I give you a little tutorial. Uh, I have a few sections. Public works, which are projects I've worked on publicly, often on stream. So there's hundreds of hours of me making mistakes and learning things with an audience. Personal projects, which are projects I've worked on, uh, maybe even talked about, but ultimately are not open source. And for the classics, it's my dig on resumes, for the classics you can find the work section, which talks about the cool opportunities I've gotten to work on in my professional time. Once again, I'm emphasizing that there are things that I've gotten to work on, not things that I fucking did or invented or created, because I'm being humble here. Public works. Uh, and I put this in order of importance. Uh, so my actual work falls after it falls after my public works and after my personal projects because work is that little importance to me. Just kidding. Please, 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 Papa Satya, please don't fire me. No, but in reality, my personal projects are more impactful, I think, to my, the way that I approach problems and do security and the skills that I have than anything I've ever done at work. Um... Public works. I do a lot of development on Twitch. This year I've worked on a few neat projects. Okay, so this was uh, 2020. Um, chocolate milk, the repo, and the fucking playlist where you can see me talking to chat and swearing and being unprofessional, but you can see me actually fucking coding. Um, do I think anyone will ever look at this in my resume? Probably not. Um, but you can actually see me coding. You can see me coding for probably 50 times longer than the duration of my interview if you really want to see what my coding looks like. Now, in reality, that's probably a negative because in an interview, you regurgitate the thing that you studied for for the interview because you're given the same problems every time. So the way you actually code, in fact, I would hazard if any developer recorded them coding and watched it, they would think they're a fucking idiot. Now, fortunately, or unfortunately for me, a developer would probably watch me code and think I'm a fucking idiot because you're backseat driving. You don't know the constraints. You don't know what we're working with, the hardware, the software, the time constraints. You don't know if we're in the middle of a stream where we're on a tangent. We're explicitly trying to describe something that is intentionally meant to be not the best way of doing something, but an example. Um, so... Terrible thing to have on your resume. Once again, if someone can understand the nuance there, I'm more interested in working for them. So, 
Uh, Chocolate Milk is a bootloader operating system and hypervisor, all written from scratch in Rust, which is designed for co uh, coverage-based fuzzing. Uh, with this harness, we can fuzz nearly anything that runs on x86. With a focus on performance, we're able to perform about 1 million VM resets per second on a single core. Which is true, we did that. Um, even when fuzzing a closed source Windows uh, kernel target. Since scaling is important, uh, there's built-in threading and cross-server networking which, uh, with... Good. Typo. Fantastic. Grammar mistake. Once again, if you're not going to bring me in on an interview due to a grammar mistake on my resume, I don't want to work for you. Uh, which can keep multiple servers in sync for coverage, inputs, and crashes, uh, and various other stats. I've demonstrated this by scaling the scaling by pushing an 8 gigabyte Windows 10 VM to two different servers with 96 cores each. The VM image is downloaded on demand, and thus we're able to boot our OS launch 384 virtual machines, and have fuzz cases completing within 250 milliseconds of booting. Across 384 threads, 192 cores, we're able to get about 220 million fuzz cases per second, assuming an empty target. Basically, the, the ceiling. Right? And this is just meant to be like a fucking throwing it out there, I do performance. And the performance that I do is at different orders of magnitude than you've probably ever seen performance done. Like, you you probably don't even remotely know what any of these fucking numbers mean, and you probably think I'm actually lying here. But I'm not. We did this on stream. You can see it. There's a link to the repo and me dev developing it and testing it. These are the real performance stats. We launched 384 VMs and booted an operating system in 250 milliseconds. <laughs> Perf! That's why we have perf emotes. Um, let's see. You know, I really do like this guy so far, uh, but what he's demonstrating is the privilege of raw talent. Of course! Yeah! I'm not, like, once again, I have said multiple times, do not format your fucking resume like this. It would be moronic. You'd look like a fucking idiot. Um, I'm explaining this from the context of basically memeing about the fact that I intentionally make these things not really well approachable to intentionally push away people who are going to be a little bit too inside the box kind of people. Um... This is a filtering technique, and yes, nobody should fucking do this. If you feel confident enough doing this, then you don't need advice. <laughs> this is literally just an example. This is, this is, I'm making fun of myself right now. This is not a realistic example. Um, Obviously, he has a knack for what he's doing, and he's lucky enough to get paid uh, for what he's passionate about. According to him, he had senior uh, level skills as a teenager. Yeah, I, I am very aware that I have very special skills, and I'm way ahead of the curve. And I do not take that for granted at all. Um, and I, I hope that has been made quite clear. Otherwise, I'm going to just stop looking at this resume if people actually think this is a flex or a humble brag or some shit. This is literally just meant... For people who are asking w the way that I format things. Because um, I can just fucking get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like... Um, I only st understood performance. This is enough for a simple man for me. I assume the stream isn't for noobs like me? No, the stream is for everyone. Just ask questions and we'll answer questions. Quick question. Uh... What do you think about Apple moving towards ARM on laptops? We've talked about that a couple times before. Ultimately, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> I don't care. Um, what is your target salary range? We don't really talk about salary ranges in the US, but I kind of look for like somewhere, well, it's hard because nowhere has like titles. Um, but uh, it's, I mean, my salary range that I would expect, so if you actually want to know, because I do have a salary range, and my salary range is very complex. It ranges from basically a job that I am doing exactly what I want to do in life, all the way up to a job where I do something that is specific to my role, and it's something that uh, builds on the skills that I have, and that is kind of like 
maybe expecting a little bit more management than I want to do, so I'm making some sacrifices to work like balance, but that range is probably 200k to 800k. Basically, if you want me to build a team and create something and build a whole new like fucking wing or like add a security team to your company, 800k. But if you just want me to fucking do whatever I do and allow me to stream and shit, 200k. And then basically for a realistic job where I have like real deadlines somewhere in the middle. So... Um, let's see. What do you think about NVIDIA buying ARM? I don't give a shit. I don't care. I don't fucking care. I don't care if they buy ARM and they ruin it. I don't care if they buy ARM and invest in it and turn it into the best architecture in the world. I don't give a fuck. Because it just, it just doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I'm just going to buy whatever processor or whatever GPU or whatever compute thing serves my problem the best. I don't care what company sells it. I don't care what their price point is. As long as it has the best performance per dollar for my situation, I'm just going to do my research and I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't fucking care about ARM, I don't care about x86, I don't care about Risk v even though I like Risk v because it's simple, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't care. Um, where I live, a very experienced senior uh, lead dev gets a salary of like 100k, if he's very, very lucky, yeah, 100k, 130k is a, a big fucking, a big deal. Even in the US, even in the US, right, a, a fucking senior software engineer lead manager architect at most software companies is probably in the 120 to 150k mark that's how it is um but it, yeah all right um so i talk about fuzz week uh where i talk about kind of things we went into fuzz week i guess i won't read it verbatim Talk about fuzz theory, um, which is, I guess, the, the series where we talked about kind of the theory behind fuzzing to show that I'm kind of more interested in the academic aspects of fuzzing and the mechanics of fuzzing rather than just like, I just write fuzzing. Um, this is important to me to basically show that I don't want to be hired to just run fuzzers. I want to be hired to architect and implement basically novel techniques, haha, <laughs> novel, uh, for doing fuzzing, right? I, I want to be expected that I create new ways of approaching fuzzing that affect the world, right? They don't just affect the company, but they are like new fucking ideas for the world on how to approach these problems. Um, and that is an important aspect of my resume and that I am not looking to be a cog, I am looking to be basically a path for this company to interact with like security research on a global scale um remember reddit was looking for a lead dev with salary at a million yeah that sounds pretty reasonable yeah um let's see uh is there a reason for beginners to start coding uh when they have to compete against people like me, uh, yeah, I mean, you can just get the skills that I have and then you can be competing with me or beating me, which is not difficult because if you are younger than me, by nature, you should have better access to things and you should be able to acquire the knowledge that I acquired in less time. Um, now, I'm on the top end of the spectrum of luck in terms of getting in a position where I'm able to learn at a quick pace, in terms of being at companies that promote learning, you know, being in environments where th those things actually really, you know, set hold. Um, so that's hard to compete with, but absolutely, I would expect that anyone younger than me should have a better situation to get into the position I'm in than I took. Right? It should just be easier. There's more information. Programming has gotten more accessible, easier. More people do it. There's more reference points. Management styles have gotten more on the end of uh, learning and growth. Salaries have increased. The security industry didn't fucking exist when I joined it. Like, it existed, but it was like one 
fiftieth of the size, and you'd be happy if someone would pay you fifty to eighty k in fucking scraps because you're security. Who the fuck are you? Do you even write code? Like, yeah, it's so much fucking easier. So yeah, you have a huge leg up. That goes for pretty much anyone in any industry. You always have a leg up if you're if you're new to the industry. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get invested if you're older or started late. Um, but you shouldn't expect yourselves to be competitive with people who've been doing it their whole lives, right? Um, it's a little luck, little technical capability, but also soft skills coming a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm on over 800k a year, uh, but I'm nowhere as specialized as Gamoza at fuzzing. Yeah, I mean, like, 800 sounds ridiculous, but it really isn't. It really isn't, right? Like, the only reason why I have such a wide range is because a lot of companies just wouldn't consider me skilled just due to my age, right? Um, like, I just literally just don't have the fucking experience. Um, need to jump on, jump on Discord? Yeah, I, I know. Um, I don't really want to do that on stream right now. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, having guests on stream is just really hard, but I'm always down to talk about stuff like this. Um, do you have a wife or kids? No, I basically have to sacrifice everything in my life to work. <laughs> like, <laughs> just, <laughs> I have to literally sacrifice everything in my life for work. Um, that is a decision that I have made. It's not a decision I've been forced into or feel pressured into doing, but it is a, a decision that I've made. Um, uh, I just graduated last... Spring, uh, what do you recommend for someone looking uh, for a job right now? Depends what you're trying to do. Security, software, other sorts of things. Um, uh, let's see. It also depends on like your skill sets and, you know, uh, ultimately, a lot of placement comes down to your skills and kind of your assertiveness and your soft skills, right? Soft skills go a really long way. Um, it's really hard to give people advice over stream because I, I don't know if you literally left university and you have a CS degree and you literally paid someone a hundred bucks a week to do your homework and you cheated on all your tests, uh, which is really common. At least in the US, like probably like 30 or 40% of people are literally just fucking cheating on most of their shit and their homework. Um, uh, or if you came out and you fucking put your effort in and you are a really good programmer and you're the person that like people look up to in class, uh, a lot of it comes down to being critical of your own skills. Um, ultimately, the, like the jobs that I'm talking about, like getting into Fang, like right out of school, those are elite. Those are like the top five, one percent of programmers. Like already the top like one percent of already like the top twenty percent of a lot of students leaving school, right? So um it's important to not expect that. It is a gameable system. If you are in it only for the money, you can do things like Leet Code to study for interviews that Fang things do, and you can spray and pray, and you can apply to fucking 50 to 100 companies and hope that one of them, you just, it's the right day, the right interviewer with the right mood, with the right question, which jives up, and you can maybe sneak in, even if you're not qualified. If you are qualified, you probably know, right? Um, it's hard to say, but you probably know if you if you are qualified. Um, that being said, Fang is a fantastic place to work. Uh, I don't know if you're in the U.S. or not. If you're not in the U.S., I can't really speak to you at all. Um, but yeah. I have a severe case of imposter syndrome. I always feel like someone will find out I know nothing. Yeah, that's pretty standard. Uh, we've talked about that before. That's how most people feel. Um, that doesn't help. Like, that doesn't help you get through it. Uh, but understand that a lot of people are already um, kind of weighing the things that you say with that in mind, right? The, like, everyone, everyone is already kind of in a similar mindset. Um, let's see. Were you on the giving or receiving end of a $100 bill? I didn't go to college. 
Uh, good on average, I think, is 50K EUR. Uh, yeah, e euros. Um, let's see. Oh, you're talking about houses, yeah. Housing prices are fucking nuts. Yeah, for, for perspective, the, the median home value where I live is 820,000 US dollars, uh, which comes out to like a three to $4,000 a month mortgage. So basically to live here as a median person, not mean, it's not skewed upwards by, you know, $50 million homes, median, cut everyone in half. And if you want to be right at the half part, 800k. Um, and this area is considered cheap for tech workers. A lot of people are moving from like the Bay Area to here because you get a similar life experience with a much cheaper cost of living, especially when you factor in taxes. Um... Did you start programming before uh, getting into exploit and uh, exploit dev and fuzzing, or did you learn programming because of security? I've been programming since I was about eight, uh, in terms of like, I dabbled with programming, but I have been seriously programming since I was 12. And when I say seriously programming, I mean, on average, I probably code every day since when I was 12. Uh, from when I was like eight to 12, yeah, I probably like wrote code once a month, right? Um, but yeah. My area is 1.3 million. Actually looked it up yesterday. Yeah. Bay Area, lol. Yeah, Washington is like the uh, second tech hub. Yep. I mean, now it's going to be in Austin. Seattle might be skipped for Austin. Um, I forget why Austin is so great. I think they have like really low... Um, do they have really low... I think there's no state tax in Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think they have really low property tax. Yeah, and land is basically free. Um, too bad that the Pacific Northwest is becoming the next Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think it will kind of not happen. I don't know. So, both Silicon Valley and... Um, Pacific Northwest, m m more specifically Se Seattle are kind of locked in by mountains. So like I lived in DC for a while and in DC, you could just keep sprawling pretty much forever. And that's what they did. Like people would have hour long commutes. In Seattle, it's pretty much impossible to have an hour long commute because you just run into mountains everywhere that eventually things will have to build up or get more expensive. Um, so it is kind of interesting that if it does really grow a lot, which I don't think it is uh, going to, I think it'll get more expensive in the dense area. Um, I don't know. I think work from home is going to change a lot of that shit. Decoding prodigy over here. I mean, that's probably fair. Um, <laughs> this is probably fair. Delaware good for business? I have no idea. I, I didn't look at like business side of things. You kind of get fucked everywhere. Um, cause you end up having to pay so much in taxes, uh, and healthcare. Yeah. A lot of people don't know like the other half of taxes for like social security and shit that, uh, businesses pay for, but, uh, running a business fucking sucks. If we get increased wages in Vancouver, Canada, that would be great. Yeah. Good fucking luck, dude. <laughs> you got paid in Canadian there too. Good morning. Hell yeah. Good morning. All right. Um, yeah, so you have seen a lot of these projects. Sushi Roll is uh, basically an OS that I wrote that is designed for uh, doing introspection on CPU vulnerabilities. And it was also the OS that I designed for uh, vectorized emulation. Uh, this is really cool. We wrote the like Sushi Roll blogs, which are fucking pretty massive, I would say. Pretty big deals. Um, God, is already... Oh, wow. Like, a little over a year now. Um... Vectorized emulation, obviously that was fucking fantastic. Won a pony from that. Big, big fucking award. Uh, and then Folk Revisor, which I worked on uh, for a while. And I used this to find bugs in Chrome IPC, Defender, PDFEM, and Word. And then I started using it for everything else. Um, show the pony. Oh yeah, I can, I can grab the pony.
We got we got the pony there. <laughs> Even though it's out of focus with that f-stop. Yeah, fuck it. But yeah. So that's a pony. <laughs> Never get tired of seeing the pony. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> the glorious gold spray painted pony. Um is there another tro yeah, I've got a couple like trophies and awards and stuff. Um sub for pony. Hell yeah, thank you, man kid CS. Yeah. It's a it's a award from uh, Black Hat, which is like it runs kind of in parallel with DEF CON. It's the corporate version of DEF CON, uh, but I it, it's a it's a pretty high praise for getting it. Um, all right, so then I talk about my actual work. So uh, quality of outcomes or a quality of opportunities? Oh God! Now I've got fucking <laughs> I've got spray painted gold on my hands. Because it rubs off. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> now I'm getting gold everywhere. I got fucking gold on my mouse. <laughs> um, a quality of outcomes or a quality of opportunities? I mean, like, neither. A quality of opportunities is fucking moronic. Um, and a quality of outcomes is fucking moronic as well. Ultimately, a lot of people don't have the time or interest to get a quality of outcomes where that's not fair. Why would it be fair that someone can put 80 hours of work into something and someone can put 20 hours of work into something and they both get the same, you know, they both get, like, one gets pumped a lot more fucking energy such that they have equal output. That's fucking ridiculous. So it should be uh, basically circumstantial. It should be based on the circumstances that you have. There should... Equality for out opportunity should be the fucking floor, but it should be somewhere above that. There should be some additional help and hand-holding and assistance to get people into a better state, whether that's, um, whether that's like coaching or mentorships or teaching or education accessibility or those sorts of things. Um, so it's a lot more complex than that. And I want to hack a printer now. Oh, we're not there yet. Um... It, it varies, so right? It fucking varies. Like, of course, everyone should have equal opportunities, um, but someone who's actually interested or puts in the effort or has a skill set in that should not be hampered um, as well. It's kind of fucked. Poor Da Vinci. Oh, yeah. All right, so basically here, here's kind of like what I put for career experience because this is actually like interesting stuff. Thanks for your opinion. Hell yeah. We, we got the hot takes here. So, Gamoza Labs. What, what do I do? Actively develop and maintain various tools specializing in vulnerability research. Yep. The flagship tool being developed is a custom operating system utilizing a lightweight VTX and SVM hypervisor capable of snapshotting, fudging, triaging, and debugging nearly any operating system or software that can be run on an x86 machine. Basically, Fulkervisor and all of the hypervisor variants. Adoption of bleeding edge hardware features like AMD's SVM, IOMMU, LWP, BHTrace, IBS, uh, VTX, VTD, LBR, BTS, and PT give high performance introspection into code flow of targeted software, right? Basically, I've got hypervisors that are fucking fast. They help me find bugs and I get coverage. In places where non x 6 target is under test, I've developed specialized emulators, intermediate languages, and JIT compilers for maintaining high levels of introspection and performance. Current research is focused on vectorized emulation for fuzzing via SSE, AVX2, and AVX512. This emulator is capable of executing 3.5 trillion RISC-V instructions per second on a 96-core Intel machine. This vectorization uh, not only provides a large speedup, but also allows for cheap horizontal comparisons between vectors to detect divergence of memory accesses, register states, code flow, and code flow. More info can be found on my blog, where I go into more about actual performance numbers. There's a character that can't render? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's fucking whatever. Um, okay, historically successful research includes Chrome IPC, Android Kernel, Windows Defender, Office, Adobe Reader, Microsoft Reader, PDF, -ium, various routers, many more miscellaneous targets, basically things I don't want to talk about. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know what pretty apostrophe I use, but definitely some pretty apostrophes. Um, okay, then this would have been Microsoft. Uh, Wrote fuzzers for DHB client and server and identified numerous critical vulnerabilities. Wrote a Windows, uh, found a remote for Windows, uh, found a remote Windows kernel bug in the firewall. Uh, developed a state of the art tool for other security researchers at Microsoft called TKO Fuzz. Uh, this tool provides cross platform system level fuzzing uh, of any x86 target in a deterministic way. It provides a framework for other security researchers to build fuzzers and analysis tools uh, on. Um, it has since become the standard tooling at Microsoft for both fuzzing and repro for security researchers and developers fixing the reported bugs. TKO Fuzz has been used to successfully find execu code ex find code execution bugs in DHP, SMB, RDP, DNS, TCP, anti-kernel, anti uh, now the IP stack, Win32K, and many more at this point. Like fucking so many things. Tasked with uh, writing proof of concept exploits for nearly every CPU bug that gets reported to us but by both external researchers and partner companies. Developed a custom operating system for finding and reproducing CPU vulnerabilities as well uh, as to better understand the impacts they have. Found a CPU vulnerability for Intel processors, which is the CP, uh, uh, CVE. Developed an open source of binary code coverage mechanism for user land uh, fuzzing on Windows called Mesos, which we did. It's pretty, pretty solid. Um, worked on scalable and automated vulnerability research, specifically focused on leading the dynamic and concrete tool development for a project combining concrete, symbolic, and artificial intelligence for automated vulnerability research. This was a uh, super heavy, like, researchy sorts of things. Actually, a lot of like, cool stuff there. Um, more focused on the tooling. Uh, this was more, like, academic uh, than actually going for, like, results. Um... Super fun work, actually. Uh, this is before then. Performed, um, let's see here. Performed vulnerability research on uh, many handheld devices, largely Android phone LPEs via kernel surface. Through reading code, modifying kernels, and writing fuzzers, I discovered over a dozen critical bugs. Lots of effort was spent in discovering unique surface that had otherwise remained unaudited and difficult to harness. Uh, created multiple custom Kimu extensions that allowed for harnessing of portions of phones and added introspection abilities to further vulnerability research. Created custom allocators and software MMUs that allow for byte-level granularity fault detection, which in turn discovered mild corruption cases otherwise undetectable, which once detected were grown into proof-of-concept exploits. Um... Designed a custom ARM Thumb 2 and MIPS MIPS32 emulator designed specifically for fuzzing. These emulators kept, uh, kept performance, introspection, and revertibility to a maximum, giving a large performance gain over Kimu in these specialized cases. The introspection provided by this custom emulator uh, included not only standard code coverage, but also register, memory, and overall pro program state coverage combined with solvers. Um... These new additions allowed for uh, new vulnerabilities to be discovered uh, in targets uh, that with QMU would be nearly impossible to find. Uh, developed many custom tools for harnessing and lifting both open and closed source targets into emulators, including a custom network driver written in shellcode to provide reliable snapshotting capabilities on embedded target. This is basically kind of what we're doing with the printer stuff, right? This is shit I've been doing for a long time now. Kind of my bread and butter. Um... Uh, tasked with proving the feasibility of blindly exploiting a remote unknown embedded device, uh, discovered multiple buffer overflows, a scanning memory peak vulnerability, remotely extracted sections of firmware, and identified the target CPU architecture in an unknown embedded device with only network access. Uh, developed a low-level x86 lifting backend uh, to a symbolic execution engine. Um, created an alternative front, a front end harness to an internal tool. Uh, that improves scalability and performance for fuzzing. Yeah, this, like, I've been doing scalability and performance for fuzzing for so fucking long now. Um, this turned into, this in turn yielded multiple bugs. Created uh, forensics resistant Android implants for DARPA uh, to push the state of the art malware detection tools. 
And then this was my first job out of high school, developed a fuse-like driver for Windows to allow for the mounting of a network drive over a custom protocol handled in user land. This included a file system driver, virtual disk driver, uh, and a user mode API to communicate with the driver using octals. The driver and API layers were designed to atomically allow for multi-threading. Uh, the project enabled custom network directory browsing, file creation, movie streaming, etc. Um, symbolic execution engine? Engine, can we have a story about that? Not really. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I basically my like early interest in security was largely symbolic execution, uh, and I worked on a team uh, that did symbolic execution, and we basically wrote a uh, new symbolic execution engine and solvers. Um, I think we ended up leveraging some other solvers, but we basically did everything at some point, and I did the x86 lifting part of that. But I had pretty decent knowledge and uh, interest in the internals of that. Um, and plans for malware detection tools, more like malware tools. Uh, I mean, that was literally for malware detection tools. <laughs> that that project was very public. It was uh, this was in probably 2012. This was very early on, um, and basically the goal was like. Malware on Android phones was rampant. It still is rampant, but in 2012, holy shit. There was no fucking Google Play, smart screen, whatever. Uh, and basically the goal of this was, how the fuck do we give Android phones to people who are working at a national level, like have state security, like working in government, you know, that sort of thing. How the fuck... Do we detect those? How do we actually do those things? I, personally, I think a lot of that research is bullshit. Same stuff that I have with AVs. Uh, but basically, that was like combined with like a bunch of AV audits to find like the best AV that wasn't shit. And TLDR, they're all shit. But I don't know. That stuff's really boring to me, to be honest. Was your research turned into a solution and implemented? Uh, just like most <laughs> funded research, um, it's just, it's just, it's just a jobs program. It's just a jobs program. <laughs> like, I, I'm sure it has affected things, but I doubt the impact has been that high. Like, literally, all I remember doing is I basically wrote malware that would just get full control of your device, and then we ran it through every AV, and no AV detected it, because it didn't match a signature, because it was new code. Even though it wasn't obfuscated, the symbols weren't stripped, nothing. It was literally, like, open disk, drop things, modify things to give persistence. Like, literally, if you S-traced it, there were, like, 10 syscalls, and they were as sequential and obvious, and no AV could detect them. Nothing. It's still, to this day, same story. Nothing has changed. But yeah. TLDR, give dumb phones to government officials, only allow ASCII SMS, yeah. I mean, as someone who has done dumb phones, dumb phones are much less secure than smartphones. Sorry, but um, yeah, the 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 Nokia the Nokia uh, SMS modem stack um, that was written in basically 1985 and has never been touched since then isn't the most high quality thing out there. <laughs> SIM cards run Java, yup. It's probably because how easy GSM was to break, how complicated LTE is. Like, it's not really that. It's that dumb phones have no security. They're running typically embedded processors with no MMUs, with no isolation, no IOMMUs, no PXN, no AS ASLR, no, ex like, no execute never or uh, NX, right? Like... Basically, dumb phones, if you can overflow the stack, you win, because you don't have stack cookies either. But smartphones, arguably, are some of the most locked down and secure devices in terms of, uh, like, mitigations. So, yeah. No updates for those phones, too. Yeah. And 
Doesn't mean you can't do it. Ultimately, the best way to get security is to reduce attack surface. So in that regard, yeah, dumb phones are the correct way because you reduce attack surface. Um, but you need to reduce attack surface by reducing attack surface and using modern programming practices and mitigations. You can't just reduce attack surfaces by using something that was designed in the 80s. Um, but yeah. Um, Android technically is Linux already, and Android already isolates apps. I mean, it changes the way it isolates all the time. But it varies. Could you uh, support yourself only doing Twitch uh, without working on your day job? No fucking way. Um, I make a surprising amount of money off of Twitch. Like, like a couple hundred dollars a month which is crazy, uh, but that's, that's not going to even remotely cover my bills. <laughs> like, I probably couldn't do Twitch full-time until I had, like, 5,000 concurrent viewers and large amounts of donations and the same sub ratios I have now, which I wouldn't be able to have at 5,000 viewers. And even then, I would be able to survive, but I wouldn't be able to actually, like, live life the way I do. So, no. Um, plus Twitch takes a big chunk. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, I don't even care how much of a chunk, like, I'm not even within an order of magnitude of being able to stream full time, so I, I don't even care. Um, yeah, it just, it just doesn't, yeah. It, it would, it would not even remotely cover the bills. <laughs> not even fucking remotely, dude. All right, um... Gonna hide that pony back there. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Homeboy probably makes 200K. 200K is kind of entry level in big tech. If you want a perspective. That is like fresh out of school in the US at big tech. At Fang. Um, do you write papers also? I've, I have basically done some coding for a paper and I got credit on that paper. So technically I have participated in a, in a paper, but I didn't really do any of the writing. I just agreed with the concepts and, uh, backed it up with doing a couple tests on data that I had available. Um, I'm happy that I got credit on that, but I didn't really do any of the work on that. Um, but no, I don't really believe in the paper system. I think it's, uh, the signal to noise is too high, and I think I'm better communicating my ideas in blogs. Um, let's see. Um, Google creates a large attack service you can't control. Doesn't even matter. If you, if you, like... <laughs> The, the Google component of Android is not the attack surface. The attack surface is the incredibly shitty drivers and the modems that are black boxes and unaudited. It's the Bluetooth stack that is riddled with bugs and written in the lowest quality fucking code possible. It's the browsers that are an infinite source of bugs regardless of the code quality just due to the high amounts of churn. It's the Linux kernel which is an absolute heap of shit and riddled with race condition bugs. It's... It's fucking everything. Like, it's, there's so much attack surface on a phone. It's, like, arguably phones have the most attack surface out of anything in the world. Regardless of if there's a Google search box or whether Google has some telemetry out of the ass of the phone. Even through the straightforward, most vanilla, ungoogled phone, there's still more attack surface than you ever possibly need to have an infinite supply of bugs for your lifetime. Infinite fucking supply. Not even fucking close, dude. Like, if, as I've talked about before, you can go look at the, the prices for bugs to figure out how fucking trivial it is to find bugs in these devices. When Android and iOS exploits are one to two million dollars, it's safe to say that they are an absolute fucking joke to compromise. 
<laughs> like, what is the solution? Start writing shit in Rust? Reduce attack surface? Sandbox things? And holy fuck? Stop fucking having so much code internet accessible. <laughs> it's literally reduce attack surface by a factor of 10, rewrite everything in Rust, throw all of our programming models out the window, and then be okay with a 2x performance slowdown because you actually check for buffer overflows before you fucking jam shit into buffers. Um, yeah. Rust will provide the fastest performance that we can possibly get while also giving us security. You cannot beat the performance that you can get from Rust in a secure C or C++ model because the amount of mitigations you need to secure in C and C++ will make it three to four times slower. And in Rust, you can get like a 20% slowdown and you just get the safety. Like... Is Rust mature enough for it? Not really. Garbage collection. <gasps> Have you ever thought of hacking together your own phone? No, I don't give a shit. Is that a Herman Miller chair? Yes, it is. But Rust checks are in C? Uh, they're not. <laughs> they're, there's no... They're, they're in compile time? Yeah. I mean, some are compile time, but a lot are runtime. A lot of bounds checks are runtime, right? And that's a cost that you're gonna have to pay at runtime, but it's better than paying a massive heap mitigation cost because you have to treat your entire heap as corrupted at all times. Um, yeah. What camera are you using? You can do bang camera to find that out. Um, but I thought it's zero cost. I mean, it's less cost than mitigated C and C++. Unfortunately, you still have to use mitigations in Rust because of unsafe code, um, but you can still decrease the mitigations where you don't need it in purely safe code, right? So, um, Herman Miller chairs are leagues ab above your normal office chair. Yeah, it's, if you sit at your computer more than eight hours a day, it's worth the investment. Can you suggest pandas alternative in Rust? I don't, I, I don't know what pandas is. So, no, I can't. I can't even tell you what pandas is. Shoes, mattress, office chair. I think, yeah. Yeah, I've got a really nice mattress. I've got a really nice office chair. My shoes kind of suck, but I don't really care about shoes because I don't leave my house. But, yeah, if you leave your, leave your house, yeah. What if we use Scratch instead of Rust? I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, what's an S trace? Talking about the tool, S trace, strace. Oh yeah, didn't I say S trace before? Basically a list of all of the syscalls that are invoked by a program. You might be really behind if you just heard S trace because that was like 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. For most cases, F sanitized address uh, won't impact a fucking IoT device managing your fridge, even if you lose 50% of perf. Yep. Uh, my perspective is ultimately all, all. Now, sanitized address, not a security boundary, but it could be if it was designed to be. Um, but ultimately, um, yeah, that's my view. Like, most remotely accessible default configuration attack surface is your DHCP client, your DNS clients, maybe some like local land discovery sort of protocols, like UDP sort of stuff. Those things are handling like maybe a packet per second. Who cares if it's twice as slow? Just mitigate the shit out of those surfaces. There's no reason your DHCP client that gets a lease every 15 minutes needs to be fucking C with a heap that's easily corruptible. Put that shit in page heap. Who cares if you triple the memory usage and double the overhead? You're processing one packet every 15 minutes that takes a microsecond to process. It just doesn't matter. Thoughts on Geohot? I think he is a fucking loser nerd. 
Uh, no, I think Geohot's pretty chill. Um, I, I've, I've done, uh, I've did, like, CTF, uh, competitions with Geohot. Um, ultimately, I think Geohot's fucking brilliant. Uh, I think he's a weirdo, but I also think I am also a weirdo, so that's not an insult. Uh, and I don't think he would take that as an insult. Um, no, he's, uh, he's a, he's a really fucking smart dude. What do you think about Graphene OS? Never heard of it. So based. Yeah, I had to get that clip, you know. Have you met Locky Heart? Probably. I feel like I've met most people in the security industry at this point. <laughs> I don't think there are many people I've not met at this point. Like, uh, I, like, literally don't know. I, I've interviewed at Project Zero, I've talked with people at Project Zero, I've mingled with people at Project Zero, I've DM'd people at Project Zero, I've interacted with a shit ton of people at Project Zero. Um, out of context clip, hell yeah. Do you know how it was the iPhone reading guy? Yeah. He's doing uh, uh, self-driving cars now, but he's just an all-around very, very smart fucking dude. Just kind of a, a universally smart kind of dude. They should hire you? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be fun. I think that'd be a good fit. He stole some of my code. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> he, like, Geohot is, um, Geohot is more startup mentality, do it super fast, you know, clued shit together. I don't like him. He's a very polarizing person, but, um, Like he he's a he's a very aggressive developer in that he he does things very 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 quickly, um, and he's very interested in like crazy new technologies. Um, I don't know. Like I'm not a huge fan of his personality, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate what he does. Right? I, I think he's done some awesome things. Um, his personality is a little bit too egotistical for my tastes, but that shouldn't be an insult. <laughs> like, so, he also has a rap career. Oh, yeah, dude. Fuck. Um, Tom Cruise, was that it? No, was that a CTF name or his rap name or both? I know he used Tom Cruise for CTF, but thoughts on WebAssembly? Uh, I don't give a fuck, dude. I don't care about the web. I, I don't care at all. Um, Tom is the CTF name, yeah. I think that's also what he did his, um, uh, rap career on. Yeah, both. Wish I didn't have to care about the web, too. <laughs> yeah, fuck the web, dude. I don't give a shit. All right, let's hack a printer. Um, I think that was a good intro. I think, I think we got a good momentum going. Uh, I'm glad we waited for people to show up to stream so we can get to the content here. Uh, glad we went through that nice warm-up phase where we just, you know, got to wait for some of the people to come into chat. Um, you know, solid intro. It's pretty good. Yep. <laughs> Literally thought this was an outro. <laughs> this stream is awesome. All right. Yo, chat. Chat, did you know that we can do this now? You know that we can do this now, chat? Chat, or we can we can do two things at once? Yeah, look at that. Production value! Woo! <laughs> Production value. Ah. Oh. Alright, so. What we did the other day. Uh, was we basically uh, wrote a compression algorithm, uh, which is just LZ, but we kind of we kind of reversed it out. We pretended as if we didn't know it was LZ. To be honest, I don't think anyone can call me out for that because I don't think we actually looked up any references to LZ. So I do think we did pretend as if we didn't know what decompression they used, and we basically wrote our own compression um, based on what we reversed out the decompression. So we reasoned about the decompression, and we wrote a compression algorithm for it. Um, 
So, yeah, chat called it out as LZ, but we didn't do anything with that information, right? Um, so, I think that went kind of as I wanted, right? We, we kind of... We kind of simulated what it would be if that was a custom compression algorithm. Um, did look at some reference implementation, but yeah, I decided to not use any. Ah, yes, that is true. Uh, because they were stupid and didn't actually do the same algorithm. <laughs> um, or more specifically, they did LZ, but they did a like standard format, and we needed a, a very customized version. So we didn't, we didn't really gain from that. Anyways, um, this code we can find in Compressor. So, once we had Compressor open, this allows us to call, uh, well, Compute Compression Ratio. We use that as our optimization function. Compress, uh, let's, uh, let's clean up our code and read through it. Um, let's go into 922, is that latest? I think so. We can turn this off, and we can go to this view, and we can go to uh, I mean the new camera's so nice that I don't want to put it in such a small corner, but um, unfortunately Gija is a bitch to have open here. Um, I think decompress large is the one that we want. Um, oh, I fit there. I'm a little bit small, but that's, that's fine. That's good enough. Okay, so, uh, we know that the compression code, we probably have a comment that refers to where that compression code is found. And we don't have a comment, so that means that we have to go into canon. And then here we can look at notes, and we can look at the high entropy uh, compressed payload here. Um, okay, so this is the code that does the decompression of the memory at 281,000 hex. Um, so basically, uh, F1 maps the flash. Technically, F0 does as well. It's likely F0, F1, F2, so on and so forth, all the way to FF, likely map the flash. So the 281,000 is the offset into the flash, and you'll find that number right here. We're basically getting the slice of memory that is being uh, decompressed. Um, and this is the end of the compressed allocated region, which we reversed out. Basically, in Flash, we were able to see that there are a bunch of Fs, so we could kind of see where it got padded out to. And it's not a coincidence that this is exactly a 10 megabyte region. So there's 10 megabytes here, uh, which holds the compressed payload. Um, and then that gets decompressed. This is the... Um, this is the flash, the compressed payload. This is the address where it should be decompressed to. Address zero is the start of RAM. There's 128 megabytes, maybe bytes of RAM. And then this is the size. It's not actually a reference. This is the size. If we can, can we set that equate here? Yeah, whatever. Basically, it's not an address. This is the size of the decompressed payload that needs to be extracted. So basically, source, dest, and size of decompressed. And then this is the decompression function. And what we did is we basically, we ended up just copying and pasting this right out of Ghidra into a compiler. We built this and used this to decompress the actual firmware itself, which was super easy. But then we ended up porting it to Rust, where we wrote the decompression here. And we can say uh, implementation, implementation of the decompression code, which is found at this. The, 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 this, so this is the function, the address that contains the decompression, and then here we take a slice of data, we create an output buffer, we then uh, go through, we read 
Um, this is basically the format. So we go and we read and we decompress the data, and then if it's equal to this size, this expected size, then we break, and that's the end. So we can use that to take our actual firmware dump, decompress, uh, get the compression region, decompress that, and then from here we can patch the compressed code, which we will look at decompress in a second here, we then recompress that patch code using our reverse engineered compression algorithm. We make sure that the decompressed version is equal to the compressed version, basically making sure that our compressor, our compressor and our decompressor agree in basically the, the transform that they did. Uh, this is basically a check and assertion, right? Um, and then we update the compressed region, which is that slice. Because uh, keep in mind, this is a subsection of the actual flash. We replace this new compressed blob into there, and then we write out our firmware, and that is the new firmware that we can replace on the serial flash on the printer, and that will allow us to patch it. So basically, anything that we put in here and we change in decomp is a patch that applies to the firmware. So TLDR, we are able to basically modify, instrument, change the existing firmware. Now, we're gonna try to not actually increase the size, and the reason we don't want to increase the size is just we don't 100% know, well, if we increase the size of the decompressed blob, we would actually have to patch other things like this. We would maybe have to patch some checksums or other things, so what we're gonna try to do is patch the firmware without actually changing any of the, um, without changing the size of it, which shouldn't be too difficult. So all we need to do is make sure that whatever we add to the compressed payload allows it to be recompressed back into a 10 meg boundary. And if I'm not mistaken, we need to basic, we have like 600K of compressed space that we can play with here. So we can add a fuck ton of stuff, or change the compression, change the entropy of the compressed blob, and it doesn't really matter too much. So, uh, that's what we did. How did I find the decompression algorithm? Uh, yeah, we just read through basically the entry point and reversed out a lot of the code to figure out the decompression. We actually found three different decompression algorithms, well two are look to be identical copies, uh, but two different things get decompressed with this, and then there's one gzip-based decompression, but we, we just reversed out the code. That wasn't too difficult, we did that in like one day, um, and honestly, we took our sweet time with that. Okay, so then this is a compression, uh, compression implementation. Um, so here we can say, uh, compression implementation of the uh, decompressor found at this, and hopefully it's in my clipboard, and it is not. So we'll go grab that, and then I just want to basically reference that value. I like, when I reverse things, I like to repeat where I find things a lot. Firmware is not signed, it is not, it's a printer, they don't give a fuck, dude. They don't give a fuck. It's not even checksum. There's one part that is checksum, but the main part that has everything that we care about is not checksummed. Uh, this is uh, compute the theoretical compression ratio for a uh, blob which is encoded with specific parameters. Imagine they do give a fuck in case you buy a legal ink for the printer. Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, unless there was secure boot on this printer, or a, a basically a, a, a trust, a root of trust, a certificate root kind of thing that's baked into hardware, um, it wouldn't even matter if there would be, um, it wouldn't even matter if there's signature checking, because we could just patch out the signature checking. And a printer's not gonna have fucking secure boot. Uh, maybe like a high-end, like $5,000, like multifunction office-style printer might, just because you can afford it in the bomb. 
Um, but for a fucking consumer printer, yeah, they're not gonna do that. That's so much more code, so much more dev process, whatever. So, literally, even if they had checksumming, or even a, a proper hashing algorithm, we'd just literally be able to just delete it or replace it with our own hash. They're just gonna use the same software, yeah, I know. I know, let me have faith, dude. What do you think about Leap Day? I, I'm not familiar with it. So, I, I, I'm impartial. Um, but yeah. Unless you have hardware baked in keys, we would just be able to change it. And even then, the hardware baked in keys, unless they're in a fucking ASIC, mm, we can probably get at them. <laughs> we can probably get at them physically, and that's all we need to do, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so... We have compression, we have decompression, we have a way of patching this firmware, and we validated this by going to this location in... So now we're only looking at the decompressed blob, right? So this is a string, enlarge slash reduce. So this was some UTF-16 string that was found in a menu on the printer, and what we did is we changed that string and we replace it with high twitch chat, uh, we also patch out a, uh, this is like a CGI return value or some shit. Yeah, page firm up, uh, CGI page that we replace as well. Um, so there's two things that we kind of patched. And then if we go into the printer, which is maybe on, no, it's not on. Let me power up the printer. Um... Come on. Are they sleeping? Wake up. Maybe the uh, chip is not in there. I mean, it went to the start phase. In before the printer doesn't work anymore. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if I just need to resocket that chip. Otherwise, we need to use the Richard strat. So, I did technically have a power outage, so, yep, we're going to have to do the Richard strat. What was that? Hold down the power button for like a certain amount of time or some shit. So, I know I'm a little off frame here, but... Hi. All right, we're doing Richard Strat. I'm holding the start button and plugging it in. Okay, I didn't hold it for long enough. We're gonna hold it for longer. Jeez, is it like 60 seconds? Holy shit. Maybe there's just like a capacitor we can short. It was like one minute, dude. Oh my God, it's outrageous. Let me try and get a better angle here. Um, unfortunately, my uh, the uh, stand that I ordered for the webcam did not come, or I guess for the camera, uh, did not end up coming. Uh, it like literally, the like shipping failed. So, uh, I need to angle that down, I think. Yeah, what is that? That's just background shit, okay. Unfortunately, this is gonna be fucky when we go kind of between multiple things, but basically holding the power button, and that's likely just decharging a capacitor, and then hopefully when we plug this in, ah, uh, it's still fucked, okay. Fuck. There's gotta be some capacitor we can short out, dude. Gotta be something, dude. Because this is going to be really annoying if we have to do this every time we patch the firmware. The fucking strat, dude. Holding the button. And the chip looks socketed. Chip looks in there good. Can you resize the camera here? We'll just go to this for now. You can't really see much because the camera's at a, at a bad angle and the microscope's here and whatever. God damn it, dude. 
What the fuck would actually be storing that? Would it? All right, let's try it. Okay, no light. There we go. Starts flashing. Fantastic. All right. So, yeah. I really wish I had the other stand. So if I had the other stand, then uh, this would work a lot better. And I know my mic's quiet when I talk away from it. All right. God, that screen is so dark. What's crazy is that that screen is that dark in this fucking room. There, there, there we go. All right. So uh, we can go into this menu and then hit the menu button. And then we can go one option over and we see high Twitch chat, right? So that basically has confirmed that we are able to affect the, the, the program that's on there, right? And the fact that we're able to do that uh, it basically means that we can patch this to do whatever the fuck we want it to do, right? Okay. So now, All right, um, okay, and f-stop has been changed. We'll just put this flux remover right in the background. All right, nice. Okay, so uh, what we need to basically do is go and find something that is worth replacing in the firmware that gets us code execution. And I don't want just to change code. I know I can do that. If I, I can literally go and just patch some bytes here and I immediately have changed code, right? That's fucking easy. What I want to do is add a back door. So what we want to do is slide in that back door and basically add something that allows us to ship up over the network something that we arbitrarily execute and then hopefully return the results back on. Um, so the goal will be to find basically some network entry point, hijack that network entry point, replace the code with something where it just processes some data that we send it, and then sends us a reply back. So, uh, click the icon next to the camera icon in Ghidra. You can show entropy. I don't give a fuck about entropy, but yeah. Um, oh, this one, sorry. What? You mean this one? Oh, the one next to it. Yeah, show entropy. Yeah, like, I don't really care because it's in color and I can't see color. So it's fucking useless. Uh, this one's good, though, because this shows code versus data. Uh, and this is the one that I actually do care about. Um, but yeah, blue's code and red is data, right? And then green's probably, like, uh, defined data or some shit. All right. Um, so... Basically, what we want to do is we want to find the easiest possible thing. And ideally, we add a fucking service to the printer. Um, so, adding a service is really difficult compared to hijacking an existing service because we would have to add a thread or do something like that, right? So ultimately, we kind of have no idea how this printer works right now. Um, let me see. I forget the user and password for this. Someone, does someone remember the user and password? Admin and Canon, bam. Um, so there's the A's that we added. So this is supposed to be, if we look at page source here, um, we should, uh, yeah, we see that we have a response and it's supposed to be XML. Obviously it gets corrupted because we overwrote, uh, we overwrote that response, uh, right here. So we replace that response with four A's and we see those four A's. So we can confirm that we can get shit sent to us over the network, right? And that's not too difficult. And then we can look at the xrefs, and we can see uh, roughly what this function is doing. Um, and here is this calling send, 
Is this send null terminated? Is this a socket? Right? We don't really know what this is doing. And until we understand that, we can't really do anything. But we know that this page firm up is getting set. So we know that this condition is true. Um, and if we look at this, and we have some, yeah. And we have no idea where that goes. Because this is written in C++ and it's fucking impossible to know. <sighs> but it would be really nice if we could just go to a web page and then we knew that like the post request was pointed to by something and at a length of something and then to send a response we just like call this function, which is likely the case. I'm guessing param1, this is probably the this pointer, right? It's probably the this pointer, this is C++. This is like CGI firm verify, right? Is it firm verify? Yeah. This is like CGI firm verify, it takes a this pointer. Um, this is clearly, uh, we can say that, th we'll just say this is a void star for now. Um, and we pass in this this pointer and then this is obviously going to do uh, some indirect calls based on those. Um, so, use a decompiler to get the source? Uh, yeah, this is a decompiler that we're in right now. Um, so, getting a fax working on the machine would be pog. Imagine a fax in live stream. <laughs> God, that would be pretty funny. I don't have a landline though. Sorry, I guess pretty new. No problem. Don't apologize. No, apo no apologies needed here. This is Ghidra. This is a reverse engineering tool written by the NSA, an open source. You can go grab it from Ghidra-SRE.org. Um. So, this is basically impossible <laughs> to trivially find how this works. We have to basically, we have to go and find xrefs to this. Um, and there can't be xrefs to that because that doesn't exist. Um, we basically want to figure out who initializes this global... There's clearly some this pointer for like, probably CGI session, CGI, you know, service engine. So let's, uh, let's look for some XRefs upwards and let's see if we can find a little bit more information on what this, uh, I guess we don't really care what it is. Okay, so here we go. So this is probably muxing the different CGIs. It looks like we have like a command code there. Page IJPC. Okay, so this is probably an index number. Local 30 is probably an index number. And where's that coming from though? Um, Ghidra. Local 30, compare with 24, R0, local 30, that's an argument. Okay, so this is like process, or this is like dispatch CGI request. And at this point, the CGI request has been turned into like a numerical CGI request. And it looks like uh, this is also a this pointer and it's the same this pointer. So I'll just say this is this. So this might not be the easiest path for us to do our modifications. Uh, we don't really know, right? We're, we're kind of YOLOing and, and taking a pretty big guess here that this is going to be the best way for us to actually uh, get arbitrary code shipped into here. Just because we already have an oracle uh, that we have confirmed where we control uh, things on this. Um, but there's a chance that there's a, a better place. So what we're going to do is local 30 is definitely an argument. Um, and that would mean this would take, um, yep, return address there. 
How much space do they allocate on the stack? 24. And then we have three arguments on the stack? This must take a lot of arguments then. Okay, let's see what calls this. I see. Dispatch here. And this is get job status. Okay. So these are clearly the tables, right? Uh, this is... I guess probably the, maybe the number that it uses. No, that's the same. That might be like a, that might just be an empty null string. This is obviously the like path, and this is the file name to the CGI script, and then the code that handles that. Um, now the question is, how do we supply inputs and how do we supply outputs? So outputs, we could technically, we know that we can output ASCII by calling this function, right? This is like, I don't know, send some CGI output, probably null term, right? So that's probably output null terminated shit. And we're gonna kind of look through this by going to this and looking at all the references to this and seeing if they all have similar um, usages. So far, they've all had zero for that final parameter. There's a chance that they... Well, they definitely... This is definitely three arguments. Um, scripts. This might just be send HTML, to be honest. Because uh, it looks like we are using this outside of the CGI context. So this is probably... This is like, I don't know. Send some HTML uh, CGI. And then that means that this parameter is probably the HTTP session. Um, unless they're all XML, CGI sort of things. Geolocation. But somewhere I probably have access to like post requests in here like somehow I can probably like get post request and then that would allow me to basically make an arbitrary peek or poke because I could send a request and then I could encode even if I have to ASCII encode it it doesn't matter um, I can find a way to make that work so basically I want to find one of these that seems to take a post request. If Ivar won, and this is Ivar won. Ivar won, if it's 17 or it's zero. So I don't know if this is getting a status on the printer or this is actually going um, to get like post request things. But we see, basically I'm looking for where the code uh, diverges. Uh, we know that this is some IP stuff. Confirm LAN settings. Gidra needs dark mode. It has one, but it sucks that it's not even worth using. Um, okay. Error state. Page utility. What we could do is try to sniff a, a CGI request. So let's just go and take a look at that. We don't really need anything too complex here. Uh, CGI, let's see. Form data, get info, colon, zero. Okay, here we go. Pern data, uh, that's going to probably do the trick for us right away. Um, search for strings. I have a string thing up here. I know you can't see this other screen, but I'm, for things that are just easier. Okay, here we go. Now we're gonna look at xrefs for that. It's xrefed here. This is obviously the function that handles it. So, 
uh, what we have is a get info zero, and I would hazard that this is saying get me the get info field from the form data. Chat, would you agree with that? That's my interpretation of what the fuck this does. So this is like, uh, this is like IDK some uh, HTTP form uh, data class, right? And then uh, we can say that offset one C um, auto create structure. It's not gonna do that unless I make memory. So let's just throw that into memory here. Um, memory map. Memory map, we're gonna add some RAM. It's gonna start at FE5B20, and it's going to be, the length of this is going to be uh, 128 times 1024 times 1024. We're gonna subtract off uh, FE5, um, B20, Okay, and we should have a 701A4E0 RWX memory, and this is just RAMy. The f the fuck did I do there? I really botched that one, didn't I? Um, that's fine. We'll just uh, we'll do this. RAMy. Starts at uh, FE5B20. Length, maybe it didn't take it as hex. 701A4E0. RWX. Bam. Okay, so that is the rest of RAM. So now we have the rest of RAM, part of that, and then that means this will actually hopefully get a reference. So we'll save that, refresh. Um, has that taken effect yet? Maybe not. Mm, did we fuck that by naming it? What was the address? Uh, 1D5. Oh. This is at the 18 alias. Son of a bitch. Um, okay, so we're going to make... We're going to say... Uh, uh, 1-8... FE5B1F uh, for length of 701A4E0 uh, RAMI alias. This is byte mapped to source address uh, FE5B20, one to one ratio. And we can mark that as executable. And I fucked that up, didn't I? 20. There we go. All right. So now uh, those should be alias. We've had issues with aliasing in Ghidra before. Hopefully it's not a huge issue. Okay. Let's uh, undefine that. Oops. How do you undefine? Remove label, delete. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, this now exists. Uh, let's do an auto analysis here quick. Set so our own RE tool with blackjack and hookers. That'd be nice. Write it in Rust. Write it with actual perf. It's probably a V table for this. Yeah. But I have no good way of finding the V table right now. And I don't even care because I can just piggyback off of this. This is probably just like get int, get int value from form data is probably exactly what that fucking thing is. Is like get an int value from form data. And you know what is an int value? An address. And you know what else is an int value? A length. So we should be able to basically add our own code to have this thing uh, basically hex dump memory. And then we can hex dump memory, and we can actually go look at this memory, and we can see what the fuck actually is contained at that address, rather than trying to figure out who initializes that VF table. Now that being said, we could probably look for accesses to this, uh, that are write accesses. 
Um, and I'm doing that really quickly right now. Code unit, sort, uh, context, read, write. Here's one write. There's only one write in the entire system. Um, and uh, is this right? This. Here's a store to that value. So load the value here. And then this. So we have another uh, reference. Okay, so now we can see where this is. So they kind of copy that, uh, I would assume. So we can look at the stores to here. We can see there's a store. Uh, is that the same one? Oh, is that circular? Oh, we can look at this. Well... One d five. Where is this being used? Xrefs to this. A read. Load load. Store r zero. R zero is this. Um. R four r zero. So this is likely the VF table, but there might be a little bit more of an offset on that. Um, this is PPU var one, which is the re wait. R one, load that, store that there. R zero is the return value of this, and then it's plus two. And it thinks that's a pointer pointers. Okay. So then here, we call this, and that is a straight up table. Okay. Well, that's not the return value. Uh, what does this return? That doesn't return anything. Um, R0, R4, this doesn't set R0. So, that's just reloading R4. Deref that. Return PPU var one. So I think this just doesn't return anything. I don't know why it's not picking up on that. I guess we need to commit these args in this function. Commit those. And then hopefully they'll prop this. Okay. Prem one. It returns. Is this it? What's the offset? It was 18 hex. 0, 4, 8, C, 10. It's clearly a pointer. Uh. Let's just see if any of these look like it. It's hard to say because it's just C++, so it's fucking impossible to read. Um... Do, do, do. I don't know. I think we're just going to go up and we're going to assume how it works. Because it's more fun that way, in my opinion. It'll probably be faster. I just don't want to mark up this database so much because uh, I want to work on the actual database uh, from a RAM dump. Because we still don't know how things are laid out. So let's just say get info. If it's not equal to zero, then we return some shit. Uh, is there an else condition on this? No. So we should just get result already page PRN. So let's look at the response. Hmm. There's some meat. 
Puren info. Ink resto. Hmm. Maybe this is like if check if this value exists rather than get int. Because we're definitely wait, are we seeing this? Response page PRN info, which is this ink rest. Oh, hmm. Um, is there another argument to this? No. It's not equal to zero, unless we're going down this path. Let's find a, let's find one that has a media request. Something that actually, um, seems to request something other than a zero. Let's just look at like air print settings. App data, get info zero. Okay. Register with this service? No. Uh, let's just do air print settings. Uh, rename that. Okay, bam. That'll be a post request. Here we go. Set info, bond name, bond note, geolocation. Okay, so this is getting fields. Um... So there we're able to basically supply something. Um, so, and what is this? This is app data dot CGI. And this is probably a big one. So we might want to find a simpler one to overwrite, to be honest, just because there's less to reverse out. So here's app data. Look for the XREF. Um, sorry, the XREF to this. We found an XREF. Here's the function that handles it. If get info is not equal to zero, then this is like the get info handler. Yup. Okay, so if get info is not equal to zero, this is probably like is, is, is post, is form data present or something, right? Have you ever attacked a Rust target? I have not. At least that I know of. Um, I just wouldn't bother. It'd just be impossible. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, clearly this is getting the this pointer. We don't know what's stored there. I think this is like checking if a value is present. Like, because then here, this is the set info. So here's the get info handler and get info is going to spew a bunch of data. And then set info returns null if no field. Oh, that that would make sense. If it's yeah. Um that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. So this one is the set info handler. Local 18 is zero. Page app, send some info. Otherwise, if there is a bond name, then uh, do this. This is probably A to I, um, what is bond name? Is this Sternlen? Uh, ampersand, oh, this is URL decode. Uh, and a length. Do you think that's a stack overflow? Do you think we can just find an easy stack overflow? Let's see what this is. Uh, while param3 is greater than 1, um, we're outputting to param2. This is URL decode. Um, what's this? This is going to be... Uh, I can just guess by looking at this. This is uh, stir to NL, or, or stir, uh, stir, to, to, stir tool, 
right? Um, so this is going to go through. Uh, Pram2 is going to be optional, so it will have null checks on it. If it's non-null, then it will set it to a return value. It'll end up returning the, the return value. Uh, this is probably doing stir2 OUL. Yep, and here we go. If it's, uh, yep, this is checking for a hex. Um, I don't know what this one would be, to be honest. Um, this is uh, to lower, or this is like hex to lower. Um, yeah, this is like hex, hex to digit or some shit. Um, I don't actually know what that is. Um, clearly this is, this is basically converting an, like a capital A into an A. Um, so if it's less than 3A and 3A in ASCII is going to be a... Oh, if it's a 9 or below, subtract 30. If it is uh, greater than 40 with the masking where it's clearing the uh, capitalization flag, then you subtract 37 hex. Uh, otherwise, set param 1 to negative 1. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Um, th this is literally a hex character to val, but is that a standard C library thing? I don't know what Pram2 is. Um, if Pram2 is less than or equal to that, then an error? Okay, that makes no sense. But this is, this is a stir tool. Don't think there's a standard function. Yeah, I agree. Um, so this is, if we look, we have a null and a 10. So this is a uh, base 16. Um, and this is basically, this is probably like stir to L, maybe stir to UL. And then I don't know internally why this would call another function, to be honest. I guess we don't really give a shit. Um, we're just going to say this is stir to UL. Um, and then store bytes. Yeah, I'm just going to say that this is stir to ul. Even though it's maybe not stir to ul, it could be two ls, it could be one l, it could be q. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's close enough. Undefined 8, actually? LSL, r0, or store that. Undefined 8. Does it think it's an 8-byte return? Because then it's stirred to ULL. Um, why would it think that, though? Sixty-four bit return on thirty-two bit architecture. It could do a multiple return, but I'm not seeing like through that ret path. I'm seeing a restoration of R one, which I think would be the correct location to store it. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just gonna say this is stirred to UL because it probably is. Okay. All right. Um, so basically, this is going to be uh, Pram 4. Is that used? Local 18. And F, what? So th this is clearly like URL decode, right? Um. And this is the source. And that is null terminated. Okay. Then we have a destination. Then we have an output uh, buffer. Um, and let's take a look at if... 
that's a source length or a destination length. Um, but we have an early termination on a null. And here we have an output buffer uh, bounds check. So while the output buffer has more than one byte, then uh, do all this shit. Okay, so if the output buffer um, is greater than one byte of output, okay. If the output buffer is greater than zero bytes, then we null terminate it. So basically, this is a, an always guaranteed null termination. Um, if the source is null terminated, then we break. Otherwise, read the character. If it's a percent, then... Um, yeah, so right, that's, that's an out-of-bounds access, right? Um, is it? Well, it hasn't dereft it yet, but I imagine it's going to. Yes, there we go. So, basically, um, right, let's imagine it's not null terminated, so we need one valid byte. We have one valid byte, we're gonna have it be an A, and then there's a null terminator. Or actually, we're gonna have it be percent. So we're gonna say that we have percent, null null terminator, uh, and then here, if we were to um, basically deref that, and that's fine, that's inbounds, that's been valid, Valid inbounds because this is expected to be null terminated and then we have a percent if it's equal to a percent Then we are going to cast the next byte, which is let's say the null terminator the end of the string It's gonna cast that to you sharp pointer um, Put it in P of our three and then we're gonna deref that value and we've gone one byte out of bounds So we read the null deref and we read one byte out of bounds. So if we were to compile this uh, with hey San and provide a single percent character, we would end up crashing the program. Um, chat, do you wanna see that? You wanna see that? I don't know what param4 is. Uh, local 18. Um, local 18 is a... Um, is this just a temporary buffer? No. I think this just doesn't take another parameter. I think this only takes three parameters, and that's just an uninitialized thing on the stack. Oh no, in R3. Really? Local 18. Where is this assigned at? Um... Because it just writes over it. It never uses it. And with FF. Um, local 18. Would there be a reason for that to be initialized? In R3. Local 18. Local 18. is being stored there. R3. Store byte. I'm pretty sure this is just putting it in a fucking null terminated buffer. I don't know what the and up there is. I'm very confused. Store byte local 18. What the fuck? Is this just wrong? Oh, does that get us an out of bound right? No. Because the desk buffer is bound checked. Um, but. Oops. I'm really confused what this local 18 is. We have a store. Like, my guess is they just null terminate a local. This. Like, here, here's, here's my theory, right? This is like a car two, right? 
And basically, this is just going to like set that up, and I guess it's not. Let's try um, char four. Like it's passing that in. Like, I'm pretty sure this is just null terminating something on the stack. Let's look at it. Read a byte from R40. Read a byte from uh, R40 after advancing R4. That's our out-of-bounds access. Then we store a zero. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then FF. This is, this is just null terminating. Like... It's a really, really sophisticated way of saying an, uh, this is, it's a four byte buffer on the stack due to alignment. It is not initialized from other shit. It is literally a value that is just stored on the stack. We then load up two bytes. We, lo we, we read the percent, we read the next two bytes into those two bytes into this local, and then we null terminate it in that local, and then we call stir 2 l on it. Uh, it's just very confused here. Um, let's say pu var is a... Let me see if I can coerce this into uh, bytes. And see if it gets more explicit. No, it just casts it. Son of a bitch. But that's 100% what it's doing. Um, basically, this is just saying that local 18 is uninitialized, right? Um, and the reason that this FF mask is occurring, it's saying that the bottom three bytes are zeroed. They're ORed with the PU of R3, which is the two bytes that we read. And then the top byte, which is preserved on the stack. Basically meaning it's uninitialized and left in the uninitialized state. It's converting percent hex to character. We know that. We knew that from the start. Um, the type for local 18 is definitely not a, uh, it, it's not a, a uint. We already know what that, we, we knew what this function did the second we looked at it. Uh, we were just trying to figure out exactly how that's done, and hopefully we can coerce this. Um... Let's see. Standard call. <sighs> I'm just so confused. I'm confused why Ghidra is... Like, we can see that they're all individual, one by one, re add one to the byte pointer, read the byte, store the byte at lo local 18.0, add one, read a byte, store it, add one, re uh, put a zero in there, right? Like, I have no idea why it's trying to coalesce that into multiple, uh, into multiple, say volatile character, oh, can we not? Um, I just don't know why it's trying to get classy. When the disassembly is more clear than the decompiled code. Yeah, I'm really surprised. Um, which is always, I, honestly, yeah, I read the, I read a, like, this is a summary and this is the truth, right? This doesn't mean shit to me. This is what actually matters. Um, but I'm really curious. I think it's because that was originally processed like that, but I don't know. Stir2L, that expects a character pointer, and now it's really happy about that. Um... I keep clicking properties. Huh. I wonder if it's due to this stack loading.
and that's why it's getting all fucked. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter. We can implement the logic, but I can show you why this is a bug. Um... Okay, int main void uh, int argc char argv. If argc is not equal to two, uh, printf standard error uh, usage uh, edit out, and then we can just say uh, arg, All right? Uh, return negative, uh, we'll just return zero there. I don't really care, it's a test program. And then we can just say uh, URL decode, um, let's say char buff uh, 32, um, char buff is equal to malloc um, output size, okay. Um, malloc arg, uh, atui argv1 or 2. We don't really care about the quality of this program, to be honest. Uh, then we're going to call URL decode uh, argv0 or argv1 into buff, and we'll say uh, atui argv2. Um, it's trash, but whatever. And then we can just printf decoded. Percent %s, and we'll say buff. So, that we should guarantee that that's getting null terminated and all of those things. Um, okay. Should be fine. Uh, GCC test.c. This isn't going to work out of the box because we have to make some of these. Uh, type def uh, unsigned int uint. Uh, type def unsigned long u long uh, u var two. Let's make sure we build this m32, and let's make sure we pull in. Uh, we'll need standard io dot h. Okay, and then we have a u short unsigned short. Okay, uh, then we have a 16. An assignment issue, we can just get rid of that because this is uninitialized. And then here we can just say um, uh, pvar3 is that, advance that. And then since it's x86, we can just literally say uh, short don't do this. This is not uh, architecture compatible. short uh, local 18 is equal to um, dref of pvar3. Okay, uh, might not have the ending in this correctly there. And then we need uh, s, uh, string dot h, I think, for stir tool. And we need uh, standard lib dot h. Okay, uh, a dot out. Uh, and then we can have argument be just percent, and then we can just say one, decode it. Let's say percent 20. Uh, let's say output is 30 bytes, so allocate 30 bytes for that. Is that not working? Let's try O2. Um, no, because that's just copying it, so that's fine. PVAR3, null, decoded, percent as buff. Oh, it's space. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> nice. 4 1. There we go. A, A, A. Oops. Right. So obviously it's fucking URL decode. Now what we can do is put a percent in there. Say the buffer size is, uh, it doesn't matter what the output buffer size is, but this will read out of bounds. Now it's not crashing, but let's do this. F sanitize address, and there we go. Um, well, that's a memory leak, fuck. Um, free buff. Okay, did it not go out of bounds? Oh, um, yeah, we need to do this. Uh, input is equal to malloc sterlen argv1 stir copy uh, into input from argv1. There we go. And there we go. We have an out of bounds uh, heap, heap buffer overflow. Is this on the right as well? No, that's on the stir copy. 
Am I doing... Well, that's on the stir copy. Son of a bitch. Uh, plus one. Son of a bitch! I was wrong. Okay. Uh... Okay, so the theory is that that reads out of bounds, and I think it should, right? Um, so personal term. Printf percent %p on source null term. We should read that, that out of bounds, right? Mm, printf length percent %d sterling argv1 length 1. It only contains a percent. We should read the percent. And then we go to plus one, and then we should deref it here. Um, what? Um, starts here. Yeah, we read two bytes at B. Like, what? What? We have two bytes allocated there, right? Yeah, length one. So we allocate two. And it reads, at offset one, it reads two bytes. What the ever-loving fuck? Hello? What? What? Um... What... What the fuck? What the fuck? Am I wrong? I don't think I'm wrong. Oh, thank you. Cheers. Uh, thank you. Yay, okay. Heat buffer overflow, read. Uh, you, you can find this code. The, the, the bug occurred at URLD code. Read of size two at that address. Uh, and let's just build it with debug info. And we can get the nice output. We can see that the bug occurred at 28, and this dereft out of bounds. So there we go. We, we found a bug in the printer. Whoa! Okay, anyways, that was really obvious, but yeah. Um, TLDR. Did I prove my point that there was a bug? Um, test, let's see. Okay. Okay. Didn't you add that line? I modified it, but it's the exact same thing that it's doing here. So no. Um... Yay, we have an out of bounds read it on the something. We don't know. Yay. Wow. What are the odds? Uh, does it have other bugs? Um, it advances that pointer. Oh, yeah, it'll just keep going. Oh, yeah, that's pretty bad. It's pretty bad because it'll just keep going. Because if we skip over the null terminator here, it's just going to keep going. <laughs> It's just gonna keep processing that, uh, like, it's gonna skip over the null terminator and just brrr, In theory, this'll go fucking infinite bytes out of bounds. So it's... Um... Now, destination. Destination is bounds checked. Wait. Wait. Output buffer. If there's greater than one byte, so there's two bytes. So the only way we could go out of bounds on a write here is if two bytes can get written in one 
execution of this loop. It cannot. Only one byte can be written at a time. Um, if it's an and, we null terminate. If it's a plus, put a space. Okay, that's true. Otherwise, copy it through. So basically, percents, decode the hex, ampersands, just fucking stuff, it, stuff the dest with a null. So I guess this is going to put multiple nulls in, right? Because it's always going to advance the dest. There's no continue there. So I guess at ampersands, it's just going to put zeros in the dest. So this is going to be... Wow, so it's basically a, a null delineated list. Yeah, split the string by ampersand, yeah. So it's a null delineated, URL decoded, uh, pluses turns into space. Um, is this complete URL decoding? And then it's always going to null terminate it at the end if there's room, and there's always going to be room. Um, but honestly, that function looks fine in terms of uh, oobs. Anyways, we get bon name. If it's non-null, then we URL decode that uh, into the stack, and we give it 31 hex bytes. Now, we do know that this function will, will use the whole output buffer. If the output buffer is one byte in length, it will gladly null terminate it. So, we do know that we can touch every byte of the output buffer with a, with a pertaining input. So, basically, if it didn't allocate enough space on the stack for one of these fields, in this case, it looks like 512 bytes, um, then we could go out of bounds on the stack by the usage of this. Um, sweet. So your LD code. Ampersand is the separator. Yeah. It's also wrong. So if your key contains an equals, uh, you won't be able to decode it correctly. A percent DB equals C. Can't use A equals B as a key. Um, why is that? If your key contains an equal, you won't be able to decode it correctly. But why? I see no reason for that to be the case. Um, please continue. I, I will gladly continue past your crazy point. Um, oh yeah, and then that hex value will be stuffed in there. So we can actually decode an arbitrary hex value into dest, um, which is kind of fun. Which means that we can use that as an input. Um, bond name. Bond name. And then that is this. And then this is probably like set bond name, this specific offset. Um, 31, yep. So. We should be able to basically uh, overwrite our code here and turn this into a poke, right? So I think we have an oracle for a poke. Um, how big is this? URL decode, okay. Move, all right, load, load, and a bunch of shit, store some shit, and blicks. So I think we can overwrite this with whatever we want, right? Which is enough bytes, it's enough thumb bytes that we can turn this into a poke. So basically, 
URL decode, we provide it maybe a hex address and then a hex. Um, we can basically set this up where we modify this, these instructions here um, so that when we do a bond name, we then send over a URL encoded thing that is a hex address and a hex value. And maybe we'll just write four bytes. Um, so then we can send this web request and then use that to just poke memory. Uh, and then I want an echo back. Keys and query string need to be encoded. If the key contains an equal sign, it'll be encoded as a percent three db. Um, and a query string with that key and value c. Okay, this function will uh, URL decode the query string into a equals b equals c, but then will be split by equal sign as a value bc. I don't think that's the case, right? I mean, it does no processing on equals, right? It does, like, I, that's why I'm confused. Decodes a percent first and tries to... Per It'll process the equals later. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I thought you meant in that function itself. Okay, I agree with you there. All right, um, this should be enough code here for us to make that into an arbitrary poke. Um, send some HTML CGI. We can honestly probably do that. Um, all we need to do is pass a null terminated string. Basically, these, this is, these are all the bytes that we have to work with here. We don't have that much space. Um, I don't think the side effects really matter in here. I'm guessing we can just replace all of these bytes. Um, yeah, we got a couple knobs here. Branch and link to URL decode. And then nop. Store some shit to the stack. I don't think any of that shit will matter. So basically, I'm trying to figure out if I can do a peek and a, a poke at the same time here. Um... I mean, I guess I would want to do them separately, but basically we'll need to call a like sprintf. Oh wait, this does do a printf. Oh, thank God, dude. So this function actually takes a string. Oh, nice, dude. Nice. Okay, so all we need to do is a branch and link. So we need four bytes. Uh, we need to load the local 1c, that's two bytes. We need to get an address of something that we want to print. And then we just need to deref a thing into, eight, uh, into R2. Uh, but we should. So let's, um... Chat, I think we figured out enough to get arbitrary control of this printer. Oh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good, chat. Are you excited? All right, how long is it gonna take me to make a post request? Um, function calls at one see a bond name, bond note as an argument. We'll do equals processing. Oh yeah, probably, probably something like that. I don't give a fuck. I don't fucking care. <laughs> um. Okay, how do I send a form data? <laughs> View source. Um, copy is curl. Where the fuck do you see that? Where do you see that? <sighs> oh boy. Damn, why can't I copy it as a... Uh... <clears throat> Is this the right one? Bond name. Oh, and then these are...
bond name, and then this can handle multiple things. So if we only send one, we probably can just affect only that one. Copy as request? Yeah, that's what I really want. Um, make their peak poke. Um, we're gonna actually call this a uh, super peak poke. Um, if anyone gets that reference, I'm proud of you. The Super Smash player peak poke. Nope. 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 That is not the reference. Um, okay, so we're gonna do um, requests. <laughs> Poggers Gamosa stream, hell yeah. Request dot, what is this, a post? Is this a post? I'm guessing this is a post. Um. Okay, where's the where's the docs, dude? Quick start. Oh yeah, give me the quick start. Post. Uh, data equals. Set info colon zero. All right, is that is that good? We'll just do get info. Let's try this. Uh, print uh, r equals this r dot. Fuck off, chat. I don't know how to do this. This is hard. Uh, text. Fuck you. Mm, how do I tell it to ignore that? How do I say insecure? Verify equals false. Oh my god, we got hackers in chat. Wow, a lot of a lot of people in here using invalid certs. Did that work? Yeah, that did work. Thank fuck. Uh, okay. Um, how do I shut this up? Okay. Um,. Hmm. Error index. I I know I need the authorization header. Um. Okay. Advanced usage. We're gonna do advanced usage. Um, something like that. Um, I'm guessing I can do s dot post, something like that. Um, can I shut up verify? Okay, uh, let's see how I do that. I'm just gonna randomly guess here. Oh my god, I'm such a good hacker. Oh my god, I'm such a good fucking hacker. Um... It's 
Saying importing URL lib3 shuts that up? It doesn't. How, how do I shut that up? Sick. We did it, chat. We did a get request. Error. Uh, display. Warning network update info. That looks pretty good. I think we did it, right? Is that is that where we're getting right now? Let's see. This is a uh, get info zero. What's our response? Okay. Uh, maybe it's just because I had that page open. I don't fucking know. Um, you want other you want other shit, dude? You want other headers? Um, uh, we have basic. We have get info. Is it form info? Is that the problem? We have a post request. Uh, none of that shit should matter. Oh, content type URL encoded. Get info should be in request data, not in headers. Oh, yeah, why the fuck did I put it in headers? XD, dude. Um, and data is equal to get info zero. And that makes sense to not have that as a header. Okay. Okay. Hey! 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 Uh, okay. Um, hmm. How do I pretty print XML? Perfect. This looks great. Let's just let's do this. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, oh. That's just, that's just gorgeous. That's just beautiful, dude. Oh! Oh! Oh, shit! Her HS, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime! Yeah, don't forget your Twitch Primes uh, are free or something. I don't know. I, I don't really care. Use your Twitch Prime channel, whoever you want. <laughs> oh, oh, we did it. Okay, so then that means that theoretically we can call set info. Um, and then uh, it's just uh, assert r dot status is two hundred. It's going to be status, right? Status, status, code, code, value, status, response, error, status, check, status, uh, code, uh, status, co, status, co, status, code, status, code. Okay. Okay. Um, warning, network update info. Okay, okay, okay. So let's set the, now we want to set the bond name. So we'll set the bond name. I think uh, a good bond name would be James Bond. Uh, r.raise for status. Sick. Yeah, you can just call me a Python professional. Um, okay. Um, HTTP error, dwist, etc. All right. Okay, and and I would assume let's just go and figure out why we can't do this. Uh, printer's busy. Oh, I probably have it in a menu. I think it wants me to do a firmware update. No error. And now we have James Bond. Do 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 do. All right. So now that we got James Bond, um, sweet. Okay. So it looks like we should be good now. Okay. 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 Wow, chat, we are good hackers. 
now we can do get info afterwards, and now we can change it to James Bond with a D, and we should be able to get the result immediately. Nice, nice. And now you got, you got to you got to you got to try the classic chat, uh, where we just do like a lot of A's. Okay. So yeah, uh, honestly, printers on hackable streams are over. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning by. Uh, it just uh, it's just not possible to hack. Um, unfortunately, it's just too secure. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, the printer was too good. Yeah, um, they must have ASLR. Um, at least we tried. Yeah, yeah. Sad Pepe in chat feels feels bad, man. <laughs> XD. Um. Okay. Um. <laughs> Goodbye, chat. Didn't work. All right. Um. So, uh, what we need to do is modify this code. Um. Bond name. I don't think this is this code is ever going to get executed unless we run it ourselves. So we'll just clobber it, and we're just gonna do URL decode. That is going to yield in. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. AC stack 564, um, which is load this 504. So it's a 504 bytes off of the stack. Okay. So um, okay, here it is, right here. So we have a pointer, R2 is a pointer to the data that we just decoded. Okay. Um, I just want to, do I want to do peek or poke first? Oh, uh, chat, we're going to have to do math. We're going to have to do math, chat. Um... Actually, maybe we can get the assembler to do math for us. Blix, ret, and then a fall through, and this should be the next, the next thing down here. It's gonna do another URL decode call here. Okay. So we're gonna do we're gonna this one is gonna be the peak. Uh, we're de we're hex decoding the bond note. Um. So this is bond note, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see this, this. Okay, this is bond note. Oh, that's a nice clean address. Uh, let's see if we have a ARM compiler here. Um, um, hmm. Guess not. Um, pseudo cross dev. Um. Target arm v7 uh, unknown none arm v7 unknown num. Do I have to say el here? Little Indian. All right, that'll hopefully be fine. Um, no libc. We just need the assembler. So arm v7el uh, unknown none. Hopefully this works. We'll just uh, try and build that compiler quick. Um. Use multilib is no. I could actually set multilib and then it probably wouldn't matter. It's gonna be easy to do. Oh shit. Okay, we'll just say arm unknown none. Our arm unknown. Mm, I think I can just do arm dash none. Uh, let me see. What did I do for risk? Oh, I did risk v elf. Yeah, I probably want to do that. We'll just do, uh, we'll do arm, arm el dash elf. 
We'll just make sure we get a little Indian one. Use multi-lib as yes. Okay. Bin utils GCC new lib. Since we have um since we have multi-lib, we should be able to do both Indian this is. What's the meaning of none in arm none? It is the um uh vendor. Or sorry, unknown is the vendor. Uh the OS is none. Oh really? I can't do that? Oh, they must not have one for that. Unless it doesn't like arm e elf. Let's just say arm dash elf. <laughs> arm dash elf it should have. Unless I have to say the e, uh, ABI. Not that it matters in this case. So I'd, uh, I would hope I could just do arm elf and it'll just be fine, but maybe not. Um, um, usually it has same defaults, right? I can specify the whole triple, um, but I'm just kind of hoping that the defaults are fine here and that we can just do arm dash elf. Uh, target ABI is default, multi-lib is true, so we should be able to target basically anything on arm. The pointer PC var two points to the value after equals, and at zero terminates the value in place. Um, where do you where do you see the equals processing? I mean, I'm I'm assuming that this is just getting the value after the equals. That makes sense because it already is requesting the specific value. Zero terminates in place, uh, but it doesn't. The equals processing is on line 99. Yeah, I mean that makes sense, right? It's gonna it's gonna do that, and then it's not gonna null terminate in place because it's outputting to an output buffer, right? It never actually writes to source null term. Like, I, I'm pretty comfortable that literally URL decode is just the value after the zero, uh, after the equals, and it's just gonna URL decode it, throw it in that stack, and that's all that matters. We actually don't even care what it's intended to do, uh, because we're gonna modify the intention anyways. So, basically, we just need to write a little bit of ARM shell code here. Hopefully we can set the origin, um, but I don't know if you can. Um... How do you set origin? Can you just do dot org? Maybe you can. Because hopefully I can set the origin. Um, you can? Okay, thank fuck. All right, so basically we're gonna do um, shell code dot bin. We're gonna set the origin, uh, and that doesn't need to be bin, but whatever. Um, the origin is gonna be this. Uh, move shellcode.bin, shellcode.s, vim shellcode.s. Then we're gonna do, uh, we'll just temporarily just say assemble shellcode.s, and we should be able to object dump. We'll just do make file, all, uh, as, uh, shellcode.s, object dump d, uh, a dot out. Okay. Um, so we can see there's nothing in here. Let's just throw a knob in here. Looks good and cool. That is at the right origin. Fantastic. Okay, so then what that means is that we should be able to do our call to the printf style thing. So we need to load local 1c. And local 1c is, what is that value? Uh, is that negative 1, uh, negative hex 1c? LDR... I'm hoping that's negative one C R zero R two SP sub four 
And then load 1C off that. Okay. I might just copy that exact logic. I I'm guessing that's actually hex 1C. I, I, I would like to fucking know. Um, I would hazard it's 1C, but sometimes there's offsets from these and it's annoying. You're gonna make shellcode that literally executes the query parameter? Eh, I could, but um, it's just too constrained here. Well, it's not because we can just increase the size of that, right? Um, yeah, that might be a decent approach. Uh, we only have 512 bytes here on the stack, right? So we could basically set this to, we could set this to 512. And then we basically have 511 bytes because we get null terminated that we could send over. Um... That might be a decent way to do it. Um, I think I like that. It's so bad, it's good. Well, it just gives me more code. And then I can, like, local 1C. Um, I want to pass in local 1C as an argument. So that's really the only thing that I'm going to want to do is NX enabled on the stack. <laughs> Chat laugh at this guy. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um I think that's pretty good. So the the only thing that I'm going to want is probably this local 1C cuz local 1C is the key Local 1C is the key to me being able to, um, local 1C is basically the key to me being able to send a response. Um... I think I can backdoor this printer in 512 bytes is massive, dude. I think I can do it. I think I can write shellcode that binds a socket, listens, and fucking rips it. I'm pretty sure I we can literally just implement our own server in 510 bytes that gives us peaks and pokes. Um, and we can basically run the server in that uh, stack. So what we can do is disable interrupts and we should be able to just dump uh, basically all of RAM over that. So I can't control. Uh, we don't have a bug yet. We don't have a bug. I'm waiting for this compiler to finish. Uh, but yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to patch. We're going to patch. Uh, we'll set bond note. It just seems less used. Uh, bond note looks like it's putting out to this on the stack. Um, oh, fuck me, dude. Oh, it doesn't matter. We're not actually calling this function. Oh, GCC failed. I have arm elf AS, but I don't have arm elf GCC. Well, that's fine. We'll just write it in fucking assembly. Um... Okay, so what we need to do is we need to 
patch this to jump to the stack. R1. Um, and it looks like R1 is preserved. No. R1 is clobbered. Fuck me. Um, so we can just do this logic again, right? Uh, load relative, this, and that's 504. Uh, load relative that, add that to SP. That'll give us a pointer to the thing. Um, and then just jump R1, right? So all we have to do is just, we just have to do that. Um, I mean, we can just do it down here, I guess. We can just literally just turn that into, we could just turn this into a Blix. Oh, yeah. Uh, do we want 1C? Honestly, I, I'd take an address to myself since we're on the stack. Um, we'll just, we'll just Blix to R2 here. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna turn this into a Blix R2. Because it, it's load it's loading the address of this thing, but we'll just Blix R2. Uh and then we literally change nothing. We we change like one bit of assembly, and then all of this stays the same in case for some reason it's fucking fundamentally critical to the operation of this. But then instead of branching to this function, it's gonna branch to the uh it's gonna branch to that that note value. Um, and it'll actually pass ourselves an address to where we are. Uh, technically, we can derive that from SP, but it's always nice to get an address to where you branch to, so that's pretty nice. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Um, and then all we want to do is set the argument, this 10. Um... We just need to set this to a bigger size. And we can set that to FF um, easily. No page tables. Um, I think I can just set that to FF. I'm pretty sure we can do a web server in 254 bytes. That shouldn't be too difficult, in my opinion, right? So, okay. Here's, here's the patch. Uh, decompress at address this. Uh, set it equal to FF. That will set that to 250, uh, uh, move R2 255. So that will URL decode 255 bytes, not including the null terminator, so 254 bytes. So we'll get 254 bytes of shellcode, which should be plenty for a server. Plenty. Uh, depending on their API, but we'll see. Uh, we're going to have to do some constants and stuff, and uh, we'll make all our code pick and, and stuff. Um, I think I just want to write it in assembly. We could try and write it in C. Let me get a C compiler building just so we can build it in C if we need to. Uh, sudo uh, cross dev target. Um, arm. Okay. Arm non EABI should be fine. All right, so that will go. Yeah, I guess the arm elf, it doesn't like that. Well, this is still the, oh, I did arm non. Arm non EABI. It's gonna use new lib. Like, this should be the same. I don't understand why that wouldn't work. Maybe it needs to be stable. I've never had an issue with things not building. Web server in 254 bytes. <laughs> Sorry, not web server, a server. Um. And then, yeah, we'll see if we can write that in C. Uh, ARM is pretty easy to do pick, so we shouldn't have to write it in assembly, in my opinion. Uh, Blix. Uh, we're going to be branching. Uh, 
Um, so, Blix indirect. Um, So I think branch indirect. Um, yeah. That'll change modes, right? Based on the bottom bit. Yeah. Um, so the bottom bit is uncontrolled. I'm assuming the stack is aligned. So we're going to be branching into ARM code. This is going to be fun. Uh... I'm going to remove all of those targets that I scuffed. Um, clean that. Clean that. Oops. How many of these things did we try? Just trying to clean up this environment so I don't have so much shit. Wow, we tried a lot of things. <laughs> Clean that. Yep. And I think that was the first one we tried. L slash on user. Arm non EABI. I gotta get rid of that. Arm non EABI. Okay, so we have arm non EABI and risk v32 elf. Those are the only ones I need installed. Obviously, I don't need risk for this, but I had that before, and I want to keep it that way. Um, Blix. Jumping to arm. We'll want to probably transition to thumb pretty fast. We actually don't know if this processor supports ARM, do we? I mean, it, I think it. I think we saw ARM at the entry point at the reset vectors. Let's see here. Uh, load reg. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, it looks like we start in ARM. Okay, sweet. So this should support ARM. So uh, we change this ten here at DF four. Okay, so this is a uh, change um, move R2 uh, hex 10 into a move R2 hex OXFF. This is the size of the uh, shell code that we execute, uh, including null terminator. Thus, we get 254 bytes of arbitrary uh, data to execute. Okay. And then we're just waiting for that to build. I mean, technically, we can go and figure out how to do a Blix R2. Uh, one of these bits is just going to get cleared. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably, yeah, it's probably that 7. It's probably this turns into a 4.6. Um, I think you can patch stuff in Ghidra. I've actually never done it. Um, there's a way to assemble, if I'm not mistaken. I never fucking do it. We just want to make sure we get this right. Is it here? Patch instruction. Okay. Constructing assembler. Holy shit. How long does it take to make an assembler? Blix R3. Oh, that's inline. Okay. Blix R2. Uh, so it was a 9847, and now it's a, oh, it's a, oh, it's a 9047. Okay. So we patch this to a 90. Uh, okay. Uh, change Blix R3 to a Blix R2. Uh, this will cause us to jump into our shell code. All right, 
And it shouldn't affect anything other than we can't set that note anymore is going to be the net effect of that. All right. So let's just double check our patch. So this DF4, clearly that 10 is probably the case. Let's let's double check. Let's let's double check here. Patch instruction. F F. Yeah. So that byte changed, and then here, that byte changed the 90, and that is at E1C at E0. Looks good. So we have created those. Uh, so we can go and compress that now. Okay, we're not using once. All right, so now this is going to uh, basically compress that, and I'm going to shut down the printer. Ending. Okay. Okay. It takes a long time to shut down. Come on. Pull the power. I'm going to hold the start button to kind of clear it a little bit. Make sure everything's flushed out, get all the pixies out, and then uh, we can pop this chip in the programmer and plug our programmer in. Do, do, do. You know, I could use one of my new tweezers that I bought. All right, we'll try these blunt tips. Okay, that should be in there good. Let's boot our VM. Um... Okay, I'm gonna make sure that's all set up. Been a while since I checked out a Gamoza stream? Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while, Skip Witch. You gave up on us. All right, uh, we'll print, we'll plug this in. Okay, we got the Windows sound, so that's good. Uh, let's go with this. All right, so we are going to... I'm going to delete all of these. And then... That has been compressed. And we fit within... If we didn't fit in the right size, it would have failed anyways. And now I can go into uh, Canon Compressor, Python M, HTTP Server. Okay, we're serving up that firmware, so I should be able to go into here. Uh, 192, 192.this. Our firmware, save that. Looks good, it's there, so we're gonna load our firmware here, and then we're going to program our flash. Okay, so we are now uh, setting that up, and I'm going to double check that our firmware is the correct one by looking at the SHA-256 C1C. Okay. SHA-256 SOM of our firmware. C1C. Totally, totally good. Three bytes is good enough. Is the upload firmware web page, if any, unusable now? Uh, probably not. I mean, maybe. It doesn't really matter. I don't give a shit. Um, all right. So we're just waiting for that to flash. This should have the modifications that give us arbitrary code execution. Uh, by We now blix to R2. And we have more bytes that we control after the URL decode. There's no constraints to this URL. As long as we do percent-based encoding... Unless there's a length limitation on what we pass in, we should just be able to do percent and hex encode our entire thing and ship it in. So that is the plan. Hopefully there's no length limitation on that. If there is, it's going to be kind of hard to know. It's just going to, like, not work. Uh, but I think it's just going to work because we're just going to fucking nail it, chat. We're just going to nail it. 
We're still building that compiler, so we're not bottlenecked on anything. We're probably gonna have to do uh, we're probably gonna have to do the Richard Strat on the printer. So programmed. All right. What is this program? This is XG Pro. What's the Richard Strat? Uh, Richard is uh, our hero, and Richard helped us unbrick our printer by telling us to hold the power button. Uh, Richard told us to hold the power button for a while to reset the printer um, to a known good state after like a power loss. So we got the chip in my new tweezers. I actually can't see uh, what I'm showing you guys. Uh, oh, oh. Oh, you know what? Here, we'll we'll do a we're gonna do a high quality stream here. You ready? You ready, chat? Here, here we go. There we go. There's the there's the chip. There's the chip that has all of the data's in there. It's so ready. All right, we're gonna pop that in. Okay. All right. Now, um, we have programmed that. We've hacked and modified the printer. Um, all right. And now uh, let's plug in the printer and hopefully it boots. If it doesn't boot, we'll have to Richard it. Uh, sweet, it boots. No Richard needed. Wait, or it just doesn't boot at all. Okay. Um, it's just not booting at all. I'm guessing I just socketed it poorly. Um, let's see. Come on. There we go. It's booting. Nice. I just didn't have the. Uh, I didn't have it socketed. All right, so we should be good. Uh, compiler still building GCC right now. All right, I'm not allowed to Twitch gamble. Wait, we have a gamble going on? Uh, not possible to change Blix to BL and keep everything? I mean, technically I could. Um, I don't really care, to be honest. Um, I don't really care. <laughs> TLDR, I don't really care. Um, that was just an easier patch. And now that it's shipped and it takes, you know, a couple minutes to patch it over anyways, uh, we'll just leave it. Oh, can we use this patch to dump memory? Oh, wait, we have a, ch we have a, we have a bet? Ah, uh, fuck, I missed it. Is it a poll? Is the poll over? 15 points in the poll. Oh, shit. Shit, I missed it. God, I'm a terrible streamer. Um... It's a bet. It's over, unfortunately. Too slow. Oh, fucking rip, dude. Fucking rip. We're still waiting for this compiler. We can't really do anything until this compiler's ready. Uh, oh, well, we can just start writing code ahead of time. All right, chat, uh, let's do this. Uh, we're gonna search for select. Uh, select? What the fuck am I doing? Chat, keep me in line, damn it. All right, um, so we're gonna search for... Um, um, Socket. All right, chat, what are the four things we need? F four, five? What are the five things we need to create a server? Five? One, two, three, four. Oh, maybe six, something. I, we need things. We just need stuff in general. Oh, nice. 
Oh, this has everything we need. Uh, one one. Oh, this this is just beautiful. It's literally just gonna tell me. Um, yeah, we need socket to create a socket. We need bind. We need listen. We need accept, and we need close. That's five. All right, and we should be able to get all of them. And then one one six. Uh, is that v4 sock stream IP proto TCP? Can someone check? Socket bind listen except read write close. Yeah, we'll need read and write too. All right. So this is socket. Um. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Canon. Uh, Super Peak Poke. Vim. Um, shell code dot C. Int. Main void. We're not actually gonna have a main. We're just gonna call this void. Start doesn't matter. It's just fucking data, anyways. Um, we're gonna have. Uh, man socket. And let's do int socket. Uh, int domain, int type, int protocol is equal to this. Uh huh. And then we can do socket. Um, One one six. Okay, uh, we should have an arm. We don't have new lib yet, but this should be fine. GCC uh, shellcode.c. This is obviously not going to be happy. We'll just uh, void cast that, and then um, make another stream term and do this. Okay. Okay, and then we'll do uh, uh, arm non EABI GCC uh, shell code. Uh, we'll do a wall where uh, shell code dot C. Okay. Non. Perfect, and then we'll do uh, f freestanding, um, no standard lib, no standard ink. Okay, so then what we should be able to do, that actually made an elf fantastic. Um, okay, let's just throw in a dash g in here. Uh, then we'll do an object dump, uh, D, it out, out, doesn't really matter yet, we'll just do this, okay. Alright, that looks fine, um, it is definitely an arm mode, but that's fine, and then we have a BX, so we're setting up the arguments here, and we branch to that, okay, so we should, should be pretty good there, and, uh, we have a... Here's the address, basically, that we're branching to. So I'll load PC relative for that, and that's pretty good here. Um, all right. <laughs> it's reference to unsaved blocks in Rust. I mean, technically, we could write this in Rust. There's no reason we couldn't write this in Rust. Um... Don't you need thumb? No, we're actually branching to arm mode here. Okay, so then, um, get adder info. Uh, then we need a bind. Um, so, uh, struct adder info. Let's just do, um, foo. Um, let's see if we even have that. Yeah, we're not going to be able to get those headers. 
I don't think Newlib has these headers, which kind of sucks. Um, but we basically need to... What do we need to set here? Does zero to, we need to set the family, I think. But but I think we should be relatively fine with zeroed out. Okay, so we'll go into bind. Bind here. Bink. Okay, and then bind, uh, and bind. This is an int sock fd, uh, a void address, and a sock len t. It's probably a size t. We're on 32, but so it shouldn't really matter. Adder len. So we're gonna bind uh, int fd. We're gonna bind to, oh, we'll just call this socket. Uh, bind, um, uh, char adder 20 bytes is zeroed. Is it hex 20 or 20? Hex 20. So we'll hex 20 that, uh, then we'll pass in the address and then size of adder. It's not perfect, but we'll clean that up. Just want to make sure this builds and it's all good. Bind. Implicit declaration of bind. Mm. Size T. We'll just say int. It doesn't really matter here. Okay. Um, we're zeroing out that structure. And what are we at for bytes here? Maybe we do want to go thumb. Well, I guess we haven't optimized it yet. Let's do that. Let's optimize this for size. OS. Um, okay, that wants to use mem sets. Um, I thought F freestanding would nuke that, actually. Um, this implies F no built in. That's really weird. What? What? Does flag order matter? No. Huh. Let's just try this. F no built in uh, mem set. Oops. F no built in mem set. That's so fucking weird. Huh, I, there might not be a way to turn it off. Huh. 
Don't you have an address for Memset and the firmware? Yeah. Um, I just didn't want to do it. <laughs> like, but yeah, we can just call B0, right? Here's B0. Um, nine one four, yep. Oh, yeah, and we need to make sure that we get the thumb mode correctly. Ah, yes, that is actually plus one. Okay. So we know that our call to socket needs to be a plus one. Um, and our call to bind is probably our B0. Looks like B0 is actually arm. No, that's thumb. Right? Fuck. Um, assume T mode is one. We can just look at the T mode, I guess. B zero. That's def. This is definitely arm. That's not thumb too. Um, and bind, the fuck was bind? Bind, definitely thumb. Okay. Um, nice. Uh, we need to initialize that on the stack, and that is a struct, a struct sock adder. Um, requires those, yeah, you must supply those, yeah, dom, dom, uh, mem set, or sorry, uh, b0 adder for hex 20, All right, let's do that, okay. B0 that, blah, 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 blah. That looks pretty good. Um, so now we need to set... Um, so I think we'll have to set the family. But everything else, zero, might be fine. Well, we'll want to set the... Uh, we'll want to set the family. And we'll want to set the um, port. I think that's all we need to do. Um, man, inet. Is that a fixed structure shape? Can I just define that structure? Let's see what it does here. Bind, where the fuck was it? Bind here, we B0, then this probably sets it up. That looks like it's doing basically byte swaps on the whole address. Um, so I don't know which offset. Yeah, I don't know which offset is going to be the port, but that should be all that really matters. I need to set up those things. Uh, let's grab Let's go and grab the other functions that we're gonna need. Let's grab accept, uh, and we'll also need listen. Here we go, uh, listen. All right, so we're just gonna grab all these. Once again, this is in thumb. I feel like the odds that we get this right first try is gonna be fucking low, uh, but we'll see. One E seven B zero eight. This is listen. 
uh, int sock fd, int backlog, and then we'll have accept. Here, um, accept sock fd, uh, void star and a, yeah, void star adder and an int pointer to the length. And then this is found at 1e7 fba. Okay. So socket bind accept uh, uh, source hex 20. Uh, listen on socket. We'll do a backlog of five like they do. We'll do a referent, uh, just source is fine here. And then a an int. Um, it's trash, but adder len is equal to. Um, size of source, and then a ref to Adderlin for accept. Okay, and then let, uh, int uh, clients is equal to this, and then we just want to blast out a send here. Subsys send. Let's find xrefs on this. Okay, no xrefs on that. Xrefs, here we go. Send right here. Send sock fd, man, send. Um, void buff, int len, int flags. And this is at. 1 e8 e56 okay and then we'll send client uh apples uh seven bytes and zero okay all right so we have code um Load R4. Where's the other addresses? Is it doing ads to derive these other addresses? What? What? BX. Okay, I'm confused because I don't have like all the data here. Um, text. We do have a data section. Well, it does rip rel, which makes sense. Um, but I th think it expects the hmm, A8 and AC. Okay. BXR3, load R4. R4 is PC156, which is A8. So you're going to branch to this. This is the address. Yeah, this is the address of data. Shit. Um, this is why I like to not do things as uh, C. Um, um, let's see. I don't want to make a linker script. So 
Is that gonna do it? Yes. Perfect. Um, s int um, int replace with static int. There you go. Add 2048. Yeah. Uh, so there's probably no longer a data section. Um, sorry. In. Oh my god. Uh, text section and RO data in the same load section. Good. So now it is doing what I what I thought it was doing before, where it's basically going to load a like address that's in the ballpark of what we want. So this is going to load ADBC, uh, which is this this two CC. Um, this is for B zero. So it load yeah, it literally just loads the P B zero and calls it. And then next, it will load ADC0, uh, which is this, uh, 1E7. And then it's adding 800 to that. Um, and then it probably adds, yeah, another uh, C plus 1 is 13. So this is now, this should be standalone. There's no longer another section. That is better. OK. Um, all right. Um, socket 116. We're assuming that 116 is correct, but we don't know if it is. I mean, they say this is a TCP server 116. I'm going to trust their numbers. Yeah, 6 is for sure TCP. I'm going to use 116. Uh, and then we're going to bind. So we B0, 20 hex bytes. So they're using 20 hex bytes for the address. Uh, they zero it out. Uh, get address info, which we're not going to be able to do. Um, listen. SOC 5. That should be fine. Bind address so we basically just need to set i think the port so we just need to find where a port is set and we also need to set uh probably the family so we don't know for sure if we need to set the family but uh i'm going to assume that we probably need to so we're going to find people who call bind here's a call to bind uh, DCFF 0100. Um, is that setting an 01 on the family and then the port? An FFDC? Let's see what else we got here. Um, here, uh... Well, this looks good. I think this is fine. 116, yep. 20 hex bytes allocated, zeroed out. Uh, and then these stores. We're just going to copy these and then fill in a port. And then that, that address can just be whatever. Um, OK. What? It's floating? Oh. So, I guess we can just go look at what this is, uh, sin port. Uh, this is uh, adder info in. Uh, sorry, um, socket or in. Let's just look at the shape of that. We can just define that structure, to be honest. Uh, we'll do struct. Sock adder in. Uh, looks like a sin family, which is a, a short. It's an SA family T. Then we have a sin port. 
we have a uh, int, which is a sin adder, and then uh, int a uchar for 16. We gotta pad it out the rest of the way. Looks like 16 bytes. So that was uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then, yeah, we need 16 bytes here. Okay, so now what we should be able to do is we can actually get rid of that B0. Uh, and we can just say uh, uh, struct socketer, socketer in. Socketer in adder. We'll say adder.sin family is one. Adder.sin port is uh, equal to. Let's just do a byte swap of like. I don't know if we have bytes, so we'll just say 4100. Um, adder.sin adder is zero, and then the rest can probably just be left uninitialized. And then here we have ref address now. This is client address. Uh, this is ref client adder. This is client adder. Something like that, right? Uh, yeah, we have no void. Oh, sorry, semi. So this should total up to eight plus 16 is 24 plus four more. That gets us to our, wait, what? 16, do I want 10 hex? We'll just say eight. That's AF local, yeah. Um, so this actually needs to be. Looks like uh, OX801. Is that correct? I guess the eight is the lowest. This is 108. You want hex 20? Oh, yeah, sorry. That makes sense. Um, you have eight there. Uh, is it 108? Is that actually correct? So eight is the bottom. That's going to be stored at the lowest byte. And then it's a one, which is the next. That looks good. Um, so let's see. I don't know if 108 is actually correct. And then we have the port. Um, and it looks like that is at, yep, sin port. Sin family, sin family plus one. Yeah. So 108. Um, is it actually 108 on the host? Let's do a GCCE. Uh, let's do printf. Include sys socket dot h. Um, AF init. Two. Yeah, so they might just have different numbers, to be honest. But so we're just gonna copy what they're doing. Clearly it's an eight and a one. Yeah, it's two. Um one is AF local. Yeah, I don't know what the 108 is to be honest. But that's definitely what they're setting it to be. Um and then the ports, uh this is technically uh, gonna get Endian swap, so port 41 um would be uh port 65. Let's go to a little bit higher. Ah, 65 is probably fine. We can probably bind that. Address zero and then bind, listen, and then accept. We don't have to zero that out, I don't think. I don't think we have to zero these things out. Well, that's initialized. Accept and then send apples to the client. Um, 
That looks fine. Go to hex 45. Um, and Indian wise, that should be correct. All right. Is that port in use? I think that port's going to be in use, actually. Isn't that uh, DHCP? 67, 68. We'll go to, we'll go to 145. Um, so in theory, uh, we should be able to object copy. Um, what is it? Um, it's like output bin, some other shit, keep on, uh, like, oh, binary only section. Here, I found it, uh, dot text. A dot out, A dot bin, make. So A dot bin is our code and it fits just barely, but that is our shell code. We didn't really optimize it to be small. We don't really give a shit. We're not even using thumb, mainly because we knew the 250 byte limit was not going to be a big problem. Go to 4444 4, 4, 4, so there's no ending this issues. Okay. Eight. Yep, 108. Port address zero. Bind. Now that's probably gonna be a blocking call. Um, we should honestly maybe have it send something the other way. I don't know how this is gonna behave when we do a blocking call, uh, but whatever. Okay, so what we should be able to do is, um, We'll just make our own URL. Can we, is, is there a URL encode in URL lib? Probably. Um, open a.bin rb.read URL lib 3.quote plus. Uh, print this. Oh, dot parse. Mm. Do I have to? Im yeah, I have to pull that in. Oh, fuck off. Oh, you're a lib. Okay. That looks valid. Right? That looks fine. And then what what did we actually patch? We patched whatever this does here. Um Bonote. What font are you using? I have no idea. It's just the default one. Okay, we can close those. So, we want to do a set info. Oh, we do it up here. So we want to do a bond note. And then this is the shell code. Okay. Okay. So this is going to send up that shell code as the bond note. Um What's 45 what's uh 0145 Python 145 325 
If you're passing data, it'll already do it. Really? You sure? Okay. Okay, dude. Uh, to me, that's just another failure point. NC. What's the IP of this fucking thing? Uh, 192.168.101.59. 325. Okay, rejected. Okay, and did we brick it? Uh, did it crash? It's responsive. Um, oh. Sick. This, this. It's, it's still running. Um, oh, it's not going to bind again. Uh, what the fuck did we send? The fuck did we send, dude? What was our... Apples. Oh, yeah, that's gonna be in data. Right? Um, yeah. Like, that totally worked. There's no way that this gave us garbanzo beans. There's no way this gave us garbanzo beans if it didn't fucking work, because we definitely made a connection. Obviously, it's fucking gone now, right? Um, and I think we're on a thread. But that's fine. It's probably preemptive. Okay, let me see if I can reboot it. We'll shut it down. Um, what's the correct thorough, 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 thorough way of closing a socket? Um, we can't just call close, I don't think. Let's see who calls bind. Shut down and close. If you close, does that imply shut down? If you like close. I think we can go to another window for this now. Uh, close fail. We could also do a reuse adder and shit too. Um, so this is close. Just call exit. Um, check where your apples are in memory. Oh, they're they're definitely in data. Um, like, if we just look at a.bin, there's no apples in here. And if there's no apples in a.bin, then we're not sending it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So, uh, if I close, can I rebind it right away? Or do I have to shut down? Let me see if they even have shut down. It sent some bytes after the shellcode? Yeah, it sent us shit off the stack, right? That's what it is. This is just random shit on the stack. Um, I see no shutdown in here. So we're just gonna have to do close. Reuse adder would be very useful in those cases. You can't rebind. Even if you close it. I always forget the fucking rules. Um... I mean, we can just do a reverse shell, then. Let's just do a reverse shell. Um, I think it's just better anyways. It actually reduces the code size. Uh, so we'll get rid of that. We'll get rid of listen. Uh, we'll get rid of that. Accept. Uh, basically, all we're going to do is make a socket, and then we're going to call connect. Um, connect.
Subsystem connect. Connect. Here we go. Uh, connect. Dude, that works first try. I can't fucking believe it, dude. Oh, we're so fucking smart, dude. A4, yep. God, we're so fucking smart. Um... Sock FD, void adder, int adder len. This is just better. Uh, and then we just connect on sock uh, adder, adder len, uh, which is just size of adder. Much better. This will be smaller. This is just better in so many fucking ways. And then we can do a send to sock. Uh, and then we'll just find a string, um, somewhere in the code. Just find a string, just a null terminated string. Doesn't really matter what it is. Doesn't really matter what it is. We're gonna get wick get status. That's gonna be the one, dude. Okay. Um, how many bytes is that? 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 bytes. We'll send 14 bytes from there. Okay. Um, yeah, now we're much smaller. And then uh, let's do a close on that as well. Let's just get that going. Sub, sys, close. I want to be able to throw this many, 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 many times, right? Um, so here's close. Um, son of a bitch, dude. Ghidra has such a fucking scuffed clipboard. What the ever-loving fuck is this clipboard in Ghidra? It, like, works only the second time. Uh, then we'll close sock. Alright, there we go. Connect, uh, socket connect. Probably should set up some shit here. Um, port 4501, that's fine. Then address, IPA. Uh, someone do that in their head. Uh, 0201, uh, AO. Is it AO or something AO? Ugh. Um, address to U32 online. Come on, address to U32 IP. Converter online. Son of a bitch. Um, IP address converter. Oh my god, dude. Um, hex 192.168.1.2. Converts. Okay, uh, it's this. C0 A8 O102. All right, um, and that should just work, right? We initialize address, uh, size of address provided, make. So I should be able to NCL on whatever that, uh, 325. Oh, fuck off. Um, let's go to 1145. Yeah, 4421. Okay, 1145. Make Python super peak poke. Son of a bitch. No good. Did I shut it down? Oh, ending. Oh, the printer is not happy. Uh, so I just hard powered it off. It'll come back up. All right, we're booting. We're booting. 4421. All right. Here we go. 
Come on. I don't even know if the web server's up yet or what. Um. Okay. Can you move the video? Sure. It's just always going to be in the way. Welcome to fucking streaming, dude. Um, so, why is that not working? OX1145. Oh, I'm going to have to change that Indian, aren't I? Oh, shut up, printer. 0201A8C0. Yeah, because that will get stored in the correct order. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and that was the problem. Hey! Wick get status? Hey! Okay, so that just works. Um, nice. And we can throw it multiple times. We can throw it multiple times. Okay. Uh, I mean, it worked twice. Uh, printer rebooted, so, um, okay, um, so I guess we could do, like, if sock is greater than, uh, what's the actual... Um, on error negative one, we'll just say if it's greater than zero, and we're going to say if this is greater than zero, and send and close. Just to shut it up a little bit. Negative one, yeah. So negative one is the correct. On error, negative one is returned. Um, and then connect. Error value for connect is negative one. Uh, so if it's not equal to negative one, and if this is not equal to negative one, um, so if we created a, a socket successfully, if we connected successfully, then send close in any other, in all other conditions. Correct? Chat, you agree with that? If it's not equal to negative one. So now we will only do these things if it's successful, just in case they have some wishy-washy shit. Um, now, you know, we're doing some stuff to the stack, and like, yeah, it might not be happy, but, you know, it's fine. So let's, uh, what is it, capital L, listen harder, or something like that? Okay, so one's good. Next one. Good, next one, good, next one, next one, not happy, meh, okay, I'll we'll rebind, okay, and I think it rebooted, see manual, Oh, we got we got like a little a uh, little dance light party here, and it seems to be pretty unhappy with that. Uh, support code, you know. Printer error occurred. Yeah, okay. We'll unplug it and plug it back in. Reboot it. I don't know why. Um. Um, I don't know, like, I feel like it should be going fast enough that it shouldn't give too many shits, in my opinion, but, um, okay, so...
I'm gonna see if I can do one meg. I might have to do it in pieces, right? Might have to do it in chunks, might have to handle partial sends, all those sorts of things. Just gonna start with the basics. Ah, you piece of shit. I wonder if I can't transmit null. Let's try four. I don't know if it's dead or sending. Printer seems fine. It died. It rebooted though. I'll run this again. I don't need this second poke. Lordy fucking da! Thank you very much. Sh shit, chat. Um. Let's try null again. But my guess is there's probably a null check. I'm rebooting it. I'm gonna reboot it and hard power it off every time we do one of these tests. I just want to make sure that it's fully uh, kind of refreshed. But I, I think they probably have a null check on send. Um, was I going to try it? Try a null again. Here we go, uh, null, let's go. Uh, dead. Dead? Okay, we'll let it reboot. Maybe sometimes the stack's just in a fuck state. Um, we do technically use the stack. It's rebooting. Try it again. Yeah, yeah. Quit whining, printer. Yeah, it's probably booted enough. There we go. Uh, zero. Okay, um... I think we just can't transmit null. So we'll transmit four, and then we'll try 128 megs minus four. So that's all of RAM minus four. Make bank. <laughs> it's not very happy right now. I don't know if it's working. I don't know if the web server's accepting requests. I don't know if it died. Okay. I think it's up. Oh! Oh, it was sending it, baby. Oh! Mamma Mia Pizzeria! The <laughs> yup, it was sending. <laughs> I think it just rebooted. Uh, I'm gonna refresh it. It's not very happy. Okay, I think it rebooted.
We're definitely running in a thread, which I don't like. Um, but it, it's fine. It's like probably ballpark fine here. Do 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 do. Nah, we're not watching this file. We're suffering here. We're fucking edging right now. Edging so fucking hard right now. Oh, God. It might not be doing anything right now. The printer's alive. Fucking Wi-Fi, dude. Oh, come on, dude. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. I'm losing. I'm losing faith. Ah. Uh, okay. Uh, it was good that I lost faith. Losing faith was the correct thing there. There we go. This one's gonna be going... No, unless it's not flushing it, but it's hard to say. Okay, it just rebooted. There we go. Let's fucking go. You son of a bitch. Oh, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's going. Um, want to watch the numbers? Too bad. Halfway. And then it will close. It'll get flushed. Now the printer's doing stuff right now. Um, so we'll maybe see if we can disable interrupts. But I would suspect if we disable interrupts, it's not going to work. Should be close. Complete. Okay. God, I can't believe we like got that so fucking easy. I I like I expected two, three hours of debugging. Like, why doesn't this why doesn't this code work? Why doesn't our why doesn't our socket work? God damn, dude. Easy as fuck. Z z z z z problem. Yeah, so this is all a RAM, so there's gonna be a bunch of shit in here. Um so we could try to disable interrupts, but my, my guess is that the, uh, the Wi-Fi will just not work. Uh, I suspect it will, like, the Wi-Fi will just not work without interrupts, and that's pretty common. Now, we have probably a good enough dump to actually, like, fuzz something or look into stuff here. So all we need to do is go into Canon. Gonna go into the Canon. We're gonna go into our Super Peak Poke. We're gonna open RAM.bin. We're gonna say that this is arm v7 little endian, and then we're gonna say this is loaded at four, uh, and this is RAM. Okay. So, the top address, don't analyze it yet. Undefined instruction. Yep, so it doesn't have reset vectors, but there's the re uh, those are vectors. Um, and then we should have all the way up to 7FFFFF, and everything is filled in now. Everything is filled in. Um, 
Nice. Let's, uh, let's see. Analyzing this will take a long time. But, uh, we can actually go... Now we can go to one of these functions that we know does some dumb shit. I don't know, one of these functions that does dumb shit. I don't know, like this one? Oh yeah, this one looks dumb. Um, because this does globally stuff. So we should be able to go here, and that function should exist. It might not be created yet, so don't worry about it. Uh, we're just gonna say, oops. Uh, we're just gonna say, I think I just wanna create a function here. Oh, can't yet. Uh, we'll just disassemble this. We know it's thumb here. Right? BDF3? BDF3? Unless they relocate stuff and move stuff around. What? BDF3? Or B5F3? Here we go. Yeah, B5F3, F12, disassemble his thumb. Oh, is it just not... Is it just because it's doing other shit? I feel like I should be able to disassemble it. I mean, that's clearly the function here. Um... Entropy, overview. Come on, Ghidra, rip it in there. Rip it in there, Ghidra. Find all of the things. Let's see how much code it finds. I mean, this is literally RAM. He just still processing other things. Yeah, that makes no sense that I can't fucking disassemble this while I'm doing shit. It's ridiculous to me. Oop, it found it found the function before. Disassembling. Disassembling. Code flow. The compiling shit, it, like, with whole RAM dumps, you often get things where it gets stuck on functions just because there's so much stuff to reference. Alright, chat, how do we dump that null address? Only, only good, creative, correct answers here. There's a specific answer I'm looking for here. Not everyone in chat's gonna know. Because some context from old streams matters. Even this stream. How do we dump null, chat? How do we dump null? Nope. Not that. Not copy to stack. Nope. Nope. More creative. We're not adding any code. Add four bytes to what? To size? It's repeating. Oh, do we have memory aliases? All right, chat. All right, chat. Well, we need to prove this. So to prove this, because we uh, hypothesized that we do have aliases, so we're going to say... 128 times 1024 times 1024 times 1. So we're going to dump this. Make, save as RAM. This is RAM 1. Okay, make, go. Okay, data's coming in. And basically, we're going to diff these, and we're going to find how much RAM repeats itself. So we're basically now basically mapping out memory in the device. So we're going to see here. This is dumping. It hasn't crashed. My guess is it's probably, they probably repeat RAM many, many, many times. I'm surprised they're able to dump this all over Wi-Fi in one fucking send. I am, Im I am thoroughly impressed. 
This is gonna be really easy to hack when we can just do fucking sockets like that. God damn. Uh, that is complete all bytes in. Okay, so now we're gonna do times two. Mmm, RAM 2 bin. Boom. Uh, it's gonna have to reboot first. You're good, printer. You're good. I, I know we just spent about 30 seconds handling a web request, and you probably aren't, aren't very happy about that. That's totally acceptable. Yep, rebooted. All right, so this is RAM 2. Here we go. Okay, it hasn't started yet. Oh, it started. Here we go. Data's coming in. Didn't compile it? Son of a bitch. Did I not? Did I not compile it? Well, it will kill it. Fuck it. Take that, chat. Come on. Oh, it's finding code. It's analyzing functions. Nice, dude. I'm pretty sure RAM just repeats, but I don't know to where. We've seen 18. Uh, so w this is dumping, uh, so we did zero, we did, we did zero, we did 10, uh, or sorry, we did zero, eight, this is 10, we're doing 18 next. Okay, done, now, Wait for it to reboot. Um, three. We might have to just throw a new command, but whatever. We'll see if it, uh, yeah, it's gonna have to reboot. Oh, it got mad. I'm hoping that it doesn't repeat past 20 million. Waiting for it to shut down. We might have to hard boot it. Okay, unplugging, plugging it in, powering it on. All right, we're good. We don't have to Richard it. This is RAM 3. Bump. Come on. Not coming through right now. Uh, printer, Wi-Fi, something might not be up and running yet. Uh, looks like it's maybe initializing. Let's uh, let's just maybe re-throw it. Come on. Nope, it's unhappy. Um, uh, okay. Huh. 
Okay, are we gonna see if that uh, reboots normally here? Otherwise, we might just want to crash it intentionally at the end. Um, I don't know how to crash the printer, to be honest, so it might be pretty hard. Come on, disassemble this function. What is this one? That looks fun. Come on, disassemble this. Nope. Creating strings. There it is. There it is. So this should be this, right? Page, app, send some HTML, like all of this shit. So we're mainly looking for the dynamic dispatch. Uh, one of the first things it does is dynamic dispatch. Uh, looks like this. Local 1C plus this. This is a pointer. 1D5. Oh, we don't have 1D5. Uh, 1D5 is the same as... Um, what's D minus 8? What's D minus 8, chat? D minus 8. I should know that. It's 5. Uh, 5. Uh, 5C1040. So this is the what that actually points to okay and then it goes hex 18 on that um, so plus 10 plus 18 so this uh what OXDB9A2C. This is what it... Oh, it derefs that again, doesn't it? Yeah, let's uh, let's have this propagated as a constant. We'll just mark this as non-writable memory. Okay, and now this will say this... Um, yeah, let's... Uh, oh, let's see if that rebooted. Um, unless I want to ship up a different payload. I don't know if that send will flush, uh, but I'm kind of tempted to... Basically, I need to figure out how often memory repeats. I think it's safe to say, I mean, we don't know, we haven't looked at these dumps. I would hazard that RAM 1 is the same as RAM 2. Uh, like, are these the same? Yeah, so clearly RAM repeats, right? Even at the end, they're pretty much the same. Wow. I'm pretty impressed. Um, okay, so given that... RAM repeats there. I just want to figure out how much it repeats. I guess let's go for something crazy. Let's go for like, um, OX78121234. Let's see if this is RAM. Let's say this is RAM thing. Um,. Okay, it's not happy. You know, we never had RAM 3 happen. I wonder if there's a hole there. I wonder if there's a hole at uh, 10. So this would be RAM 4. So I'm going to have to reboot it. Okay, we're going to try RAM 4. I wonder if there's a hole at uh, at 10, but not at 18. Because we know 0 is there. We know 8 is there. No, this is 0. This is 8. This is 10. No, we're on 18 now. Hmm.
and it just fucking immediately fucks off. Why? Like, why? Let's make sure we can still do uh, an eight. Let's make sure we still can do this. Maybe something has changed, so this will be a one. Um. Yeah, that's dumping. What the fuck? Hmm. So I'm throwing an exception? No, it probably just crashes. Um, that's really weird to me. Okay, we can kill that. Let's just find a unique value in here. Let's find some good string. Let's find a string in uh, this, because we know this data is uh, semi-constant. Um, there you go. This is good enough. CR lock limit. Uh, four. I I int I is zero. I I is less than. <sighs> Just say this. One two one two three four. I I plus equals send. I I. Just send, uh, just 16 bytes. It's probably fine there. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. Ah, uh, ah, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Beautiful. And it rebooted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. That is a nice power of two. Eight times 128 megs. Uh, I guess this is in hex mode. So up to 40 million. Yeah, one gig. Let's try it again. Oh, I didn't have it listening. Oh, so it probably just did nothing. Well, we'll see. Reboot, you fuck. I don't know why it's so flaky. We're not doing anything that weird, are we? It's not like we're just writing code to the stack and executing it. That can't possibly be an issue. Okay. Bam. Eight. And... Looks like a hard instantaneous reboot on that. Which is really nice to see. Are you trashing the stack? I don't think so. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think that is reasonable then. That RAM probably repeats up to that address. So let's just do a uh, char buff 
Let's just do... 128 probably isn't going to be a huge slowdown here. Okay. Um, times, int times. Um, int foo is equal to this. All right. Uh, this is just like crash to a hard reboot printer, right? Uh, mem copy buff uh, void ii 128 send 128 buff. Uh huh. I'm assuming we have enough room on the stack for 128 bytes. Um, so copy that and then send that buffer off. And then once we get to the end, close, and then we crash hard to, uh, to reboot the printer. Uh, NCL4421 ram all dot bin. Okay, so this is ram all. Make, okay, uh, oh, hmm. JJ is equal to um, char I I JJ. Huh? Oh god, we're getting close to our maximum size, but we're still fine here. Um assert uh open a dot bin rb dot read uh len of this is less than or equal to two hundred and fifty four. Okay, um, ram all, and then let's see here. Okay, it's going. So it's going. Um... Do, do, do. So, um, basically, it's done when it gets to a gig. <laughs> oh, that's going to take a, a hot minute. I could maybe try to hardwire it. Maybe it's just slow because it's Wi-Fi. Hot minute. But I think we did mem copy correctly, right? Right? Did we do our mem copy correctly? I think we did. Um, let's just double check everything. Create the socket. Connect. Less than one gig. Plus equals 128. For JJ, up to 128. Buff JJ is equal to... It's gross, but uh, that should be fine. Uh, and then send buff. Now, technically, we don't know if a send failed. Um, but that's fine. We'll just look for the repetition. But basically, we kind of expect 
Honestly, this is really slow. I think just due to this buffer being so fucking small. How much space can I fit on the stack? How big do you think they allocate for a stack? Like, 128 seemed aggro. I mean, we're, I don't know. We're, uh, we're like 10% of the way there. I think we just let this run. It's not perfect. Stack is at the end of RAM. Oh, yeah. Although they probably have threads, right? That's probably the initial stack. Like, I, I can interact with the printer. And since I can interact with the printer, um, it's not single-threaded. So... Okay, we are at 128 megs, so we should be uh, one-eighth of the way there. Woo. Woo. And we're just going over a boundary now, and we're at 129. Okay, so we went over a boundary just fine. To be honest, the reason it might have been crashing... Um... The reason it might have been crashing was just due to how big that, how big we were sending in socket, and maybe it allocated like a massive buffer. I think we're being a lot more friendly to send right now when we're doing 128 bytes at a time, and like that 128 megs bubbles through the stack. It maybe malloced. It maybe like did some weird things to actually buffer that. Um, so hopefully. This has just been a little bit friendlier to the TCP stack, and maybe that's why it hasn't crashed. Uh, but then hopefully this will cause a hard reboot, which will just cause everything to get nice and refreshed. Seem as, this stream has already been amazing. A two-byte patch, a C program to dump memory over Wi-Fi. Yeah, I mean, it is a two-byte patch, isn't it? Honestly? If you would have said at the start of stream, like, you must do this in a 